Expo for Monday, April 25th, 2022. Would the clerk please call the roll? Yes, sir. Mayor Burt? Here. Councilmember Cormack? Here. Councilmember Dubois? Here. Councilmember Philsap? Here. Vice Mayor Koo? Here. Councilmember Stone? Here. Councilmember Tanaka? For the record, six present. Thank you. So our first item tonight is a special order of the day, which is a presentation honoring Palo Alto Day. And I see we have former Mayor Judy Kleinberg here to join us. Welcome. My fan club behind me. Hello, City Council. Um, this is an update uh, and uh, information about Palo Alto Day. Uh, I wanna say that cities of lesser size than Palo Alto and forgive the bragging, but lesser significance uh, have varying ways to recognize their shared experiences from parades to community barbecues, to um, school programs, activities for children and families. Um, we wanted something to do that for Palo Alto. My original concept for Palo Alto Day was to annually celebrate our city's past, present and future. Uh, and I'm grateful that the city council did a few years ago officially recognize a Palo Alto Day. The first Palo Alto Day was inaugurated in 2019, along with the city's 125th celebration, which was fabulous. And I believe all of you were there. Uh, the hope and intention was that the city would take time every year in April to, to look back at its histor historical achievements and also look at its current activities and challenges not just the happy successes, but also the challenges and how the city has dealt with them and how it's planning for its future. For example, we would look at the innovative programs of the city, its residences, uh, residents, businesses, and organizations that helped us come through the challenging two years of the pandemic to acknowledge and applaud the resilience of all parts of our community, uh, and specifically and especially the leadership of city staff and the city council. Due to the pandemic and all those restrictions, some of which are still in place in different places, look, I've got my mask, um, we weren't able to celebrate in 2020 or in 2021. But we have a group of very enthusiastic supporters uh, who are committed to the concept and the idea of a Palo Alto Day and are eager to plan for 2022, were eager to plan for 22 until the Omicron variant raised its head. And that made it really a difficult, a difficult to plan. What would we do when we still have so much resistance and concern uh, about being to, together? The advisory group is made up of members of the first Palo Alto Day Committee and members of PAHA, the Palo Alto History Museum, the school board, uh, the Palo Alto um, Neighborhood Association, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, tall tree winners and past mayors. We work in close co collaboration with city staff and we'll continue to do that. And I wanna single out one city staff person who really needs to be applauded for her incredible support. And she's sitting right back there taking notes, Kristen O'Kane of our community services department. Now a little applause would be important. Kristen is a jewel, unbelievable. Um, another group to be thanked and acknowledged is the Teen Council of the Palo Alto History Museum, which I know is called Palo Alto Museum, Palo Alto History Museum, you know the one I mean, the one we're gonna get one day. And this group of young people has worked very hard to assemble and work on what is going to be in the time capsule. So they have, they have a presentation for you. They're gonna introduce themselves, who they are, where they come from, and then they're going to show us about the time capsule. And then I'll come back. Thank you so much, Ms. Kleinberg, for your introduction. My name is Emily Chan. I'm a senior at Castellaya School, and I'm the co-chair of the Palo Museum's Teen Advisory Council. My name is Paul Charian. I'm a junior at Crystal Springs Upland School. And my name is Sonia Charian, and I'm a junior at Castellaya School. Uh, next slide, please. 
So just to give a brief background, and um, this is our mission statement. So the Paulton Museum's Teen Advisory Council is an organization of teens dedicated to spreading Paulton's rich history through community outreach. PamTech seeks to create innovative, interactive opportunities to help youth get involved with the history of our community. Next slide, please. This is a quote from Annie Reynolds. She's a uh, now senior at Menlo. She's also on the Palto um, History Museum Teen Advisory Council. So our goal for the time capsule was to convey our community, balancing creativity and cleverness with accuracy and information. We hope that we hope that in 2094, we hope that 2094 residents will be surprised by what they find, but able to understand the purpose of every edition. We hope that you'll be able to see why Annie said this about our. Uh, about our time capsule by the items inside it. Next slide, please. Um, so the time capsule was a project that we mainly worked on in the 2019 to 2020 school year. And um, on the slide, you can see the contents of the time capsule. Altogether, there are around 74 items present. Some highlights include reusable, reusable boba straws, a sushi burrito catering menu, a Mayfield bakery gift card, Tesla Hot Wheels, and a course catalog for Palo Alto High School. Additionally, each member of the team council wrote a letter for the time capsule guided by questions like, how do you feel about or how would you characterize life as a teen in Palo Alto? Where in Palo Alto do you frequent? What are your hopes, dreams, and fears for the Palo Alto, um, for the future Palo Alto? Next slide, please. So we spent portions of our meetings looking at our capsule's predecessor, a time capsule buried from 1994 to 2019. And what struck us as the most impactful were not the differences between past um, and present, but the similarities. In an area where change seems to come so fast, we could see ourselves and our lives in the letters that the um, Pali students from 1994 wrote. And it was really important for us to share individual accounts and stories in the capsule, hoping that future residents could feel the same connection. Uh, and additionally, we collected responses from longtime residents and involved citizens. And as Sonia mentioned, each of us included a personal letter. So on the slide, um, on the left hand side is a snippet of the cover letter we attached to our time capsule. And then on the right was an addendum um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. We wanted to provide a little bit more context of how come our time capsule didn't address. And we wanted to protect the integrity of the time capsule by keeping it um, specifically relevant to 2019. And we also wanted to capture the essence of the wider community. We included new stories from various local newspapers. For, uh, for Palo Alto Online articles, we included some of the user comments, which are arguably more interesting as artifacts than the stories themselves. We also invited other high schoolers to take a survey and have their voice included in the, in the capsule. We used physical artifacts to symbolize important fixtures in our community. Some of our favorites include a toy Tesla car, ice cream cups from salt and straw in tin pot, and a straw from Boba Guys. We also included real estate flyers and a copy of the Pal of the Pali Campamal. With, uh, with many of our physical items, we want to include a brief explanation about why we include it and what it means to our present day Palo Alto community. Thank you. Um, so we're hoping to soon um, full or will not bury, but um, store our time capsule so that when 2094 comes, um, residents can open it up and be able to reflect on Palo Alto's past and hopefully um, gain value from learning about the experiences of residents in 2019 and hearing um, teens' perspective on that as well. Um, however, currently we're working with the Palo Alto History Museum on collecting oral histories of members of the Palo Alto community. Um, this photo on the slide is of our most recent interview with Helen Nicholson, a longtime resident of Palo Alto and a former stadium announcer for the Stanford Band. Through the museum, we've, inter we've also interviewed doc Dr. Heather Payne. Yes, and these stories are incredibly impactful and meaningful for especially us as young Palo Alto teens to hear. I know Hal Nicholson has been in the Valley for a long time. He went to school here. He served as a lawyer for HP um, and many other influential tech, uh, tech firms. He's very active in the Palo Alto legislation and, and community. I think he was also president of the Rotary Club and hearing his stories and actually understanding why he cares so much about the city was really, really important and, and really made an impact on us. Additionally, we have kind of other oral histories that we're planning to take in the future include Joan Baez, um, Leonard Leo's, uh, the founder of the motorcycle 
called Soul Brothers Club. It was a racially diverse motorcycle club in the Palto area with East Palto, and it was the first of its kind. And then Faith Bell of Bell Books. Um, and so what's really great about these um, is we've been really supported by our wonderful mentors and um, part of our team, um, Doug Kreitz. He's been helping us learn all the kind of video production uses of how to take these oral histories. And all these oral histories will be included um, part of exhibition at the New Palto Museum. Yes, and um, as a student who's passionate about history, I really loved getting this opportunity to um, engage with local history um, with the support of the Palato Museum. And it's also just been amazing to hear the stories of residents like Helen Nicholson, whom I otherwise wouldn't have heard. And I feel really fortunate to be able to talk to these, um, to these amazing people about their lives and learn about their experience and impact on Palo Alto. Thank you so much. Um, I guess we can open the floor to any questions. Oh, oh uh, Ms. Kleinberg. Is, oh, okay, questions. Thank you so much for letting us present to you today. Thank you, Council Member Du Bois. <clears throat> yeah, so thank you guys so much. I, I know we were trying, this is the one canister we have left to refill, right? And uh, <laughs> we were trying to get this done last September, like in Palo Alto week. And I think we were having trouble figuring out how to seal the, the canister up. Um, so thank you guys. Um, I really liked uh, a lot of the, the materials you had in there and, and the philosophy of kind of keeping it before the pandemic. That, that all made great sense. I, I like the approval of the salt and straw cup. <laughs> I, I do wonder if in the future they're going to think that some kind of del delicacy to put, you know, salt on straw. <laughs> but uh, anyways, thank you guys. I'm glad we're finally getting this, this canister done. But thanks. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Koo. Great job. Really good job. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to say, you know, um, the Palo Alto Youth Council, you know, you guys did a really good job with the vaping survey, which which led to our vaping ordinance, correct? So if if there's a way to put in the survey, if you consider, take it back and consider putting in the survey as well as the ordinance, that might be something that the future can see what the teens have done, uh, um, you know, in this in this in this time. And then the other thing was. I was wondering if that you might consider also putting in a picture, uh, aerial photo of Palo Alto now. Um, it would be interesting to compare what it is later on. Yeah, but again, good job. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'll just add um, thanks as well. And it, as many of you may know, we had a big youth climate rally um, on Friday and maybe something from that event would be as meaningful 20, 50, 100 years from now is anything that's happening. So thanks again, and thank you for your presentation and all your work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I also want to thank Mayor Burt because uh, three years ago, we were sitting out here. You weren't on the council yet. I was way off. And I turned to Mayor Burt at the time just good old Pat, and said, you know, there's some youth working on the time capsule contents. How would you like to help? I, I think it was a nanosecond before he said, I'm in. So thank you again for what you did, Pat, our native, native born Palo Alto mayor. Um, so now what do we do about Palo Alto today? Well, we start planning for next year. And really, I really hope that we will not have to worry about staying away from each other and being so scared to enjoy uh, our friendships and our relationships. So um, when will Palo Alto Day be? It will be next April, 2023, whether on the 16th, whether we celebrate it on the 16th, which is the date on the city seal, or the 23rd, which is the date of incorporation, and it's the date on the city charter. And I think there's two or three other dates that Palo Alto likes to celebrate. Why should we have only one? We should have several. Um, whatever the date is, we want the city's residents, workforce, our Stanford neighbors and visitors to celebrate this unique and world-class and world-famous community uh, every April. Um, to become a tradition when we all focus on what we share in common and why we're so very proud of Palo Alto. 
Thank you for letting me update you on everything. Thank you. And that concludes this item. Oh, when, when do you think you're going to plant the capsule? Oh, I should have updated you about that. So there are going to be two time capsules. There's the time capsule where you just saw some of the uh, what the teens have put together, which is remarkable. I mean, they've worked on this very, very hard. But all the stuff we took out of the original time capsule, which got destroyed when we opened it. Um, so we still have money. The Chamber Foundation has money to buy another capsule. Kristen's been finding me where to go get it. We're going to take the what the arch the uh, contents of that one, which was from the hundredth birthday, will be put into a time capsule to celebrate that birthday, and then the new time capsule. And whether they get opened in the interim or not, when you get to twenty ninety four, I wish I could be there to see all this stuff come out of these time capsules. But we think uh, what was celebrated, what was, what was considered important. Uh, at the 100th birthday will be fascinating at the 200th birthday. So we want to put them back in the capsules and bring them forward until the 200th birthday. That's what we're doing. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so our next item is public comments on any items that are not otherwise on the agenda. And we'll see if we have any speakers. Uh, good evening. Um, uh, just oh, a moment. Um, our first speaker is Aram James to be followed by Rebecca Eisenberg. Uh, welcome, Mr. James. Good evening, uh, um, Mayor Burt. So I'm going to be talking at maybe at future meetings about uh, when woke culture runs afoul of the First Amendment. And I'll be talking to you about a letter that I received from somebody in, in government. Um, to me, it was an obvious attempt, uh, despite the letter's protestation to the contrary, uh, to chill my First Amendment advocacy around police practices issues, uh, that somehow my tone is offensive to staff. Well, of course, we know that the First Amendment wasn't designed for popular or uh, polite speech, but for, for offensive speech, it's angry speech. Uh, all varieties, and we'll, we'll get into the case law of that more. But Mr. Shikata, I can assure you, and you saw the Public Records Act that I filed yesterday requesting the date that hiring for the next police chief begins, uh, when it closes, uh, the firm that you've hired to, to seek out uh, candidates, uh, and the budget that you've set aside. But that still leaves outstanding. The question that I have is, when are you going to announce the process for the hiring? I don't think it's a big uh, ask, uh, to say the least. We should, in a democracy, and, and democracy starts at the local level. It's not some abstraction that occurs only at the federal level. It's right here in Palo Alto. And you are attempting to single-handedly destroy democracy when it comes to the public understanding the hiring process for our next police chief. And of course, you've been complicit in a wide variety of cover-ups by the police department. You're their boss, you failed to discipline them. And now I get a letter uh, questioning my tone, uh, as well as questioning whether my conversation with you, you last week somehow uh, was uh, gendered bias, like you already know uh, what my, my, uh, how I identify, uh, you know, in terms of my own gender. So there was a lot of things that came from that letter. Now that letter didn't come from you, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if you had a part in making sure that that letter came to me and that this person reached out to me uh, to, to lecture me on my conduct or my oral communications. And that, uh, you know, I'm a retired public defender and I had clients call me every imaginable curse word. And that's part of, the, part of the job. I have not cursed at, at you, Mr. Shikata, and I haven't cursed at your staff. I haven't done a, a Mark Berman, okay? Uh, but yeah, my tone can be harsh on occasion, but you're the one that's treating our democracy uh, harshly and horribly by failing 
to give us the terms of the process for hiring the next police chief. I want you to take care of that. I want you to come out and let us know what that's going to be. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg to be followed by Mark Weiss. Welcome. Thank you so much. First, I want to thank um, Aaron James for this incredible comment. And I got to say, I'm pretty much aghast. Anyone would say that Aaron James was being inappropriate or hostile or abusive. I mean, this is why we really all need to meet each other. Something from each one of you. I think that everyone is much better in person. Sorry that I'm not here today. You've seen me here previously. And um, y'all, seriously, Aaron James is, is fighting for justice, he's fighting for what's right. And I join him. And, and to the extent those are your values, you should join him too. I actually wanted to speak in response to this Palo Alto Day and Palo Alto Museum thing, but you didn't let me. So I'm going to have to kind of say this stuff instead of what I had planned for this time, but maybe I could get them both in if I'm fast enough. So um, as the Palo Alto Museum and celebration of Palo Alto, what motivates many families to move here are the public schools. Um, but the public schools in Palo Alto right now are struggling under the strains of a lack of budget. This is perhaps evidenced by the makeup of the brilliant and articulate young leaders who presented to you tonight as well as the other day. Um, Perhaps, perhaps this is because Palo Alto public school students, like my own younger child and previously my older child, are devoting their time to more urgent crises, such as food instability, it's a, which is a growing crisis among Palo Alto, Palo Alto Unified District families, many of which have their only dependable meals, those that are offered in, in the form of free lunch and breakfast at the public schools. Additionally, Tenant protections are urgently on the mind of many Palo Alto public school students because as many as 75% of all public school students rent their homes. I'm guessing that is a much higher percentage than those um, from families that are able and willing to pay 60, almost $60,000 per student per year to send their kids to school, to private schools, even though public schools are offered here. Um, I think that it's extremely important if you want to include the youth, I think it's extraordinarily important to include the public school youth of which there are 12,000 that attend 16 public schools, public schools here. You just don't give them any airtime. Speaking of which, um, I have only a few seconds. I don't know how much time I have. Okay, 25 seconds. Speaking of which, on that note, Castilea continues to usurp, usurp way too much time during a housing crisis, a budget crisis, and many other crises in Palo Alto, upon which we all agree, um, still way re ridiculously um, too much commission time and city council time is given to this um, Castilea expansion proposal, which pretty much neighbors um, and those who are educated um, pretty much oppose, especially that concrete garage and Cal at Castilea's insistence of destroying dozens of, of old trees, even though yes, they agreed to save one. Um, it's too much city time. I beg you to say no. Let's focus on our public school Thank families you. Thank and you, get Eisenberg. it done, done. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mark Weiss in Chambers to be followed by our final speaker, Matt Schlegel. Welcome. Good evening, council members. My name is Mark Weiss. I live on 169 Bryant Street in the first block of Palo Alto, really. And I am, uh, more importantly, I'm very near El Palo Alto. And um, reiterating comments made earlier by our esteemed former mayor, Judy Kleinberg, and um, the young people, and uh, going back to the proclamation written by council member Lydia Koo and council member Tom Du Bois uh, three years ago, um, it was interesting to note that um, if Palo Alto was founded in 1894, uh, it's also true that in uh, 1769, uh, Portola uh, found El Palo Alto. And it's an interesting story. I'll, I'll, I'll spare some of the details of it. But I found it very interesting that as Palo Alto was celebrating its 100 or our 125th anniversary, that it was actually the 250th anniversary of 
our culture coming here more or less. And again, uh, um, so I thought it'd be interesting that as we go forward with Palo Alto Day, that we also keep in mind the tree, at least. In some levels, it's complicated in today's lens to talk about the Spanish and Portola and Serra. Um, and we should also acknowledge uh, the Ohlone people who were here before that. But I think it's an interesting, um, interesting confluence that in 2019, it was the 125th anniversary of our town and the 250 exactly a multiple of that of um, El Palo Alto. That was my little speech. Uh, but I also wanted to point out that uh, in Terman uh, in 1978, when Terman Junior High, which is now known as Fletcher, was closed, uh, the students uh, buried a time capsule, which mysteriously was never found. So it, add that to the lore of Palo Alto, things that we're proud of and things that still mystify us, that there's a time capsule that a bunch of eighth graders and seventh graders planted um, um, 40 years ago that is still out there. If you have the time capsule from Terman, please call a school board member. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Matt Schlegel. Welcome. Thank you. I attended the Earth Day rally last Friday, and I was so proud of the student organizers who rallied what I estimate to be around 200 students for the march through Palo Alto. And clearly these students are very much in fear of the climate crisis and mass species extinction that's going on and want action taken immediately. And one politician at the uh, rally spoke and I paraphrase when she said that her generation has failed them. And I think that that's an understatement. Mayor Burt, in his remarks, said that he needs the citizens of Palo Alto to keep up the pressure on him for climate action. And I think that is great advice. I also attended the recent SCAP ad hoc committee meeting. And while listening to the presentation, I couldn't help but think that the committee has taken its eye off the ball. The number one thing that the city of Palo Alto can do to meet our 80 by 30 goal is to electrify homes and upgrade the grid to accommodate the load for an electrified home and electric vehicles. And I just don't know why we aren't focusing on that effort, dedicating resources to that effort and treating this like the all hands on deck emergency that's called for at this point in human history. And I was also dismayed that I'm not going to hear any further updates on the Palo Alto electrification project until September, five months from now. Folks, every day counts. Every molecule of carbon dioxide that we emit counts. The students know it, you know it, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. Please accelerate the Palo Alto Home Electrification Project. Thank you. Thank you, and that concludes our public comments. So we now uh, go to our first action item, which is interviews for the Parks and Recreation Commission. And our uh, first candidate is Lester Ezradi, to be, uh, who will join us um, by Zoom and to be followed by Jason Schmidt here in the council chambers. So welcome, Mr. Ezradi. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And the way we do this is you're welcome to take a minute or so to provide introductory remarks, and then we'll open it up to uh, council members to ask questions. So, okay. I'll be quick. Um, uh, Lester is right, a retired tax lawyer. I worked for Hewlett Packard for over 30 years, uh, lived and worked in Palo Alto for over 40 years, uh, and a uh, big user of the parks. Uh, my wife and our, our first date was to the Fern Loop Trail at Foothill Park. Uh, played pickleball this morning in, at Mitchell Park. So uh, took my grandchildren to Mitchell Park yesterday. So. Big, big user of the parks, uh, live near Piers Park, 
uh, get there just about every day with my dog at the dog park there. And I thank you for that. Uh, so I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, who would like to go first? Councilmember Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Burke. Good evening, Mr. Ezradi. Um, I have a standard question uh, because it's not just important what we do, it's also important how we do our work on behalf of the community. So if there were two words that people would use to describe you, it can be people at HP or people at Avenitas or people at your interfaith network that would describe you and how you do your work, what would those two words be? Uh, patient and persistent. I guess there are two, you didn't ask for two Ps, but I gave you two Ps. <laughs> no worries, I'll take it. Um, in the absence of other lights, may I ask it? Oh, no, okay, thank you. And Council Member Du Bois. <clears throat> yeah, one of the comments on your application was about the need to increase the utilization of current facilities. And, um, you know, on the rec side, I think a lot of our camps fill up early, a lot of the sporting teams fill up early. Um, and also you talked about pickleball. I mean, tennis and pickleball have scheduling has been an issue. So I guess what, what, what did you mean by that comment in terms of increasing utilization? Um, do you see so, some things that aren't being utilized? Yeah. So, so let me give you an example. Yesterday, as I said, I took my grandchildren to Mitchell Park. They love the magical bridge playground. And it, it actually wasn't overly crowded. It was it was it was full. Uh, and then then afterwards we left and we went past Greer Park. And here it is a beautiful Sunday afternoon. And you know Greer Park so not not as not as populated. In fact, it wasn't. They they thought that was even fun because they said, oh, they built this playground just for us. Uh, so that's what I mean. There there Mitchell is a wonderful place, but there were parks that that could be utilized more, maybe if they had different facilities, whatever. I'm not an expert on this area, but that's what I meant by utilization. Yeah, do, so again, on the rec side, do you, do you have um, any insight into to that side, the kind of the programs and things that- So I think rec, rec is, is a tough one because you're right, it does fill up. And I have, um, my when my son was a counselor in, at Foothill Park, he he was amazed at how many kids that came through there and, and uh, it, it's a tough one as well, uh, because I think that there's a huge demand for that, uh, both public and private. And so, and, and even from out of the, outside the community, I'm not sure what I would do to improve or to increase utilization would be very difficult unless we increase the amount of uh, facilities we had. And council member Phil said. <laughs> I was gonna ask the, I was gonna ask about the utilization comment too, cause I thought that was interesting as well. Um, let me ask this: we we got we got a, a lot of a lot of interests in, and contention for how we how we use our park space and services, whether it's the, the you know the, the courts for tennis or pickleball, you know, or other kinds of things and so forth. And how do we how do we balance the the conflicting needs of different of different sort of segments of the community? How should we approach that? So one of the nice things about parks is it's not based on the market where we normally have every, things get prioritized. The people with those money get what they want. Uh, our parks are definitely not that way. I think we, we need to, to focus on the number of people who are demanding the services we want. And I think as the master plan shows, we need to, to put the locations there. That's, that's with the population is dense. We got to increase the facilities in those areas uh, and, and maybe not in other areas. So I think that's, I look where the demand is uh, for, the, for the various things we have. And I, I, you know, you mentioned pickleball and tennis. It's, it's I, I get confused as to the striping on the court sometimes because of the way they share the courts, but there's nothing you can do about it. There's been huge demand for pickleball, I see, and much less for tennis, but that could change. I wouldn't say we were gonna destroy tennis courts for that reason. Uh, there's the other thing that I, I question about is the amount of facilities we have for, for certain things that may not get as much demand. And again, we'd have to look at that and see where the demand is. But I, I think, you know, you, you focus on the density and the demand. And uh, that's where I would put the, the dollars. I would also put the dollars that give you the most bang for the buck. Uh, and I don't know what things cost um, or what, what space utilization they require. Uh, but that's something I would focus on as well.
Thanks. Great. And Council Member Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Lester. Thank you for uh, applying. I noticed your application stated you were interested in the Foothills Park controversy, and I'm, I'm curious what about that issue really interested you and why? So I, uh, I, I first approached it from the, uh, from the ACLU standpoint. I'm a, I am a big supporter of the ACLU, and I, I was sympathetic to their arguments. Uh, I also love the park. Uh, I was never thought it should be Palo Alto, though I was annoyed that, you know, years ago, Palo Alto couldn't get other people to, well, the other people wouldn't join in with it. But more to, to more recently, I'm, I'm concerned that we've, we've priced people out of it. As just as I said, every other park in the city, anybody can walk into and, and, and enjoy it. And now we, we suddenly have decided that we have to have a, a fee to get into the park. Uh, which is uh, not not an exorbitant amount of money for the people who live in Palo Alto or anyone else. But I was disappointed by that. Uh, it certainly, uh, if I have a choice as to where to go hiking now, I might go to the Baylands rather than Foothill Park, even though it's a different experience. Um, it's still a hike. The dog can be on the leash. And uh, I think we could do a better job with Foothill Park. I would even like to see, probably stick my neck out here and say, I'd like to see some off-leash uh, hiking for dogs in Foothill Park. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you would uh, like to offer any uh, summation remarks, feel right ahead. Uh, no, I can't think of anything. I think, uh, you know, I, I had a chance to read the master plan. I think it's a remarkable document. I think. Uh, it, it would take a long time to do all that, but I think that that's, that I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't go and and change anything in that. I think it's just an amazing document, and I think that's that puts us on the right track. This is not a, an issue where there's something gravely wrong with Parks and Rec in Palo Alto. I think we just need to do more of the same. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Great. We'll now move on to our second candidate, Jace, Jason Schmidt, who's here in person. Welcome. So once again, you're welcome to um, provide some introductory remarks and then we'll ask questions. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, so Jason Schmidt, uh, I've lived in Palo Alto for about 11 years and um, don't plan on moving anywhere else anytime soon. So uh, when I saw the, the call come up for uh, um, a potential uh, opening on the Parks and Rec uh, Commission. I, I uh, thought it'd be a very interesting place to uh, put some of my uh, kind of volunteer capacity. Um, obviously the parks are a huge uh, attraction to why I'm in Palo Alto. Um, I'll, I'll agree with Lester in that uh, I think Foothill Park is uh, uh, both one of my favorite topics and uh, um, one of my favorite parks. So um, yeah, I, I uh, really just here to be of service. So, um, and maybe the last thing I'll say, and I don't know if Lester is still on, but um, I actually joined HP about a month before Lester retired and uh, he was assigned to be my, uh, uh, my mentor, but we never actually had a meeting. <laughs> so there's a connection there, kind of random. Great. Um, who would like to go first? Council Member Cormack. Well, you, uh, you've already heard my question, so you're probably working on your, um, your uh, two words that other people would use to describe you and how you do your work. Yeah, I'd say uh, consistent and creative. Oh, I'm gonna give, sorry, two Cs. No, no, that's uh, fine. I'm all good with alliteration. Thank uh, you for that. Well, I'll, um, I'll just ask one of the things you mentioned in your application uh, among your goals would be access and sustainability. And could you just add some flavor to what you're envisioning in those regards? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think certainly Palo Alto does a great job of access. Um, my point around sustainability is really um, not just kind of the, the obvious sort of ecological sustainability issues, but the whole system is really only sustainable if people use it um, and if people appreciate that it's here. And um, I know that certain parks certainly have uh, <laughs> utilization issues, but of like the 4,000 plus acres that the uh, um, Palo Alto Parks and Open Space uh, represents, uh, I find myself alone quite, quite often. So I, I think that, um, you know, there are certainly opportunities for, uh, um, for us to increase utilization um, by that, 
be, be that through kind of uh, improving access or, uh, or just kind of letting people know it's out there. Thank you. And Council Member Du Bois. Yeah, I, I noticed you said you read the bike plan, but not the master parks plan. <laughs> and I did actually flip through it, um, but I didn't okay. want to over uh, over commit to, I don't know, what is it, 200 pages. <laughs> and you also mentioned um, interest in the overlap of parks and cyclists. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? And how do we balance the needs of people who want kind of different experiences mm -hmm. in parks? Um, I assume you're talking about allowing more bikes in parks, but maybe you can explain it. And then I think one of the issues the um, Parks and Rec Commission is actually looking at is the use of e-bikes. Yeah. Um, so that's certainly kind of what I was getting at. I think the only significant park in Palo Alto that allows bicycles is Rastadero, to my to my knowledge, um, or, or kind of mountain bikes, at least. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it is, it's, it's something that for how much acreage is available, it probably should be more um, more utilized and, and allow kind of more cyclists. And um, at the same time, I, I totally understand that there is uh, um, certainly a lot of sensitivity if you're a hiker um, and there's someone on a mountain bike going extremely quickly and there needs to be some level of separation. Uh, but to my point around uh, increasing utilization, uh, there's, there's a lot of area that I think, um, you know, could be, responsibly utilized utilized by cyclists in the area. I mean, do you do you see like separate separate bike and hiking paths or uh yeah I think that well so I ride a lot around um Santa Cruz and kind of the UCSC area and there's there are certainly certain paths that are completely separate but I think part of it is kind of how you design paths and um you, you can have uh, a good amount of them be uh, for both cyclists and and well, not pedestrians, but hikers. Um, but yeah, there are probably other paths where it makes more sense um, to be kind of cyclist only, um, or or at least kind of have uh, have a, a certain level of alertness. Thanks. As far as e-bikes go, um, again, uh, probably a uh, a tricky subject out there. Um, generally, I think that it's it's a slippery slope that turns really quickly into kind of motorcycles. Um, but that's, that's kind of the fast version. I know it's more nuanced than that. Okay. Thanks. I'd like to go next. I'll have a follow-up question then. Um, our, our definitions of parks and recreation are in some ways expanding. And as we have a council priority that is economic recovery and transition, we're looking at our downtown areas uh, as having an evolving focus serving the community. And uh, for instance, uh, Cal Ave is uh, still closed for several blocks and, and we're going to be entering into a planning process. Have you had any thoughts on kind of how recreation may be integrated with um, a public space uh, such as that greater Cal Ave area? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think the opportunity uh, if we were to continue to keep Cal Ave closed is to turn it into a, a pedestrian park effectively. Um, I, I would think that, uh, I know the decision on this has already been made, but um, that was probably a pretty good uh, idea for university as well. I know that there were kind of conflicting opinions on that, but um, I, I, would, I would say kind of the more uh, kind of pedestrian uh, kind of open spaces and mixed use kind of uh, um, restaurants and uh, and store type areas we can have. That's that's part of the reason why people live in Palo Alto and California in general. And I think that we can probably do a better job of that. Great. And if we don't have any other questions, you're welcome to um, provide some wrap up comments. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have any wrap up comments, really just here to uh, to be of service. So um, if if for whatever this doesn't work, uh, I'd be happy to uh, to volunteer in other ways. And uh, as Lester called out his nearest park, mine is Heritage. So uh, I have some affiliation there. Thanks. Thank you. All right, our next candidate is Joy Oche, uh, who I think I recall Joy. Welcome. 
So you're welcome to provide some opening remarks and then we'll go ahead and ask you questions. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. I'm honored and grateful. I took a sneak peek at all your profiles and it was very, very humbling. Um, I just want to appreciate the fact that I was considered for this role. I was here last um, year, November, and like the popular Terminator movie, part one, I'll be back and back again because I see a need that I can fit in. And I believe that I have a great um, experience, both past and current work and life experiences that will be a great fit for this role. Um, also, I have related educational background that will be helpful for this role as well. And I, I, I bring to the table a cheerful disposition. I'm a happy person, positive outlook. And of course, my technical expertise in project management, leadership, um, ESG, and most currently DEI, um, which I believe is very, very related to this role and also helping the city council to align with their four priorities. Um, I'm a single mom of two kids. Um, who plays soccer for Palo Alto soccer team. I'm also a working professional. And if my accent hasn't given me away yet, I'm an African immigrant uh, from Nigeria. And I am a grateful, uh, grateful beneficiary of you know, what America stands for and what it does for um, immigrants like me who have come in here to seek for better opportunities. And I believe that my technical expertise would be a great leverage for this role. Um, when I went through the roles and responsibilities, I could resonate with all of the um, roles, but most particularly the one that talks about advising on planning and policy matters that you know are related to construction and renovation of capital facilities. Um, in my past life, I was a technical advisor, even though it was a national level, I was a technical advisor for someone in my home country um, for a permanent secretary, which is like the highest ranking public official um, position. And I was fortunate to serve in different capacities, including the Federal Ministry of Culture, Tourism and National Orientation. I also was fortunate to serve under the Federal Ministry of Environment and then the Federal Ministry of Power and then the Federal Ministry of Agriculture. Um, I believe that you know, all the experience that I've gathered so far would be helpful and I come with fresh eyes. Um, I, I love to travel. I've, I've been to, I would say maybe more than 15 countries and my kids and I are trying to do the 50 states and I think we're on number 15, if I remember correctly. And we're hoping to um, travel more and explore and learn more about other cities as well. Um, particular of particular interest to me was um, my trip to Abu Dhabi, um, the United Arab Emirates, where they really, really prioritize sustainability. Um, they have a city there called Mazda City. And what they do is to try to you know, synergize electricity with wastewater, with wa waste, water, heating, cooling, transportation, trying to make everything like a sustainable city. And that's the vision that I have for this role. Um, also, as a certified sustainability professional, I'm a Fitwell ambassador, and I'm also certified to be an Envision sustainability uh, professional and trainer. I believe that the city needs to do more in showcasing most of our construction and renovation for, um, projects um, so that the world will know what we are doing here and also to motivate us to do more and also to help the residents to appreciate you know, the benefits um, that they have here. Coming from you know, a developing country, I can We're tell you that- We're gonna run out of your, the question time. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so I'll wrap up now, but I'm, I'm, I saw the opportunity that, you know, the, the city can be doing more in terms of um, showcasing nationally and internationally the projects um, that they've done beforehand and being able to be verified and also gain like an award. Um, ISI is a very great framework, a holistic framework that does that. Um, it has, you know, opportunities for open space, you know, for, sorry, I'll stop there. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, Council Member Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Joy. Thank you for applying. One of my very good friends is also uh, an immigrant from Nigeria. So I thought I was picking up awesome. on that accent. I'm glad you uh, 
you confirmed that. Um, yeah, I, I appreciated the connection you you made in your application, kind of regarding uh, parks and rec and open space with equity and inclusivity and, and accommodating all different types of residents. Do you have any thoughts on how you how you would work to achieve that goal, or or examples that you've seen in any of your past travels um, that that you'd be able to bring to the parks and rec to be able to address that? Yeah, for me, one thing that I see that's a gap is um, trying to advance multi generational activities. So there's something they call um, expression swings, where an older, you know, a senior person can be swinging at the same time with a younger person, you know, to create that emotional bond. Um, also introducing like inclusivity playgrounds. So we don't leave, you know, people who are, um, you know, a little bit challenged. Um, also to, you know, make the best use of the space that we have. So having more shades, more color, um, you know, what I want to see based on things that I've seen in other places is people make the best use of parks, like having driving movies, um, cities celebrate world team days, you know, World AIDS Day, or, you know, there's always something to celebrate, you know, to make people more communal, people come out more often to appreciate open spaces, um, also education, you know, so for example, for the Foothill Reserve Park, um, also being able to <clears throat> excuse me, being able to um, create awareness to the general public and using most of our spaces also for, you know, creating like amphitheaters, gazebos, places where people can come out and enjoy the upcoming summer, you know, barbecue pits, you know, different things that, you know, can connect people more and also cultural days that could also bring color to the city. And I also feel, you know, like, I know the last year we had like a sister partnership with a sister city. I want to see more of that because I believe that every city is unique, you know, in its own way. But learning from other cities will also help to, you know, bridge the gaps that we might have. And also more partnerships with small and medium businesses to help them grow. So like food trucks, like kiosks, pavilions, you know, terraces, you know, just to make sure it's a very inclusive um, community that people want to live in. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And Vice Mayor Koo. Actually, you already answered my question so, <laughs> through through what you have said. I think mostly is um, I uh, one. I just want to say I appreciate you coming back and resubmitting your application and also filling out your application quite fully. You know, um, it was nice to see that you have a lot of your thoughts put here. Um, I do want to say, you know, Foothill is a, a Foothill Park is actually a nature preserve. And um, so, you know, there's that natural aspect of that park, right? Um, but when you're talking about construction and so forth and project management, um, I just want to know how does trees and biodiversity fit into the sustainability that you talked about? Okay, so under the ISI frameworks, they have 64 credits. Um, it also incorporates biodiversity and conservation. Um, it also takes note of some of the credits, also take note of invasive species, being able to make sure you protect native um, plants. Um, so it's part of, it's, all, it's an all encompassing framework that I believe would help the city when we think about projects, whether it be construction or whether it be, you know, trying to renovate or rehabilitate. And council member Du Bois. Yeah, and if, I, if you can be short, because we're running out of time, but I really did like your application. You put a lot of details in there. You talked about some things we don't usually hear about, um, like being on wait list with your, your, your kids. And so kind of similar to council member Stone, do you have some ideas, again, given some of our budget constraints, like things we could do to improve that process for signing up for camps and various things. Okay. Um, I would say when I was growing up, I grew up with my paternal grandma and we used to, we didn't have so many facilities that we have here. We used to, um, I don't know, if you think about your childhood and recreation, I don't know what comes to mind, but to me, what comes to mind is you know, not necessarily spending money, but spending time as families. We come outside, we have elderly people who tell us stories by the fireplace, you know, things that are free, things that are, you know, natural. And I think it's, it's, it's okay to find a way to be able to connect 
you know, to cover the gap between multi-generations. So for me, I started like an after school back home. Um, it was free, it was a nonprofit, I was a co-founder. And part of what we did was to, we saw a gap in the fact that most kids, we want the best for our kids, but most kids grow up and they don't learn life skills. They know nothing about money. They know nothing about, you know, how to present themselves. In Africa, if I were to talk to you as a, someone older than me or someone of position, I'll be looking down. You know, so trying to bridge that gap to make our kids, you know, to be world class, to be able to stand um, for themselves, to be able to be resilient and be able to, you know, be, be prepared for the future. I believe, you know, nonprofits, in, encouraging nonprofits, you know, would not necessarily need us raising funds per se, you know, but having seniors volunteer, because there are a lot of seniors who have a wealth of experience that, you know, if they don't give it, it's going to be a waste. You know, passing on that baton to younger generations, teaching them wisdom that they don't usually, you know, they don't usually teach them within the four walls of a classroom. I think we don't need money for that. I think it's something that can be arranged. And I think that there will be a lot of seniors who have lots of experience who will be willing to dish that out for free. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. We're uh, past our time, but thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. And our next candidate is Mark Weiss to be followed by our final candidate, Eve Klein. Welcome. Good evening, council members. And it's really great to see all you guys and gals in one room in that, I think this is the first meeting I've been to in two years where all the council members were present in person. Um, earlier today, I had a chance meeting with a woman at a bookstore, bookstore with a woman named Elwanda Fenwick, who said she's lived here since 1970 and was recently widowed. Her husband, William Fenwick, was the founder of Fenwick, Davis and West, one of the first law firms that specialized in working with computers and semiconductors. But I knew the Fenwicks through athletics. Their son, Tony Fenwick, I knew through Stanford basketball camp, but he was also a baseball and football star for Menlo and road crew for Dartmouth. We were classmates there. Mrs. Fenwick happened to mention that her, she noticed her son, Tony, walking in Palo Alto with another Dartmouth contemporary, contemporary of ours, Matt Sonsini, who was also two years behind me at Gunn. It reminds me, apropos of Palo Alto Parks, I've said in several forums recently that I think leadership in Palo Alto should reach out to Matt Sonsini, who is now CEO of Sobrato, about their plans for the 60 acre up zoned area in Ventura, the Fry's campus, maybe some combination of deal honoring Mr. Fenwick, the Sonsinis, the Ariagas, and the Sobratos could result in a major park for Ventura. I think you guys, maybe Mr. Burt, Mr. Du Bois, and I also like Mr. Rechdahl from uh, the newly appointed. Uh, Commissioner, maybe that would work. Thank you. Uh, council members, you have questions. I'll start it off. Um, I had asked uh, one of the other candidates earlier about any ideas to make our downtowns as they're evolving into more park-like and recreational spaces. Um, uh, even if they're not dedicated parkland. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, um, I was actually involved with a program last fall uh, when Mayor Du Bois uh, sat in that seat and it was called Together Again Palo Alto and his combination of the city, uh, staff, a chamber of commerce, uh, an ad hoc committee. Uh, and um, it actually, on that point, in addition to announcing that you know, we got to be careful, but we got to venture out and, you know, support downtown business uh, that we also um, there were music in the parks. I had I pr helped produce concerts in Lytton Plaza and also Cogswell Plaza. I've also in my history have done stuff at Johnson Park and King Plaza here at 250 Hamilton. And I do think a modicum of music. Uh, we did a little music on California Avenue. Someone commented I was eating Indian food or 
uh, Afghanistan food on California Avenue just this evening, and someone said they've seen Pat Burt listening to music quite a bit on uh, Cali Ave. Uh, yeah, I'm all for uh, trying to, uh, you know, keep our downtowns um, commercial and social oriented and business oriented, but also arts oriented. And uh, for me, music oriented. And there might be some kind of I've seen kids. Well, Heritage Park's not really great for soccer, but you know that kind of thing. Casual sports. Thank you, Councilmember Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Bird, and thank you, Mr. Weiss, for applying. Um, my usual question, because you never know, sometimes people come up with different words. Um, what words would people who have worked with you, either at Earthwise or um, other other classmates, use to describe you and how you do your work? Well, yes, I've been anticipating this question. Um, because this is my 10th time applying to a commission. But on my way over here, I also stopped at one of those little libraries and I found this book. It's by William H. Armstrong. And there's two words, winner and sounder. Sounder in the sense of consistent, like in a logical sound sense, but also in the fact that if you know me, you know I'm very involved in, in music and, and sound. So winner and sounder. Thank you. Thank you. And Council Member Du Bois. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on the kind of music downtown and from your applications. I take it you don't like permits. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask you, like, how would you see it working if, if we didn't have permits and, too, you know, too many people showed up at the same time kind of thing? Oh, well, I, okay. You might be referencing one of two documents. Um, I also have written uh, about 3,000 posts on my blog, Plastic Alto, and, and various related points. But I would actually say... I did an event April 18th at Lytton Plaza and uh, staff absolutely issued permits. And I had an event yesterday at uh, uh, Mitchell Park uh, um, uh, Amphitheater, uh, uh, an Earth Day event with music. Um, now, I think my point was just, it's maybe it's, it's too subtle of a point or too secondary a point that uh, the first amendment guarantees all citizens the right to assemble, freedom of speech, uh, music, noise, sound within decibel limits and it's just a quibble that i think a bit one of our uh, ordinances is a little bit too restrictive but no absolutely my events are always permitted i have i actually have um 10 uh events uh music events uh, available right now i think eight, uh, seven are free to the public uh at either Lytton plaza or mitchell park outdoors and uh, uh three or four including one this thursday with the same musicians who played for together again palo alto a monk program at the uh, the beautiful, uh, still relatively new Mitchell Park Community Center that Ms. Cormack helped raise the money to build. So if I, you could rephrase that question if I didn't quite answer your question. Oh, you, you did. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Great. Um, do you have some closing comments you'd like to make? I do. Um, I'm wearing blue tonight, if you can see me um, on the radio or internet, uh, in honor of Krona who are the um, committee to recognize the achievement of nurses. Uh, I am married to a woman who at one point was both the chair of the Palo Alto Public Art Commission and a member of the nurses union at Stanford. And um, she actually retired recently after 44 years at Stanford. Her name is Terry Acebo Davis. I think most of you know her. And, um, and the nurses are on strike and it's a heartbreaking uh, thing. There are 4,000 highly trained really well intended and really hardworking people and the CEO of the new CEO of Stanford for whatever reason just is not acknowledging them so my heart goes out to the nurses at Stanford and I'm, they wear blue and I'm wearing blue in their honor sorry to politicize a meeting at 250 Hamilton but that's my my statement thank you all right thank you so our final candidate is Eve Klein who is joining us by zoom welcome and you're welcome to provide some introductory remarks for a minute or so, and then we'll proceed to questions. Hello, thank you so much for this opportunity. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So uh, my name is Evie Klein. Um, I am a longtime resident of Palo Alto. I'm a longtime user of our parks and rec facilities. Um, I work in the community as well. I work for the Palo Alto VA and have been there for over 20 years. And I'm just seeing this as an opportunity to, um, you know, put some of my skills to work um, towards this community that I'm 
um, so deeply entrenched in and, um, and that I really love. Um, I'm also, especially during the pandemic, I've really, um, I've, I've always taken advantage of um, our facilities here, but um, I've started to use the open spaces quite a bit more. I'm at um, Palo Alto Parks every day. Um, I'm very familiar with all the classes and the um, and everything, both the programming for children and for adults. And um, I'm just looking to, um, um, again, put my skills to use and um, and hopefully have an opportunity to give back. Thank you, Councilmember Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Burt. Hello, Ms. Klein. Can you refresh Hello. my Can you refresh my memory on your two words, and then I have another question for you. My two words, and that just to um, sorry if you weren't uh, listening. Just sorry. To clarify. I, yeah, yeah. I assumed you were listening. Two words that other people would use to describe you, because it's not just important what we do; it's important how we do our work. Understood. Um, so I think my colleagues and the people who work for me, I think they would describe me as very direct and very um, thorough. Um, and um, I think my both my friends and um, people I work with would also describe me as someone who maintains a sense of calm and um, tries to keep focused and also um, maintain a sense of humor and fun. That wasn't two words, though, was it? That's all <laughs> right. Direct, That's all right. Direct and calm. Sounds like it probably was helpful during the pandemic. I did want to ask you about the accessibility and greater independence for individuals with disabilities. Um, this was one of the things we've thought about at uh, Foothills Park, particularly the seven acres that we realized we owned uh, quite recently. Any, yeah. any specific thoughts on what we can do? Because um, really, we have a lot of areas that are inaccessible right now. Yeah, I mean, I think um, always with things with, um, um, you know, pavers and truncated domes to help people with visual impairments, um, signage. Um, I think um, I was just thinking as I was going through um, uh, the magical bridge recently, that it would be really interesting to have something that is, you know, that's that is for all ages, but something that's more open space where it there's some designation that actually helps people with sensory um, sensory sensitivities as well. Um, my background, I'll just give you a little bit of um, information. I currently am the director of um, the Western Blind Rehabilitation Center at the VA. So I, I work um, on behalf of people with visual impairments. I've also um, worked with a large group of other um, or, or other people with uh, disabilities as well in um, a previous career as a speech pathologist. So, um, so um, wheelchair accessibility is also something that, um, you know, is, it can be very challenging and particularly, um, you know, getting to those open spaces and, um, and creating some, some pathways. Um, but I would go to, you know, the ADA recommendations for open spaces. I would have to, would have to look at that, but, but yeah, I mean, signage, I think, and, um, and, and thinking about accessibility, both for people who, um, who might use a white cane or who might be wheelchair bound or might, might use some other mobility device. Great, thank you. And council member Du Bois. Yeah, I, I also liked your discussion about accessibility in your application. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned it just now, it was also in your application about signage and mm -hmm. you know, that can be controversial you know, how do you yeah. strike a balance between keeping a natural environment natural and uh, having signage? Uh, are you thinking mm -hmm. about particular places? How, how would you think about that? Um, I think, um, you know, one place that comes to mind, this doesn't, this isn't necessarily accessibility for people with disabilities, but just general accessibility. Um, Arrestadero Preserve is a great example of, of some place that would, I think, would benefit from more maps throughout because it is a little bit of a labyrinth of, um, of pathways. So a little bit more orienting information, I think, would be useful um, in a place like that. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it has to be, um, it has to fit within the setting um, and it has to be appropriate and useful. So. Thanks. Thank you. And um, through your work at the VA, do you have any thoughts on how the, the parks and recreation facilities in Palo Alto uh, could better serve the VA clients, many of 
whom who do not live here routinely, but uh, are part of our community. And um, any thoughts on that? Um, well, I mean, I, I think in my work directly with um, uh, the Western Blind Rehabilitation Center, I mean, we routinely bring people uh, out, um, our inpatients out for outings in the community in the areas that are nearby. So um, um, the Palo Alto Art Center, for example, had, I think they um, had um, different um, exhibits that I think um, came up. Um, I think it was uh, related to art and disability, um, but also having, um, I'm losing my train of thought, but um, also having um, opportunities to, for veterans to come and um, actually share their experiences. Um, we have a lot of situations where, where school kids will go to the VA and will share there, but um, if there's an opportunity within the community for us to the residents of Palo Alto within our facilities to um, really learn from veterans and veteran experiences. There aren't a lot of um, young veterans in this area. Um, and um, so the older generation, I think can certainly, um, you know, has a lot to contribute whether they're um, Vietnam era veterans or, or older or a little bit younger. All right, thank you. And do you have some additional wrap-up comments or thoughts you'd like to share? Um, no, I do not. <laughs> I just, um, you know, I think uh, I'm a, I would go back to um, what I said. I think I, I um, can bring uh, a different perspective. I'm also a, a good listener and I would be very interested to, you know, get the different perspectives of the residents and of the other members of the council. And um, I think this would be a wonderful opportunity. So I really appreciate, um, thank you for um, giving me this chance to interview. All right, thank you. And that concludes our applicants for the Parks and Rec Commission. And I'll just note that uh, our next item, we are going into work plans of a number of our different uh, boards and commissions uh, for this coming year. And, and applicants um, would probably um, appreciate seeing kind of how our boards and commissions have been evolving into developing clear work plans uh, that include a lot of proactive initiatives that they're taking now. And um, uh, just that note as we go into our next item. So that item is a review of, pull it correctly, a review and approval of 2022 and 2023 work plans for uh, the Public Art Commission, the Utilities Advisory Commission, and the Stormwater Oversight Committee with the first uh, presentation by the Public Art Commission. Because we um, were only able to schedule about a half hour for each of these groups, um, what we want to encourage folks to do is um, uh, assume that we have re reviewed the work plans and really focus the conversation around the issues that, that you think the you need to have council feedback on, you want to make sure we're aware of that we may not be appreciating adequately, but really what are the most germane things out of your work plans uh, that you'd like to focus on? So Ms. DeMarco, welcome. Hello, good evening. What a pleasure to get to see everyone in person. It's the first time I've seen you all in a very long time in person. Nice to get out of the box. Elise DeMarzo, I'm the director of the Public Art Program. And I should be joined online by our chair, Nia Taylor of the Public Art Commission. Nia, are you there? <laughs> Hello, we see you. I am here. <laughs> Excellent. So um, as you mentioned, Mayor Burt, um, hopefully you've had a chance to review this document. Nothing like being the first one in, we're the guinea pigs. We deserve extra credit for that perhaps. Um, so with that, um, I'm just gonna, kick it over to Chair Taylor to talk about some of the highlights of what we have outlined in our priorities. And then maybe I'll circle back if I feel like a couple things need to be um, embellished a bit. Well, all right, Chair Taylor, it's all yours. 
thank you, Elise. And I also want to give a big, huge shout out and thank you to Elise um, and to Nadia for all their hard work with the Public Art Commission. We're very lucky to have two full-time staff members um, who get to support us and keep um, all the hard work that we've been doing moving forward. We definitely have a lot that we've done um, since my tenure with the commission and a lot more that we are going to be doing. So I appreciate, and I know my fellow commissioners also appreciate your hard work and dedication and your knowledge as well. Um, so as you've read in the work plan, we've been doing a lot um, over the last at least um, year um, since the pandemic. Um, and we're very proud of what we've done. Um, as you know, Palo Alto is dedicated to building community and we wanna make sure that people feel supported, welcomed and um, respected. And so one of the things that we've been very focused on um, over the past year and that we're going to continue to do is provide um, micro grants. They are temporary um, funding that we provide to artists and artist collectives within the Palo Alto area, but also the Bay Area. Um, and the goal is really to make sure that we have a place for the community to come together during these difficult times and to have an opportunity to be around art. Um, art, as many of you know, as I know, um, is very important um, to me because it provides an outlet for creatives um, and also an opportunity for community and community building. Um, artists bring a lot of interesting ideas that sometimes um, the tech field or engineering field or other fields do not offer. Um, so it's another way of just looking at the world around us. And so we're very grateful to have um, funding, some of which, thank you city council comes from you to be able to provide um, mini grants um, that allow artists and artist collectives to think outside the box and create connection and community within Palo Alto. And um, as you'll see in our work plan, we're planning to provide more micro grants. Um, this time we're reducing the number of micro grants, but we're expanding the amount that we're giving to artists and artists, artist collectives. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, we also have another really exciting project that we're working on and that's the King Artist Residency Program. Um, and as the city council knows, uh, one of our big priorities is racial um, justice. Um, we know that we had a Black Lives Matter movement happen and um, because of the city council, we were able to create a beautiful Black Lives Matter mural um, in front of city hall. So thank you for supporting us on that. Um, and because of that, we were also encouraged and delighted to create the King Artist Residency Program. And I was part of that um, panel, selection panel for artists. And we chose a fantastic artist, um, uh, Rios Magos. Um, and he is going to be creating a beautiful piece um, to be determined. Um, but he's working right now with a lot of community members and specifically the Latinx and BIPOC communities within um, the Bay Area and Palo Alto specifically, obviously, um, and getting their voice heard. And so we're really excited to be seeing what's going to come next. Um, he gave a beautiful presentation to the Arts Commission last month, and I'm excited to see what comes next. Um, and another big priority that we have this year is the Cal Ave project master plan that we um, completed last year, and it was approved by the Art Commission as well. And um, we were trying to just think outside the box and we had Barbara Goldman um, and her team work with us to figure out places within Calab that need um, visibility um, that could use visibility through the art. Um, and as many of you probably on this call um, in the meeting have seen um, temporary, as we call murals um, that are surrounding different areas within Calab um, that just promote this sense of excitement when you walk down a corridor or you walk down the Calab and um, you'll see beautiful works of art by local artists um, and it's just a way for artists and people in the community to just stop and be inspired and see something different than they normally would see on a normal walk um, and so we're excited to continue this master plan process and to see a lot of the projects that were recommended 
within the master plan come to fruition. Um, and I'm gonna stop there because um, I know um, Elise probably has a few um, comments or additions that she would like to add. Um, as I said before, we're very lucky to have um, two staff members to support us who work very closely with um, city council and also with various organizations and other departments within the city um, that will allow us to create these projects and to move everything forward. Thank you, Chair Taylor. And I know we have limited time. So there are just a couple more things I wanted to touch on for the council regarding the upcoming plans. Um, one item that someone has already asked me about is that in the plan it says um, the priority is adopted in 2021. And I just wanna explain that timing really briefly. The Public Art Commission typically has the retreat in September after budget season has been completed and everyone's back from their summer vacations and then adopts those priorities either in September or October. So when we knew the timeline for creating this work plan, the commission wanted to stick with those priorities that were adopted in late 2021. Um, the other item I wanted to let you know is I do have copies this evening of the Cal Ave district plan, and I have one here for the public as well. Um, so I'm happy to pass those out to you. I brought enough for everyone to have one, and I'll do that as soon as we're finished. Um, Artist Reyes Magos is having four community workshops in May um, available to anyone in the public. He's been getting tremendous turnout and feedback on these. Um, and he's finding that there is a real desire for adults, members of the public to come have free art making experiences where they can share what has been holding them up through this time of COVID and sort of a check-in on people's mental well-being. And he does come from a, a mental health background. He's a mental health professional. I just wanted to put that out there as well. And finally, the last priority, which is going to take a huge amount of our bandwidth this year, um, as we're looking at the changes at the Roth building is our collection care. And we have some tremendous uh, frescoes that are a part of that building by Victor Arnatov. If you're not familiar with Arnatov's work, he has work in Coit Tower. You may have heard some of the news about his controversial murals at Washington High School in San Francisco and their potential removal or alteration. Um, these are really huge assets for us to have. And we're working with a conservator or a team of conservators to um, make sure that they're protected. And then um, some of the funding was secured through the counting, county for their restoration, but we are going to be seeking additional funds to complete that as the prices have all gone up significantly. Um, but that's something we're really excited about. Most of Arnatov's um, records regarding this project um, are in the Smithsonian. And so we've been, um, we've been in communication with them and accessing some of those historic records to feed to the conservator. So that's um, that's gonna be a big priority coming up. And I think that's it for me. We're happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Councilmember Du Bois. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> your goals are really clearly defined, um, showed accomplishments in your plans. So I really think it's just a great work plan overall. So thank you and thank, thank uh, me and the rest of the commission. Um, things like the murals on the public safety building have been really fun to see, uh, pretty whimsical. Um, I had one question, uh, your last goal about maintenance of art assets. I mean, is, is the 30,000 a year, is that been sufficient? I'm so glad you asked. Um, <laughs> originally, it was a $50,000 budget and it was um, knocked down. It was supposed to be temporary some time ago. To be fair, we have been able to do a lot with that $30,000. Um, but particularly coming up on the Roth building, we are going to need more. Um, so there may be pockets where we need more than $30,000. But for the most part, we're able to make do with $30,000. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is funded by the percent for art, a lot of these other goals. And, you know, one of the things that just struck me was thinking about um, the balance of using money for things like temporary murals on the construction site versus longer lasting art. And should we start to think of almost like a pseudo endowment, which would include maintenance funds when we do that artwork so that that maintenance fund would grow over time out of the percent for art? 
That, that's an excellent point. And in fact, we've been working with budget to make sure, because we can't use CIP funds for the maintenance of the existing collection, but at the time that we are commissioning new works, we can earmark a portion of those funds for maintenance. And so that is something um, that we're working with budget to put Yeah, forward. I would really strongly encourage that. I think it's a great way to build that up, but. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Burr. Thanks for being here, Ms. Tamarzo, uh, Ms. Taylor, it's nice to see you. Um, I just wanna take a moment and say how important the Public Art Commission was during the pandemic, really just throughout it. You guys were creative and you pivoted and you were fast. Um, you know, if I think about what your work plan looked like two years ago when we were just sort of starting this process, I, you know, most of this wasn't on there. Uh, maybe the public safety building, but we weren't even sure that was going to happen. So, um, you know, kudos to a commission that's really had to uh, make changes, you know, on the fly. I wanted to start with that. Um, and I, again, I, I echo council member Du Bois's comments about the, um, you know, specificity and descriptions here. Um, with the CalAV referral, um, with the CalAV work, uh, I realized that when we did our big referral on CalAV, I don't think any of us talked about this or referenced this master plan. So uh, how is the commission working with, with um, other staff members on you know, the major changes we might have? Thank you, at, um, at, in CalAV. Or maybe just will you? <laughs> we would love to, absolutely. And we're, we're ready to roll. So this master plan, um, the, the consultants were commissioned pre-pandemic. Um, and we ended up having to pivot and do most of our outreach, which was quite robust, both online and um, you know, having signage along Cal Ave. So it was designed with the idea that the road closures may be longer term or potentially permanent. Okay. So we are absolutely ready to engage. You're in ready to, you're ready to pivot again. We are, we are, we are good at it at this point. <laughs> All right. And then the, the thing that two things occurred to me, and I just don't know if, if the art commission has ever reflected on these as dimensions to think about in the city. And one would be sort of a geographic sort of distribution analysis it doesn't need to be an analysis, but, you know, I know code art, you know, I'm always pleading for somewhat something like that to happen in South Palo Alto. Um, so I just think that's perhaps in, in a next, you know, rev, just looking a little bit, I know you guys did some great work with maps and that was really helpful. You know, thanks for being visual people. <laughs> um, that would be interesting in a, in a, in the future. And then also any demographic focus, focus, foci, I guess, that you have, whether it's on kids or seniors or um, people with certain kinds of disabilities or, you know, different languages, what have you. I think we you, clearly you're very inclusive, um, but I wonder if maybe we're missing a few opportunities um, to at least identify, you know, um, you know, like, you know, wise and whimsy that kids love climbing on. Great. Yay. So um, thanks so much for being here and for what you've done. Council Member Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and yeah, thank you for, for being here and all the incredible work that, that you have done. I think, I think in particular, just our, our, our public art across the, across the city. I, so, so often whenever I have out-of-town guests come and, and visit, that's always one of the things that they always uh, remark and, and compliment on and, and just wish that they had in their own community. And I think it just really creates a special, uh, just a, a special sense of community and belonging and really gives us our... Our, our, our unique, just uh, something that's unique about Palo Alto. That is something I think we're all very proud of um, and really excited to look through this. And I just flipped through a few pages and already seeing some, some great ideas. I, um, I had a question on, on goal three of implementing, I guess, the, the California Avenue public art master plan. And the answer might be in here now, but since I have you, uh, it talks about wayfinding um, as one of the beneficial impacts. And I just would, would that mean that the commission then would be working on more kind of artistic means on providing uh, kind of would-be shoppers the opportunity to be able to find certain shops? And I know that's something that we've been hearing a lot about from store owners on, on California Avenue. And I've been hearing as well from residents that they would find that beneficial. Is, is that the idea behind the wayfinding? 
That's a great question. Um, I think wayfinding was, it more came up in the context of, I'll give you an example, coming down Oregon, when you take that exit, you have no indication, you know, other than that little sign. And I know that there, there are plans in the works to, to redo those signs, but to show what a create, hey, there's a really creative, interesting area over here. So unless you know, or you happen to cross by El Camino and see it, um, how are people going to find it? So it could be that there is some sort of gateway artworks at the main entrances to that corridor to signal that there is something interesting if you go this way. Um, it could also be sort of animating those alleyways between the big parking areas and people understanding, oh, that's the direction I go to find all these great shops and restaurants. Okay, that that's great, and I think that's something that's always been lacking for for California Avenue. It's so so obvious when you come into downtown that you are approaching a destination shopping center. You, I, I don't get that sense on on Cal Ave, and it seems like uh, like like you don't either. So I think it'd be nice to be able to have that. I don't know. It, in some ways, always kind of reminded me of a of the sort of Diagon Alley entrance in Harry Potter. <laughs> so I'm glad you got that reference. <laughs> I was missing out on other references. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's so, it's so hidden. It's just for the people in the know. I think California Avenue is the same thing. It's just such a, a hidden gem. And, and I think having that would be great. I would also encourage them maybe looking into as well. Um, find, I mean, I know council member Du Bois just mentioned too, and in, in our interviews, signage can always be a controversial thing, but um seems like, especially if we're moving in the direction of a permanent closure of California Avenue, being able to help people find shops like Molly Stones and others in a creative artistic fashion would be, uh, would be really beneficial. And then one, one more question. I don't think the timer is going, um, but hopefully this is short. How long has the Art Lift microgrant prep program been running and, and what success has it seen in accomplishing the goals of promoting greater community connection? Chair Taylor, do you want to field this one or you want me to jump in? You have the numbers, so I think that's okay. better. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the first round of micro grants, there were 40 of them. There were $1,000 grants. Um, and we got a lot of uh, great emails from people who happened upon some of the installations and had no idea they were there, how much it just warmed their heart. Um, really changed their daily routine going through a park to discover one of these projects. So I would definitely call it a win from that perspective. And when we shared all of the, those emails and that feedback with the commission, that's why they decided to go ahead and um, increase the amount to have more impact and just do 10 of the projects. So we're holding that selection panel next week. And so projects should start rolling out um, in another month or so. Thank you. Um, no, I, th I think that's great. I love the idea of, of that program. And I, and I think we can look back through thousands of years of human history, and it's always the societies that really value and, and put resources towards public arts that really thrive and, and those that don't and push it to the, to the back shelf are the ones that, um, that tend to struggle or at least not be a society that anybody really wants to, to, th to live and thrive in. So I appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you. So um, I'd just like to wait in. First, I hadn't appreciated that the CalAV project had begun uh, before the pandemic, and now it's uh, evolving in response to the change in CalAV, and that's exciting. Um, I also want to uh, just related to that, uh, mention how great I thought the uh, code art uh, was, and uh, Many of us were very disappointed that it was there and gone so quickly. And, and frankly, despite a lot of efforts, much of the community and surrounding areas didn't know what was happening until afterwards. And you tell them about it and they go, oh, but it's gone. I can't see it. Um, I actually spoke with a number of the artists uh, at the time about whether they would have any interest in possibly having semi-permanent versions of their art as part of CalAV. And uh, they were enthusiastic for the most part. And it goes into one of the elements that you had spoken about in your third project goal. Uh, don't, let's see. Um, well, really all of it. And the first one of uh, playing, belonging, and community participation. And that, 
the code art was kind of as strong of an example as I've seen of participatory art. Uh, and there was just a lot of um, but playfulness from people of all ages. Uh, it was very interactive. And, um, and so I'd just like to encourage that uh, consideration. And it kind of goes to uh, a question of uh, a lot of us weren't aware of how much work was going into this CalAV program. And I'm not aware of uh, to what degree the businesses on CalAV are. I, I've, I, I've spoken to some of them who were and others who were less so. Um, how much engagement is there with the businesses and the surrounding neighborhoods in what we're going to do with CalAV in, in terms of the art? That's a great question. Um, particularly when we put together selection panels, we always engage um, representatives from the business di district and the neighboring community. Um, with the CalAV plan, the timing, we did invite all the various businesses to be involved. Of course, a few of the key players who are always involved um, came to the table, which was great. I think to be very honest, a lot of those businesses really had their hands full with trying to keep their head above water rather than getting involved with it. Um, so I think that's that's an unfortunate part of the timing. The fortunate part was because we weren't doing in-person meetings, it made it much easier for more people to log in in their own time and share their feedback on that online platform. Well, I think you're right uh, in terms of that period where they were trying to keep their head above water and survive. And I think they're now really looking forward to what would be the future vision of the avenue. Um, you know, as, as Council Member Stone alluded to, it's, it's out of the way because until 60 or so years ago, it was a main thoroughfare that crossed the tracks. When we put in Oregon Expressway, we turned that into a dead end street. And as a result, it's a downtown that physically in terms of uh, uh, being on a, uh, a major route, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't flow like we would normally, well, like it did organically to begin with. Um, and that goes into um, the gateway signage. We have both at on Page Mill on an El Camino, these really important opportunities and needs to guide people there. Um, and I don't know whether this be a good idea or not, but I will say that the, the whimsical signs that we have at the art center and at, um, at the Junior Museum and Zoo, and is there a third one of that style? at the children's library, right? Um, those, I, I'm yet to, maybe people are keeping mum if they don't like them, but almost universally, everybody just gets joy from those. And I've just wondered whether uh, something along those lines uh, could be designed as a gateway sign for CalAB that would represent what's happening there. Um, so just a thought there. And then the last reference point, um, uh, I am down in Orange County periodically because of uh, family and, and uh, escape to the lab and the anti-mall there. And I don't know if you are familiar with them. They are, um, uh, yeah, once it's an outdoor anti-mall. It's, it's, it attempts to be the antithesis of what we historically think of as malls. Um, the integration of art in the experience is just uh, fundamental to what it is. It's not a, an add-on. It is uh, a place of, um, of shops and restaurants uh, around a, an art experience. It's the art experience is the fundamental character and the shopping and restaurants are uh, how you experience it there. It's really phenomenal and uh, just incredibly creative. And, and I encourage folks uh, to check out some of those ideas uh, because I think they, they might be things that resonate for us. And uh, last thing, as you mentioned on uh, rotating performance space, uh, one of the things we're struggling with on CalAV is uh, the East End that is still open to cars routinely. Um, and how do we draw customers to Molly Stones, the new hardware store there and others? Um, 
And we have a lot of uh, music that is now going on in the evenings and even in the daytime on Cal Ave, but it's tending to be in the area that's closed and that's where the congregation is. But in the past, we've had some of our summer concerts there. And I just wanna suggest that we, we look at maybe the end, east end of Cal Ave to pull people into those areas, uh, not to mention um, uh, Molly Stones in the past had had uh, Friday barbecues, you know, do you have a bluegrass concert? Who knows what creative minds will come up with. But these are things we're struggling with under this city council priority of economic recovery and transition with this real acknowledgement that we're in this period of transition that frankly can be a great opportunity if we embrace it correctly. Uh, and certainly the art and recreation parts of it are, are at its core. Um, so Vice Mayor Coop. I just wanted to add my thanks to the commissioners for all the work that they've done, especially, and, and to you, Elise and to Nadia, for all the work that you do in guiding the commission, um, for all the work that was done during the pandemic. It was truly healing for a lot of people during that time to, to have the artwork and to be involved also. So congratulations on a job well done. Um, you know, I just wanted to kind of remiss um, to speak about, you know, some of the art that the temporary art, the murals that was on uh, California Avenue when the garage was going up and now the police station, a public safety building. But I remember when the animals were up there, every time I drove by or walked by, it was just uh, a giggly moment because they were so cute and there was, it puts a smile on people's face. And the faces there that is around the police, uh, public safety building is also another form of just looking at the beauty of each person, right? And also the artwork. Um, as we go on, uh, moving forward, I think also that I would like to um, say why we wanna respect um, uh, and adhere to people's first amendment rights. Uh, I do want to ask that as, as, as projects are decided that it is viewed with respect and fairness for all organizations and peoples, um, just so that um, everybody retains their First, first Amendment rights. Um, so thank you very much for all the work. And I don't see other lights. Uh, Chair Taylor, any follow-up thoughts or comments or questions or anything? I actually do. Um, so first of all, I'm going to say thank you again to the City Council for your support. Um, and Vice Chair um, Ku, I also want to say thank you to you. Um, it's really nice to have somebody on the Council that's able to attend our meetings and provide um, positive um, reinforcement, feedback, and support. So thank you for that. And we look forward to working with you more and whoever um, is our liaison after um, you perhaps change um, to a different commission, but that's not gonna be anytime soon. Um, I also want to say a couple of things. I know Mayor Burt, um, you had a group of the commission chairs together to talk about what um, we could, you could do as the city council to help support us. And one thing I was gonna um, remind the council, which you mentioned too, but is partnerships. Um, I know we've been as the commission this year, very committed to working with the HRC. Um, obviously, we have the racial, racial justice priority, which um, enabled us and encouraged us to work together. But um, one of my goals um, personally, but also the commission agrees with me, is that we need to do more um, partnerships with other commissions, but also hopefully with more departments within the city. Um, I know that we're lucky to also have um, Kristen O'Kane as our liaison um, from the larger city. Um, as the community service department. And so she's also been really supportive. So I'm looking forward, like with Code Art um, and expanding our reach within other areas of the city um, to be um, um, to be part of that <laughs> um, and to make sure that we encourage ourselves, but also that the city council can encourage other commissions and other departments within the city to work together. Um, I also wanted to share um, an important part about the commissions um, and about um, the First Amendment and also just civic pride um, is that we do encourage people um, to comment and tell us about their experiences within with public art within the city. Um, so if there are comments from the public and obviously the city council, 
please share them with us. Um, you can come to our commission meetings and um, you'll have three minutes to share your thoughts. Um, you can write to us, email us, um, call, leave a message with Elise. Um, and we, we love feedback and um, that's how we grow. Um, and then I also wanted to share one last um, exciting kind of comment that I heard recently. I met with um, a group of public art enthusiasts over in the East Bay and a woman came up to me and I talked to her and I said, I work, um, I'm the commission for the city of Palo Alto. And she said, wow, you're the gold standard in public art. So when I heard that, I said to myself, wow, we are <laughs> um, not just boasting, but that we do so much. And again, thank you to Elise and Nadia um, and for the city council and just the city of Palo Alto for just being supportive and committed to art um, in our city. So thank you. And thank you to my fellow commissioners as well. Well, thank you. I think that wraps up uh, this and, and we look forward to um, your your work this year and uh, uh, Tara Taylor, as you mentioned, uh, you reminded me of the discussion when we had the meeting with the uh, commission chairs and one of the areas that we were talking about uh, and there was a lot of interest in collaboration on was around California Avenue it was an art place, a recreation place, a planning and transportation project and an architectural project. And I can't think of anything that brings together the uh, potential positive contributions of our boards and commissions more. How that will be uh, folded in is more as uh, the boards and commissions as uh, participating in stakeholder groups rather than formal kinds of hearings uh, is yet to be determined, but it's an exciting prospect uh, for all of you to contribute um, in really positive ways. So uh, thanks again and um, um, keep up the great work. Thank you, have a good evening. Oh, to uh, uh, oh, endorse the work plans. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, now I think about the formality of uh, this agenda item. Um, so we do need to, um, act on uh, endorsement of the work plans. And so uh, why don't we go ahead and, and do that uh, at the conclusion of each of the items. So does anyone have a, a motion to approve or amend the work plans? Mr. Mayor, before you take action, you might wanna consider public comment. Oh, sorry. Uh, do we have any public comments on the Art Commission work plan? Okay, it appears we have one speaker, Rebecca Eisenberg, welcome. Hello, okay, oh, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, yeah, well, oh, there good. was some background oh, noise. I think it's okay now. Good, thank you, sorry about that. So mo first of all, and mostly importantly of all, I really wanna thank the um, public art department, <laughs> Ms. Um, DeMarco and her, uh, or DeMarzo, if that's the correct spelling, I apologize, um, and her colleagues. I really want to thank the Public Arts Commission. And I also want to thank the City Council for continuing to support this. Um, I think that what's so crucial here, what's, what's just incredibly essential, and what separates this from maybe, you know, the other cities in a very positive way, is that it's not just about art, but it's about public art. And I think that when um, you think about, like, as you said, um, Mr. Mayor and a few other of uh, members of council um, said, um, and I completely agree with, when you think about the most special projects, you think about the projects where the community was able to participate. And I, you know, I can't emphasize enough how, how meaningful I think that is for so many people, especially um, how much it includes families of all income levels, seniors, um, you know, all, everyone can be included in the process of public art. So, with, uh, so my, my question, which isn't really, is, which is not a criticism, but I guess one of my questions is, is that how 
well this 1% for art is enforced? I asked that because I, um, I attended the Public Art Commission meeting last week where Castilea was presenting and had an opportunity to give a pretty long presentation filled with its you know, regular information about how wonderful it thinks it is. And the point of this presentation was, as far as I understood, to, um, for Castilea to get an exemption from its requirement to pay 1% of its project value into this fund. And if you look at Castilea's capital campaign that is available on its website, you know, exclusive of the rumored donation from a recently deceased, may he rest in peace, memory be a blessing, um, you know, well-known billionaire, exclusive from that donation um, was a $100 million capital campaign that was raised by the community and by, you know, the Castilea community. So that if, if Castilea is spending $100 million on this development, then 1% is a million dollars. But Castilea sought to avoid that by instead doing a mural with students and a teacher or some paid consultant. Anyway, this, this is just an example of that. I think that it's really important for developers to participate in this because this money goes to an extraordinarily important cause that unites the community for public good. Thank you so much. And thanks for your hard work. I mean it. Bye. All right, uh, we will now return to the council for a motion. Uh, Vice Mayor Koo. Um, I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to, um, so the recommendation says to review and approve. So we've reviewed. Um, I'd like to move to approve the 2022-2023 board and commission work plan for um, public art commission. And Oh, uh, Councilmember Du Bois, are you seeking I'll, a second? I'll second that, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Koo, did you want to speak to your motion? Um, no, I think we've discussed it enough and um, we see the value of um, art to the community in order to build. Thank you. And Councilmember Du Bois. Yeah, I guess, um, again, this idea of formally approving the work plans, I hope we're also kind of treating this as a study session. Like, you heard some comments and feedback. We don't need to make put all those in motions, I don't think. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. But your understanding is we don't need uh, formal motions to approve the well, work plan. Well, I, I think it's okay to approve the work plan. I'm just saying it, um, I don't think the council needs to make add specific changes. If we gave some feedback in our comments that you know the board and, and staff member can work with. Right. right. Okay. So. Very good. Um, I don't see any other lights. So would the clerk like to please call the roll? Yes, sir. Council member Philstaff? Yes. Council member Du Bois? Yes. Mayor Burt? Yes. Council member Stone? Yes. Vice Mayor Koo? Yes. Council member Cormack? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Oh, I'm so sorry. Council member <laughs> Tanaka. I apologize. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you. Now that concludes the item. Very good. All right. So our next uh, board and commission is the Utilities Advisory Commission. And I see we have Chair Forcell and uh, Director Batchelor, who would like to kick this off. Good evening, Mary Burke, council members, Dean Bachelor, Utility Director. Tonight I have with me Lisa Forsell, who is the chair of the UAC. Um, with Lisa's um, guidance and leadership, um, she was able to work with the um, commission to come up with the work plan that is out in front of you tonight. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to go through the work plan. Hey, good evening, Mayor Burt, Vice Mayor Ku, and council members. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, hopefully, hopefully you've had a chance to look at our, our work plan. I guess um, the approach that we took was to sort of identify three different areas. And I just wanna call your attention to that. Um, our first section we called standing topics. And we actually went back and looked at the municipal code um, to, for reference as to what the you know, Utilities Advisory Commission should be making sure to take care of every year. Um, and so the items there should be no surprise. 
um, the annual budget, rate changes for each of the utilities, the water, gas, and electric supply resources, um, CIP projects as needed, reliability, re resilience, legislative initiatives, et cetera. Um, and then section B was, um, you know, where we identified some specific topics that we anticipate we will be discussing um, in this coming year um, that it's worth uh, mentioning. For example, um, we, the, the utility, I think it was in 2020, um, city council approved this program of um, bucket swapping our renew, renewable energy credits. And we said at the time, or council directed at the time that we should revisit this in a couple of years. And so that is on our list to do, to, to just take a look at again, are we happy with this program? Should we continue? Should we discontinue? Um, as CAP support, we put this on our list before our study session with you. So we now have even greater focus. I think that as CAP will be looking in particular at grid modernization. Um, the advanced metering project is going to launch this year. So we're gonna be following that closely. Uh, fiber to the premises, we've been keeping a close eye on as uh, Magellan, the consultant, moves through the phases. Um, and then we also wanted to uh, make sure we focused on climate impacts, um, drought, wildfire, sea level rise, um, and, and continue to look at the effects of climate change on the utility. Um, and then we included one more section, section C, of things that we were basically thought, well, maybe we'll talk about these but they're not a given. Um, and it sort of will depend on um, staff bandwidth, our bandwidth, um, situations that arise. Um, but we have a longstanding interest in really taking a look at undergrounding um, and the pace at which undergrounding of our electric utility is proceeding. Um, we actually had a couple sessions on cybersecurity. Um, and then workforce is another one uh, area that we sort of dip into from time to time, as I'm sure you're all aware, it, it's a significant challenge for the utility to hire and retain qualified personnel. Um, and the community has raised some concerns around water quality that we'd like to dive into if, if we uh, have the, the time and bandwidth to do so. Um, so that's the work plan that we are proposing for the coming year. Well, thank you, Chair Forcell. That's um, a pretty ambitious plan. Um, Council Member Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Burt. Um, it's my pleasure to be the liaison to the UAC this year. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Um, thank you for the organizing the work plan in this way, because, you know, every one of these commissions is, is unique. Um, but the the remit for the work that the UAC has to do every year um, to send us is really quite significant. Um, I wanna double click on the reliability and resiliency part, because if you think about grid modernization, it's essentially already there, right? I mean, we're gonna call it something else, but it is already um, you know, an important part of the work that the UAC does. So um, there, we, will, we will all have plenty to do on that in the next decade or so. Um, in terms of section B, I just want to talk through this a little bit because I feel like they're they're all in section B, but they're not, they're sort of different um, concepts. So for me, the Rex is really a means to an end. SCAP is, you know, I think the most important long-term project any of us has. Um, AMI, I view as a building block. Um, fiber to the premises is, um, you know, just going to be a necessity uh, with uh, work from home. Um, and then climate impact, I really think about that in terms of risks. Um, and, you know, just specifically, um, you know, we need to be foc have UAC focus on the impacts to the utilities, right? As opposed to sort of like, you know, the broad-based part. Um, in section C, I think one of the things that um, I don't know that we had had the auditor's risk assessment at the time the UAC approved this work plan, I don't think so, but um, it's important to note the auditor, one of the highest risks that was consistent across the city is in the workforce area. Um, so of those four, um, that's the one that I think has the most um, connection across uh, the work that uh, we're doing here in the city. Um, so again, my, my thanks to all the members of the UAC for their uh, willingness to engage in the details. <laughs> um, uh, I cer certainly appreciate that and, you know, the important role that all of you are and will be playing in, uh, in our climate action plans. 
Well, I'll go ahead and wait in um, while waiting for um, colleagues who want to join. Uh, on the first item of standing topic around um, competitive rates, um, I, I just want to uh, encourage both staff and the commission to really uh, continue to contrast our rate structure compared to surrounding communities. Um, it's, it's something that as we look toward um, the transformation in our utility from our uh, electrification program, uh, I think it's, it's not broadly understood that our baseline residential rate, for instance, is 40% below PG&E, and PG&E is scheduled to go up uh, far more this coming year than we are. And so it's probably gonna be in the neighborhood of 50% uh, by the end of the year. And yet we, we've heard refrains that uh, somehow our rates are exorbitantly high. And it's a, uh, because it's been repeated and not that the, um, in the community and not often enough um, uh, shared the actual data, there, there starts being, becoming a uh, misconception in the community that's critically important. And, uh, critically important to correct. Um, and then uh, tied with, with the electrification transformation is the reliability and resiliency. I would encourage you to uh, add capacity to it because it's not just uh, reliability and resiliency of the current capacity, but it's the future capacity and how those things interplay as we go forward. Um, Oh, and I should have mentioned uh, one other thing under rates, which is as we look to electrify, um, we, we see that uh, the commodity cost of electricity for renewables, even with uh, storage or battery storage systems is a fraction of the cost of our current portfolio average. And so as we look at in the coming decade, perhaps doubling or so, the electric capacity, uh, we have a potential that at least that major portion, which is about almost two thirds of our um, residential rate structure on, on the uh, commodity itself should decline as we add capacity. And I'm just not seeing any analysis of that and, and modeling of that. If we add 50%, 100%, 200% capacity under current costs of renewables and then under projected, projected costs of renewables or five and 10 years out, which are uh, expected to decline and particularly on the storage portion of that. So I think those are really important trends that we need to capture and project uh, with certain bandwidths on scenarios. Uh, we all know that we can't perfectly see the future on this, but we, we have strong indications. Um, and then under, Topic seven on legislative initiatives, it ties in actually with your other um, uh, ongoing issues with hiring and retaining, um, which is that through the SCAP, we've come to recognize we have two parts of that challenge. How do we compete today with other uh, utilities for the limited workforce uh, that's specialized in high voltage systems, whether it's the line personnel or the professional engineers uh, in power supply. Uh, it's a pretty small pool of people with that expertise. As a result, we see that as our city and surrounding and cities throughout the state will soon be moving forward with electrification programs. We already have a shortage uh, in the industry, uh, a pretty severe shortage of personnel in this area. And uh, it could go up drastically in the shortage and basically put a halt to the electrification programs. So as a result, um, I've spoken with State Senator Becker and Assembly Member Berman about initiating legislation to rapidly uh, invest at the state level in uh, this workforce development. It's often talked about of the great opportunity from the uh, uh, renewable energy um, uh, uh, transition for great new jobs, but I see it more as or as much as a threat 
if we do not address this really quickly, uh, because there's quite a pipeline before period before, especially on the professional engineer side, before those people are ready to even enter the workforce and a longer pipeline before they're really experienced and um, able to uh, help lead a lot of this. Um, I'd also just note that um, the advanced metering, I'm really glad you're moving forward because that also is so intertwined with our future electrification. We need to have smart systems to be able to do this effectively. Um, and then I wanted to mention under your topic one of, um, um, of I guess your uh, initiatives on the looking at the renewable energy credits and would like, to uh, encourage you to look at a, an aspect of this is really diving deeper into the quality of credits. Um, you know, we have certain agencies that are filtering through and trying to provide us with insights on really how good are these different credits that we often really can't see where they're going. Money goes in, credit comes out, and we really are acting on faith in many regards. Uh, but we actually have a model that I've, it's the best uh, uh, model of uh, truly sustainable uh, renewable energy credits that I've seen. And that's our special credits with the Oaxaca state, which is not un unlike many credits, it's not just preserving forests, it's reforesting um, in areas that have been denuded. Uh, it's defined acreage where you know specifically where they are, and it hits the other two aspects of sustainability, not just environmental sustainability, but economic and social. Um, and, um, and so it employs uh, indigenous people. It restores a watershed that's vital uh, and provides good jobs. And so um, I'd really encourage us to not only look at that, but promote it with other agencies, uh, perhaps through the NCPA and others. Um, I'm, I'm yet to see anything that rivals it in terms of the quality of the uh, credits that they have. And then lastly, um, as we're moving forward on the SCAP, um, I'm really pleased that uh, the UAC is uh, collaborating with us and entering into membership on a number of the teams. And we're going to have a lot of work ahead of us in the next few months. And we're looking forward to that. So uh, council member Tanaka. Yeah, first, thank you. And thank you to commission for you guys work. Really appreciate it. What you, what you guys do is critical for our city. Uh, I have a few uh, topics. I, first of all, I reviewed your work plan overall. I think it's really solid. So thank you for your work. Um, there's a few things I have a, a few suggestions that I'd like to, uh, I'd like to make here. So uh, first is, uh, it would be great if you guys could actually look at, um, you know, look at the forecasting models for in terms of demand, in terms of, uh, uh, so I think it's, it's, it's important to, Kind of look backwards as well and measure the error rate and try to understand how accurate were the models um, and and then use that to actually try to make the models better uh, and i think one other thing that uh, i've seen other cities do, of course some of these cities are larger than us is they also employed hedging me measures so because we are a a consumer a large consumer of of I mean, we have a large cons consumption and large demand um, just as like farmers they hedge uh, as they grow crops and they sell crops just to make sure that things are smooth. Um, I've seen a lot of cities starting to do that. And especially with uh, some of the climate change issues, it's probably something that would be great for you guys to look at. And, you know, certainly here on council, we don't have time to get into that kind of depth, but maybe that's something that the UAC can, can, can do in, um, in more detail. Um, and, and you could refer to other companies. So, sorry, go ahead. Just a clarifying question. I, I assume you mean both water and uh, and power, all, all of our and gas. Okay, yeah, all of them. Yeah, and uh, so I, th I think that would be great to just look at some of, some of the things that other cities are doing to try to um, smooth out uh, the supply and demand differences that happen. And uh, you know, I've been reading about how we're having a twelve hundred year drought, right? The worst drought in a thousand two hundred years. And uh, you know, I, I think we're going to do what we can on conservation. I think in our city, where uh, people are very inclined to do that, and, and they try to do a good job. 
But I think one of the realities also is we have to start thinking about um, things like water storage, right? Because that's one of the big issues is that because it's warming up, the amount of water or snowpack that we have is, is declining. And so we don't really have the water storage capabilities. So I think we have to also think about the supply side. That's my main point. You know, water storage is one way, desalination is another, but we have to start thinking about maybe purification. I know I think we just have to start thinking about how to um, not just uh, how to how to like not waste water, which I think we should definitely do, but how do we get a more su higher supply of water? And um, and in terms terms of the comments about rate comparisons versus PG&E, I think it's it's worthwhile, but we have to be really careful there because um, one utility, the policy utility we actually own, uh, PG&E shareholders own, right? There's not tons of uh, dollars that went into PG&E that, that the cities, the very cities that use PG&E that have versus us, we actually own it. And so it's, you can, and to me, it's not, you can't just do a, a uh, it's not apples to apples comparison. It's having, it's like saying a renter is having, you know, after someone paid off their house, um, and they don't have a mortgage anymore. It's like saying, oh, the homeowner should have the same rent per se as a renter, right? Someone that doesn't own the house, right? That's just renting it from someone else. And so I think we have to be really careful when we make rate comparisons because, because of the fact that Palo Alto owns our own utilities. We spent a ton of money investing in our utilities. So we're like an owner, we, we paid off our house. And so we can't compare the rates for a house that's been paid off compared to a house that's being rented that had, that's not owned when a ton of equity hadn't been, been put in. And so I, I continually hear comments like, oh, you know, our rates are so much better lower than, than PG&E, but it's a fallacy because you're, it's not an apples to apples comparison. The issue is that, you know, we, we own our house, right? We paid off, we, we spent a bunch of money on this and other people are renting a house. And so of course the rates will be higher. They better be higher. In fact, it should be dramatically higher as a result. So I think when you guys do rate comparisons, you must keep that in mind because otherwise it's not a, it's not a fair comparison and we're not, um, I think, uh, um, uh, really looking at things on a, on a uh, equal basis. And then, um, and then in terms of, of this power sources, I, and you guys probably heard me talk about this before, but I, I really think climate change is probably one of the biggest existential threats to humanity. And we have to start thinking about uh, what are ways to to have clean carbon free power? Uh, and uh, certainly we're gonna try to do renewables. I think that's great. Energy storage is still a big deal because what do you do when, when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing? And firing up those natural gas plants to me is just not, not a great solution, um, but we'll, it's something that we have to do today. Uh, and the one power source I think really is like truly carbon free. And um, you know, I was reading somewhere today that um, something like 18 or 8, 8, 8 million people a year die from the burning of fossil fuels around the world um, in 2018. And, um, and you look at nuclear, I think maybe a total of 100 have died in all of time. So it's, it's relatively safe. And there's, of course, concerns about cost. But um, with a small, small modular nuclear reactors, the cost can be dramatically lower. And so I think we should look at that because um, it provides a significant amount of power already for the United States. Um, you know, I think the average is around 20%, some places around up to 30%, something more. And so I think that's something that we should do because that's the one way to really make a dent in the amount of carbon output that our city has. And um, in terms of uh, broadband, uh, I, think, um, I think the other thing we want to we wanted think about in terms of broadband is, is try to encourage competition, try to have uh, as many people providing broadband as possible to try to drive, drive down the price, increase the service. So I'm slowly starting to see that, but like in my area, I still don't have uh, fiber from at and I would love to try to get it just so I can switch, but I can't right now. Um, so I think we want to, um, we want to uh, um, uh, try to encourage competition. That means make it easier for people to deploy broadband in our city, try to get rid of the regulatory hurdles, try to, um, try to uh, um, create incentives. So I think, I think that's what I'm, I'm thinking about in terms of broadband. And then the last one here is customer service. So I, I, as you guys probably know, I hold office hours every, every Sunday. And um, one of the office hours I, heard, I held last night was around uh, building issues um, in terms of people who um, you know, were concerned about their credit score getting, getting, um, 
having problems. And so this might seem like a small thing, but some people, you know, their 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 credit score could be hit if if uh, um, you know it shows that they didn't pay even though they did pay. And I, I think we got several emails on this. I'm not sure if the rest of you guys got it, but if not, perhaps uh, someone on city staff could forward it to you guys. But there's people having these kind of billing issues, and I think um, you know something. I'm sure we we. No, this wasn't our purpose and we're trying to figure out what it is, but I think it's important also to be responsive to, to uh, uh, our customers, right? We are a customer service organization. That's how we view the city. We're, we're here to provide service to our constituents. And so one of the things I encourage the city manager to do, and perhaps the UAC could take up this charge, is some sort of ticket tracking system. So when people send in a request, it's tracked over time. It's kind of like a Zendesk or something like that, where people, so the, so the request doesn't just fall to the, you know, uh, you know, a mysterious bucket somewhere, right? It's actually dealt with, and you can see how long the ticket's been around. Um, and um, anyways, so I think looking at the customer service aspects, because if I think about like where my offers are filled, my office hours are filled with, is filled with development center and utilities, right? Those are like two big things that um, a lot of people have customer, customer service complaints about. And so I think it'd be great, at least for the UAC, to also think about the uh, customer service aspect and how do we improve it? How do we be more responsive? How to remove these billing errors? I know it seems really small, not quite as glamorous as like climate change, but it's something that, you know, I think our constituents care about and it's important that, and, and this, to be honest, this is how most of our constituents see us is through the customer service orient orientation, not necessarily talk to city council or UAC. So anyways, those are some suggestions. If you guys could figure out how to integrate this to the work plan, uh, that'd be awesome. But thank you so much for your work on this. And Council Member Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I appreciate the the work of the the UAC. Thank you for your for your plan here. It looks great. I just had one um one one question and, and thought under uh, item five utility CIPs. I'm I'm curious. Last week we had a, a public speaker who spoke to us about dark sky initiatives, and including some recent work that's been happening uh, in, in neighboring jurisdictions and in, in within Santa Clara County. Uh, I'm wondering if the commission has ever thought of kind of looking into dark sky initiatives here in Palo Alto, um, or or might be interested in in pursuing that. I'm not personally familiar with. What dark sky means, and when you and I also you said item five, and I'm not sure even what. Can you just so clarify your, what it relates goals. to or explain it? Goal five. For um. Under the work plan. Sorry, standing standing topic goal five, or uh, maybe our numbering system is a little confusing, or fiscal year 2023 goal five. Let me pull it up. Climate impact yeah. or oh, did she miss or I, CIP? I, I, uh, CIP. I think he's referring to. He started his question with CIP, so I okay. think that's sorry, I missed number that. five in section A. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with dark sky, but I'm happy to listen to a quick explanation. Oh, I, I, my and colleagues can definitely weigh in. My my understanding of it, at least what was being explained is what we're seeing in, in surrounding jurisdictions are kind of the concern of, of light pollution and what that has done for various bird migration and and you know and other issues within within the within kind of the local environment and and some of the benefits of uh, things like changing right, changing street lights to being the very bright um, kind of white lights we have now to something a little maybe dimmer and, and looking at policies like like that. Got it. Thanks for explaining. Um, we can look into whether or not that's like I don't I don't know that the US that the utility does street lights, but if we do, um, sounds like it'd be a good topic to dig into. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Du Bois. Yeah, I don't know either, but usually street lights are the utilities, I think. Yeah. Um, so we all learned something. I just learned something. That's no, awesome. Street lights, usually because they use power. Um, it might be worth a little clarification there. The utility maintains the street lights, but does not actually design or or set the foot candle requirements for those. So it would involve public works public and transportation. Works. But they're usually unmetered and paid for, right? The utility just provides the power. You're gonna, 
take me into a little side story about low pressure sodium uh, street lights and uh, you don't want to go there. So okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, anyways, utilities are a big area and you're getting a lot of comments. Um, and I, I'm wondering how we're going to handle all these comments, but uh, thanks for the plan. And, you know, this is a new process kind of second year. I was going to make some suggestions for maybe improvements for next year, if that's okay. Um, I thought some of the goals really weren't worded as goals. There was a lot of like discuss CIP projects or discuss uh, resilience. Um, I think it'd be really useful to like capture what the purpose and the, out the desired outcomes are like worded as kind of goals. Um, and I really do think it, it's helpful to focus it down on three to five priorities for the year. So one of the things I thought of is um, maybe you don't really need to summarize all the standing work efforts that happen every year, or maybe that can be boiled down into one item. Um, I think we expect you to do that. We know it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. Um, but I, what I'd really like to see is like a highlight of particular issues for the upcoming year that you think will be something new or, or different. Um, so like you have a standard item on reviewing power supply, but again, you know, with the drought, maybe, maybe the, well, the, the thing that would be different would be like, do we need to shift off to the hydro more aggressively? You know, it, it just kind of makes it a little more specific. Um, and things like, you know, helping refine the strategy for the fiber business plan. Um, and I think a couple of people said it, but yeah, of course, grid resiliency is important, but what's different is this idea of modernizing the grid for electrification, which is really about increasing the capacity, um, which is different than the standing work item, right? And so kind of calling that out as something that's different. Um, and on the potential topics, I think, you know, in undergrounding, you know, I, I think those of us have seen it for a while. We, we know it's expensive. We know it's slow. We have to maintain the existing districts. I think this is one um, where it really may require a council policy update. And so you had it characterized as like, how do we go faster? How do we do more? You know, I think there's a question about it. Like how much do we really think we can follow through and accomplish what we intended many years ago. Um, and so I think it's a good one to bring up. I think it's, it's really is kind of an open policy question. And I agree that the workforce area is really challenging. And um, if the UAC has some ideas on training, recruiting in the really competitive market, that, that would, could be a really interesting uh, discussion. Um, you know, I had, uh, or you had water quality as a potential topic, and then you also had water resilience as a standing item. And again, under the drought, I think um, maybe it should be given more emphasis as a priority. Just, uh, you know, how do we increase our water resilience through alternate supplies or recycling? Uh, and again, it, it's in there as part of your standing topic, but it's kind of one of the ones that I would like call out as maybe a particular priority. And then I wasn't really sure you had these four potential topics. You know, my picks would be two of the four, the undergrounding and the workforce. Um, are you really looking for direction on like what to add to your work plan out of those four? Um, we're looking for direction of any kind. And yeah. I, so I've taken away from this uh, round of feedback that uh, council is supportive of us um, talking about workforce, water quality, and undergrounding from our from our potential topics. Yeah, so that's great. That's great feedback. Yeah, I'm just wondering like what you're going to do if we all have different ideas. Um, we're just going to add to your work plan. But thanks. And Vice Mayor Koo. Uh, well, first I want to thank the commission for their work and for uh, Chair Forsell for being here tonight. Uh, as well as uh, utilities, Dean, and all your staff. Um, this is great. I just wanted to make sure that, I mean, it's a lot of work over here that you're, um, you have on your work plan. Will you be able to have the capacity to take on all the potential topics one through four? I mean, including staff, is, is that gonna 
be a much bigger workload. That's a great and very relevant question. It's it's hard in this moment to predict. I kind of want to get Director Bachelor's input on that as well. Vice Mayor Koo, thank you for the question. I, I think the biggest, you know, the as we're struggling with is is SCAP. I mean, that, that's the biggest portion of it. The modernization, you know, it takes so much from the engineering, the pre-work that has to be done with that. I think the other topics that we have actually put in here, I think that we have um, supplemented our crews um, on the electric side. Um, and we've also brought on other contractors throughout the organization. I think that we're okay in those areas. The the one that bothers me and I have, what keeps me up at night is what are we going to do with the ASCAP and, you know, how fast are we going to really be able to get this done? Because uh, we all understand that this needs to be done by yesterday. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at the grid um, every day and we're moving through it to see what we can do to kind of moderate, modernize it a little bit um, until we can actually rebuild it. Um, and I think it was um, Allison, uh, um, Councilmember Cormack talked a little bit about, you know, the resiliency piece and reliability will come with the rebuilding of the modernization of, of this. And we've looked at the whole capacity, knowing that um, what the SCAP is going to bring is it's going to have to increase the capacity of the system itself. So that's the huge lift for us. Um, you know, sometimes when I'm listening to SCAP, um, you know, sustainability, um, I too, you know, worry about if the um, if the horse is put before the cart. Is that how you say it? Or cart before the horse? Cart before the horse. Yes. <laughs> the cart before the horse. You know. So I think you know there's the prioritization that needs to be that needs to be in place, right? If it's the modernization of the electric grid in order to uh, reassure. Uh, the community that we do have enough power uh, electricity electricity for all the more you know for electrifying businesses and homes and everything else including the EV cars so I think that might be something that we want to um, uh, include in the messaging that you know we're doing it in a prioritized way um, and I think you know uh, the mayor said it very correctly you know with standing topic six, which is reliability and resili resiliency, should add in the capacity as well, right? Um, I also um, appreciate Council Member Stone bringing up the Dark Skies initiative. A lot of what I see also is I have very much concerns about the energy part versus the biodiversity and nature. You know, where this, where this, um, you know, all the energy tech suddenly uh, cut into or uh, have impacts on our on the uh, natural aspect of our um, of our ecosystem, right? So I would hope that that is more robust in discussion and taken into consideration as you're deciding all these upgrades with energy uh, technology. Um, otherwise, you know, thank you very much for all the work that you're doing. And before going to uh, members of the public, oh, I see Councilmember Phil Seth uh, wants to uh, speak as well. I just want to commend um, uh, the work in undergrounding in our foothills area that's occurring right now, uh, because it is tremendously important in terms of not only establishing reliability and resiliency in that area and dealing with dead spots, uh, and the ability to communicate in the event of a wildfire event, but also the prevention of wildfire events, because as we know, uh, high voltage lines have, in forested areas have been a principal cause of the mega fires in the state and PG&E lands. And, and uh, this is a big step that we're doing right now with that undergrounding. And for those who haven't seen it, it's it, under progress as we speak. Um, so uh, do we have any members? Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Phil Seth, and then we'll see if we have any members of the public. It's okay, it's okay. I'll be brief here. Um, so, so first of all, thank you very much for this. And I guess what was going through my mind reading it is, what are you guys gonna do in all your spare time? Uh, this? <laughs> no, this is, a, this is a pretty long list. And um, um, I guess I think that the, the standing topics ought to stay, right? Because I think those are gonna consume 
usually probably the majority of the, the time anyway, because they don't change from year to year and they're, they're there because they're important. Um, I assume and I suspect and assume it's not really a totally sequential kind of thing that is to say, you know, it's not that we're not going to get the cybersecurity. It's more a question of how much of our time are we going to spend on it, even though it's a potential thing, because, you know, we don't want to spend too little. Don't. <laughs> right. Um, and then my instinct uh, was the same as a couple other people have mentioned here, which is, I think, uh, you know, we talk about the resiliency of the grid, but the, the capacity is uh, what you've got under SCAP here is, is you know, I, I suspect that's going to suck up a lot of time from a lot of people and how we do that. And is there any way to do it other than just raising a big pile of money and doing it all at once, right? And, you know, how we, how we go about that, but because um, that one's going to come upon us. Um, yeah. You know, you know, on nuclear, you know, which comes up from time to time here. I actually kind of agree on that, but I think it's really a national congressional kind of issue. There's not really a lot of nuclear in California, so it's not really a city issue. So I would urge you not to throw something else off this list and put nuclear on instead. Thanks. Okay, and do we have any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? All right, uh, we have one member of the public, Rebecca Eisenberg, welcome. Hi again, I'm sorry for being speaky so much, but fortunately I get to be positive. Um, I, I mostly really wanna thank the um, Utilities Commission for the hard work that you have done. I think that of many things in the city, um, utilities is one that um, I think most people consider to be uh, run well i mean no i'm not no insult to other things i'm just saying you know that is a positive thing um just a couple of, of points quick points i wanted to make none of which are criticisms at all of any of the work um first is a point about um, the ability to hire and retain qualified workers um totally hear you this has been a problem for a long time um i've had a lot of experience for because i've run manage HR departments for a number of startups in my capacity as running the legal departments. And so this is always a challenge of every organization, for-profit, governments, nonprofits, et cetera. And really what most you know, top executives have told me, um, and actually that uh, city manager Ed Shikata <laughs> told me as well, is that often one of the biggest um, problems, you know, inhibitors to hiring quali the most qualified staff is the lack of affordable housing nearby because no one wants to commute two hours to and from their jobs. That is just not something that people want to do. So, and that's actually why in Mountain View, for example, Google supported the Google tax for which Google is by far the biggest payer. Um, Google supported the Google tax, even though it, it pays you know, millions of dollars on its own because Google recognized that that money was going to go to housing, which was going to benefit Google by creating places for workers to live. And not just single workers in tiny studios, but families and not just their top paid workers, but their you know, very important you know, service workers too. So I just really want to emphasize the importance of housing, housing it across all income levels, all sizes of um you know of homes there is a proposed development near greer park that the architectural review board just nagged again because they say it's ugly come on we have to build and that actually is going to be for like two thousand square foot homes um right up by the freeway so let's realize that housing is so important for hiring for retaining talent and also for sustainability you all got the letter from the sierra club last year saying that Palo Alto cannot be considered a green city until it invests in putting housing near jobs. So that is, that doesn't that is not the work of the utilities commission. But I just want to point out that this is an investment that I strongly believe and I think many of me would really help our utilities, help our whole city is to if we could have more Thank you. housing. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we'll now we turn oh, for to cut me off that good stuff. 
we'll now return to the council uh, for a motion. Uh, council Member Cormack. I'd like to move approval of the 22-23 work plan for the Utilities Advisory Commission. Second. All right. And did, would you like to speak to your motion? I think listening tonight, um, I'm reminded of the metaphor of having to keep flying the plane while you're rebuilding it. And I think that's what we all have to think about is the challenge for our utilities department with the advice of uh, the Utilities Advisory Commission over the next decade or so. And uh, I think this work plan puts us in place to do that. And council member Phil said. Yeah, just on the, just on the grid, I, I think you guys are gonna have to, you know, change the engine on the plane while it's still flying. So I think that, that's, that's not an easy task. So good luck. <laughs> Thanks. All right, um, would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Cormack? Yes. Councilmember Tanaka? Yes. Councilmember Du Bois? Yes. Vice Mayor Ku? Yes. Councilmember Stone? Yes. Mayor Burt? Yes. Councilmember Philsat? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Great. Well, thank you again for um, a very thorough and well thought plan. Um, please let us know throughout the year if there are ways that um, we can help support your progress. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, um, so that brings us to our third uh, border commission tonight. It's the Stormwater Oversight Committee. Hi, Mayor Burt, this is Karen North, Assistant Director of Public Works. I believe Hal Mickelson, my chair, is in the chamber. So I will wait and introduce him as he makes his way forward to the podium. I see Hal making his way. So I just wanted to kick off and let Hal speak about our work plan and what the Stormwater Oversight Committee is working on this next year. Great, uh, welcome Mr. Uh, Chair thank Mickelson. You. Karin, thank you. Uh, the Stormwater Management Oversight Committee has a strikingly uh, simple charter. Our job is to monitor the operations and expenditures uh, relating to storm drains and other stormwater management and to report to you and to the residents of the city once a year that the funds that the uh, residents have approved uh, for stormwater uh, infrastructure are being used for that purpose and no purpose other than that. That's what we do. We uh, motivated people to vote for uh, the fees that we have to support storm drains and stormwater management with the promise that it would not go into a slush fund where it would disappear, but that we would audit it carefully to make sure that would, it was its only purpose. That means we can have a pretty simple work plan. Uh, and the two observations I would make about it uh, are, uh, first, that we, we get to watch the staff grapple with a very difficult problem, which is making sure that our stormwater management operations conform to the regulations and the requirements that are set region-wide for the discharge of stormwater into the bay and so forth. That's a, that's a big task and it involves uh, continue, continually changing regulations that have to, met, to be met. As the, as the committee, we just watch that done. What we like to do, this is the second point, every chance we get, we like to be cheerleaders and advocates for green issues, particularly for green stormwater infrastructure. Every report we get, every uh, project that we hear about, every capital expenditure that is presented to us, uh, we say, well, you know, what's in this that is going to follow progress toward green issues? Uh, and we take that uh, opportunity seriously. We're pushing the edges of the envelope on our charter, but we look at that wherever we can. And we applaud the hard work done by Karen and by the other staff members that support us. They are not only hardworking, but uh, creative and effective and, and good stewards of this area of public service. Karen, what more do you need to say regarding our, our work plan? I think the work plan's in the packet, and if council has any questions or clarifications, we'll be happy to answer those. 
Thank you. Uh, Council Member Du Bois. Yeah, first I want to say congrats to Hal on your Tall Tree Award a few Thank days you. ago and uh, gave a great speech. Um, yeah, like you said, the plan is pretty simple. I think the, the question that I had was really around the one water plan and um, maybe it's for Karen. Uh, you know, I guess is both the UAC and the stormwater commissions discussing this kind of one water plan? And what do you think? Would it make sense to expand to be like the wastewater stormwater commission? Karen, may I say something first and then you can correct and amplify it? We have a member, Bob Wenslow, who has individually buttonholed some of you with an idea, which is that perhaps the committee structure that we ought to have for the city should be fundamentally different, where we would have a utilities uh, advisory commission that would look at energy, and then a separate committee that would look at all aspects of water. And that would include not only stormwater management, but the one water idea. Uh, it's beyond our charter as a committee to uh, propose that. We're not looking to extend our boundaries. Um, the, the existing charter we have makes it difficult for us to go beyond saying that the money is being spent for stormwater management, period. That's mm -hmm. what we're that's what we're legally asked to do. Karen, what would you say? I would just echo what you said, Hal, and um, we included the one water plan to review it because some of the stormwater fees are going to help offset the cost that utilities is putting towards the one water plan. So yes, it will be reviewed by the Utilities Advisory Commission and uh, certain aspects of it that tie directly into stormwater of how we can potentially use stormwater as a resource will be discussed with the Stormwater Oversight Committee. And what do you, uh, I don't, sorry to put you on the spot, but you know, wastewater isn't really a utility. What, what do you think about expanding the commission's role to be wastewater and stormwater? So wastewater, when we talk about recycled water, when it's a commodity, actually goes to the UAC prior to going to council. So that's already in the purview of UAC in terms of water and as, as a water utility. So I would defer to maybe um, Ed Shikata if you'd like to clarify that a little bit more of the different roles and responsibilities of the, com of the committees. Well, I think Karin uh, stated it quite directly. Um, the one other um, note I would just uh, make to connect the dots here is that to the extent that your item this evening is discussing the work plan of the existing stormwater management oversight committee, it would really need to be limited to the work of this group. Yeah. So maybe just final comments, maybe under that one, I don't know if it's part of the stormwater's one water plan, but maybe some ideas could be proposed in there that would come back to council around this. The, the, it's, the intent is for the one water plan to go through the UAC and also the stormwater oversight committee. And if there's any aspects of the one water plan, even with the parks and rec commission. So, and yeah. then it would go back to council. But I was suggesting would, would it be reasonable for part of it to be a suggestion on the best way to organize our commissions going forward around water? Just it might be uh, something that could be a part of that. If I, if I might yeah. interject, um, it may be that that kind of a consideration would be uh, best explored through a colleague's memo. Councilmember Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Bird. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mickelson. Hello, um, Assistant Director North. It's nice to see you all here. Um, you know, this is fundamentally a you know financial oversight group, um, and as such, it's performing its its designated purpose, which is to make sure that the funds that the people of this community agreed to pay are being used correctly. And um, I believe that's being done diligently. Already been a lot of talk about um, project and goal four. And I look forward to the one water plan, which will be the appropriate place for us to have that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? We don't. So we can return to the council for um, uh, 
any uh, motion to approve the work plan or just further discussion of it? And I will move approval of the work plan. Second. All right. Um, I see no lights. So would the clerk please call the roll? Vice Mayor Koo? Yes. Councilmember yes. Cormack? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Councilmember Tanaka? Yes. Mayor Burt? Yes. Councilmember Filsa? Yes. Councilmember Dubois? Yes. Councilmember Stone? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Great. Well, that concludes this item. Thank you. And thank you for the work of your commission. And at this time, uh, we can take a break before returning to our item AA1, which is the continuation of the item from last Monday of uh, discussion of the revenue generating ballot measures for uh, 2022. Thank you.
We will now reconvene the council meeting um, and go into a continuation of item, uh, an item from last Monday on the revenue generated, generating ballot uh, measures. We took full public comments uh, last meeting and went into extensive discussion of the council. And we're going to continue that discussion and try to um, move forward with guidance on next steps. Um, and as we were struggling through the complexity and the interplay of the different elements of this, um, we perhaps tonight can go through a process that Ms. Nose had suggested, which is to look at uh, kind of an approach that we've taken on the budget in the past of doing some essentially straw uh, polls uh, amongst ourselves on sub issues um, that, and if certain things are um, unresolvable at a given mo moment, put them into um, a parking lot and then revisit and then try to uh, consolidate these different elements uh, at the end of our discussion. So Ms. Nose, did you want to share some of your presentation and updates? Sure. Thank you, Mayor Burt. Um, and ultimately, this is really just a brief presentation. So on the next slide, uh, kind of going over those orders of operation, perhaps, this slide really summarizes the decision points that are before the council. Uh, we are obviously well on our way towards pursuing potentially placement of a ballot measure for the voters' consideration or two. Um, so the first area from a decision standpoint is really looking at the current practice of the natural gas utility transfer and whether or not the council wishes to potentially ask the voters to affirm that. Um, the second area is the confirmation and direction on uh, characteristics of a business tax. These characteristics are outlined in table one in the staff report from the 18th. And obviously the council had extensive discussions on these. Ultimately, what those variables, those characteristics of the tax will be used for informing the future, the full ballot measure text and the third round of polling as we discussed last time. Um, next action is uh, you know, ultimately providing staff direction for proceeding with the third round of polling. Um, and then lastly, surrounds funding um, and how to inform the public of council's intentions uh, regarding the use of business tax proceeds. And so for the specific um, potential ballot measure of a business tax staff had brought forward uh, last time, the idea of a resolution that the council could assist in crafting to help communicate, communicate to the community um, the intentions for the spend of a potential business tax. Now, as we've all discussed, uh, the council at present has provided staff direction for it to be a general tax. And so really that resolution is providing guidance um, and clarity on the expectations. Ultimately, the tax will be allocated annually through the budget process. And so obviously there's interplay in and amongst those four core areas. Uh, the council may wish to put one, two, or one depending on two uh, taxes for voter consideration based on different variables such as rates or funding needs. And so on the next slide, we, as a refresher for those uh, who I think frankly all of you remember, as part of the budget process, we often go through about a thousand pages of information. And so in order to help us move through those components, the council uses two mechanisms to help them move through um, the material while allowing for them to still have a final vote at the end to see the full picture. So the two actions that the finance committee typically uses are tentative approvals. So they'll move tentative approval of X insert item. So perhaps that could be tentative approval of uh, voter affirmation of the current natural gas utility transfer at a rate up to 18%. Um, and then that gets placed kind of to the side and the council can continue to move through their decision-making process. And at the end, we'll sum it up and help the council see where each member or rather each element um, 
is a straw poll essentially. Um, and if the council, there are individual characteristics that perhaps need to be placed in a parking lot for discussion later, because consensus can't be reached, that's another tool as well. Ultimately, uh, what will happen then is, is once the council makes these tentatives and moves through the areas to kind of get the straw polls, uh, we'll come back and show you at the end of the item tonight where, where each of the items are at and help the council in drafting their final motion as direction to staff. So just a suggestion, not something the council has to obviously uh, deploy, uh, but hopefully something to help both the, the mayor and the council as a whole think about moving through the volume of information and the multitude of decisions that often have references to each other um, as part of this item. So the last slide is just the recommendation from the finance committee that again, has the details of all of the elements that we just went over in terms of decision points. Um, but hopefully if we are able to break it down, um, the council can help build consensus amongst yourselves on, on the ultimate direction you wish to provide staff. Thank you. So before diving into the substance of these issues, um, how does the council feel about uh, the process that was laid out earlier? We can have either speak to it or nodding heads or if anybody has a concern on it, go ahead and speak up. It looks like um, we do have a consensus on moving in that direction. And so uh, in that light, um, the first item that maybe is the most manageable to uh, tackle discreetly is the question of whether we want to place a measure on the ballot to affirm the current practice of natural gas utility transfers to the general fund and put that to the voters and um, uh, see uh, how they feel about that. And um, I appreciate that uh, for some of us, there can be an interplay between that question and um, the business tax and the scale of the business tax and the likelihood that we think um, we could have, that both measures would have success. I, I will say that, uh, you know, we're not making any decisions tonight on what to put on the ballot. We're uh, making decisions on what to move forward into the final poll, which will uh, have uh, more refined uh, prospective ballot language that would be prevent, uh, presented to the community for in the poll. And then we will have our final decisions um, in early June. Is that our expectation? Yeah. Uh, depending on council's direction tonight, if it is to do the third poll, we can come back in early June. If there's additional work that needs to be done, we'll revisit the timeline. Can you repeat again? Just uh, pull that Whoops. forward if you would. Yeah. Sorry. Um, if the ultimate direction from the council tonight is to move forward with the third poll with all of the variables because they're able to be determined, then yes, we will be back at the beginning of June with those third round results. However, if the council's direction is something different for an additional analysis, then that will change that time frame. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, focusing first on that question, uh, who wishes to go? Councilmember Cormack. Uh, are we just going with motions? Yeah, I think we can that go ahead and do, do that or? on, um, and we'll be All right. treating these as, as essentially tentative approvals. Okay, and so we'll vote on each one and then sort of go through and see how they add up. Okay, so I'll move the, that we place the affirmation of the current gas utility transfer at up to 18% of the gas utilities gross receipts. Uh, to move forward in the process. I will second that. Um, would you like to speak to your motion? I appreciate the mayor uh, acknowledging the fact that, you know, this is coming on, likely to come to the ballot at a time when something else is also likely to come to the ballot. I continue to believe that the, the people of Palo Alto are going to understand um, and be able to deal. I mean, I think we deal with in the, the state when we have those, how many like propositions? There's like 10 bonds at a time and we all manage to vote on each of them. Um, this is a long standing process. This is a, a crucial part of funding our services. Um, and it's been a double whammy during the pandemic to have to, um, you know, not be able to have access to these funds. So I think the community based on the polling results uh, understands that um, and is ready to support returning this revenue stream uh, to our 
Um, I'm going to get this balance statement operating. <laughs> it's not the balance statement. Um, ready to re uh, restore this revenue stream to our general fund. And Council Member Phil said. Yeah. Um, I think you know we're going to have to decide: do we send both these measures to the ballot in November, or do we do one this year and one in 2024, and uh, and so forth? And and uh, I find myself uh, grappling with uh, with that one all the time. And the mayor alluded to it as well. Um, but uh, I think we should proceed as though we're going to do that, unless we choose to have that discussion and make a decision on it tonight, right? Otherwise, I think we should proceed as though we're going to do that, but. Uh, uh, recognize that we're gonna to have to make that decision uh, in the near future. Council member Du Bois. Kind of a similar thought. I mean, so we're tentatively approving this now, but we're not making a decision on whether it's one or two on the same ballot. So I think, you know, when we come back, we need to come back to that maybe at the end of tonight or after the third round of polling. Uh, you know, I am starting to feel that maybe maybe we don't do both at the same time, but I'm kind of open on that issue. Um, and again, the 18% is continuing the existing rate, right? Could, could we add the word existing there? From the current transfer at up to 18%. Yeah, okay. It's, it's really not current. Is it? It is, is. It still. It is. Oh, we're just. We're still yeah, collecting it. We we're just still set collecting it, aside. it, right? Setting it aside. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. And I don't think it needs to be in the motion, but I think it'd be useful if staff were to uh, maybe give examples uh, in the future of what this transfer means, like seven million dollars. What what does it pay for? Not specifically, but um, in our general fund, seven million dollars can pay for a lot of things. And. I think that's going to be something important that we communicate. Uh, Vice Mayor Coop. So I actually like the word existing more, but um, you know, current existing, either way, um, the main message is to get across that we, this is, it, it's, it's already, it's a longstanding annual transfer and while we have funding, a one-time funding in order to extend the services, it's only one time. So for to sustain it for other years, there is not gonna be any funding for that. Um, and, um, and it means these extra services that we have, uh, such as the police, fire, parks, and libraries is gonna be suspended at that point. Um, without this, um, these are all community benefits. Without this, there's um, there would also be a correct me if I'm wrong, 11 million deficit in the FY 2023. Is that so? I'm not sure that it would necessarily be 11 million dollars, but yes, um, service reductions that the council has taken to address the legal challenge associated with these funds. Uh, if those these funds are not affirmed, the service reductions would continue, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you for that. So, you know, basically this is to continue to have continuality for the services that the, that benefits the community. Uh, so I'll be supporting this tentative motion. Uh, Council member Tanaka. Um, so uh, I understand the importance of this revenue. So I'm not saying we, we don't need a tax here, but it seems like a really roundabout way of getting a tax. So we, we we did this um, gas tax and then we transferred it to the general fund. Um, and if it's going to go to the general fund and this is a chance to actually fix this, why not just have it go directly to a general fund, have a tax and have, the, and have it. So rather than going, going first to our utility fund, then to our general fund, I think we should just fix it and have it go directly to our general fund. Um, and so that it's, uh, uh, and, and I, I think also it, to me, uh, rather than just taxing um, taxing on the gas, it seems like it, it could be just a more of a direct tax versus, uh, because the, the one thing I'm also worried about is as we actively discourage the usage of natural gas in our city, um, the amount of tax we're gonna get from this is gonna drop. So we're gonna have to try to find another revenue source as we 
<clears throat> discourage the usage of natural gas. So for those, both those reasons, it seems because of the distortions it causes because of the fact that we're kind of moving it through several budgets to get here, as well as um, the fact that this is, this is, you know, if everything goes right, it's actually gonna be a revenue source that's gonna go away over time. Um, I don't think we should do it this way. I think a better way to do it is actually do a direct tax and have it go directly to general fund. So it's really clean versus right now, this is kind of a roundabout way of, of doing this. And it's a way for us to actually fix it. And I think it'd be more transparent to the public as well. So, um, so I, guess I support getting the revenue source, but not in this manner. It just doesn't seem like the right way of doing it. Um, I'll just add that um, I hope that we'll see in the polling that there is support for both this measure and some form of a business tax. Um, and we've had this uh, practice that the uh, uh, for decades now in this community, um, we have had recent court decisions in the state that means that we have to go to the voters and have them decide whether to affirm continuation of the past practice. And there are likely will be members of the community that somehow say this is some kind of an end around, but it is exactly a democratic process of going to the voters and asking them if they want to continue uh, the practice that we have had and they'd have to affirmatively vote to do that uh, in order for us to be able to have those funds, which frankly were um, the, the putting them into reserve um, was part of the basis for the service cuts that uh, were performed in 2020. So um, on that note, uh, let's go ahead and take our um, vote on tentative approval. Council member Filsa? Yes. Council member Tanaka? No. Council member Stone? Yes. Mayor Bird? Yes. Council member Cormack? Yes. Vice mayor Koo? Yes. Councilmember Du Bois? Yes. Motion carries six to one. All right, great. Um, so now we need to look at the major elements of a prospective business tax. And Mr. Ms. Nose, did you have a recommendation on, I'm sorry, is there a question? We didn't take public comment on that item. Oh, uh, well, this is, these are not final votes. This oh, is all okay, part of one item. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we we took our public comments last meeting on the entire item, so we won't be taking additional public comments tonight. Um, let's see. Should we have on the screen the next major elements, or how do we want to Sure. Frame so we could either bring it on screen or council can refer to the table on the table one, uh, it is in your April 18th packet. I'm getting you the packet page number in two 166 and 167. 166 and 167. Thank you, Council Member Cormack. Yeah, so let me just kind of run through the subtopics that we're likely to Correct. encounter tonight. Perfect. <laughs> so, uh, one, we'll, we'll need to revisit uh, whether after we've looked at the parameters that we want to have pulled on for the business tax, whether we reaffirm that we're still interested in having the final poll explore both taxes. And, and frankly, um, once again, we're not making any final decisions tonight except uh, giving guidance on next steps in uh, the polling. Uh, so we'll have issues on the uh, the form of the tax, whether we're still, it seems like we're not open to question on whether we wish to uh, continue to pull on the square footage tax. Um, we will have questions around the scale of the tax, meaning uh, how many cents per month or dollars per year per square foot. Um, We'll have questions on the uses of um, uh, the tax, which would be tentative frameworks um, because it's a general tax. Uh, we 
may have um, want to have discussion on whether we look at um, a, a advisory ordinance uh, that would make a commitment to the community similar to what we did with the uh, uh, hotel or TOT tax in 2014, where we made the commitment that the new revenue would be going to our capital improvement plan, which eight years later has been uh, abided by uh, successive councils. Um, and we, um, we have uh, questions of whether to have the tax have a sunset on it or not. Um, what level of cap annually on the tax? Um, and then lastly, what sort of exemptions and offsets for different categories of businesses in the community we would want to include? So a number of these, once again, um, we, we have a limited number of alternatives that we can uh, poll under. And maybe, I don't know if our consultants here who can frame for us a little better um, kind of the constraints on what is possible in the final poll, which is focused on evaluating just a couple variations of ballot language, if is my understanding. Sure. And Mayor, as I potentially stall, since we are a little bit ahead of time, um, and I'm not sure that they have joined us on the call at this time. Um, but what I think the mayor is talking about, and just to sum up a bit about next steps and what the third round of polling is intended for. The third round of polling is, as Dave Metz, our polling consultant, referenced last week, is really about posing the full ballot question uh, and assessing voters um, response and sentiment towards that full question, um, looking at both what is the tax structure, the tax rate, as well as the use of those funds. I think he called it the full meal as opposed to a component of the meal. Um, and we can test limited variables. So for example, we can test a minimum rate and a maximum rate. Um, but we are past the idea of testing generalized characteristics. So for example, in this third round of polling, you wouldn't see a question as you saw in the prior poll, which is, would you support a tax at five cents, 10 cents, 20 cents, uh, or I guess five, 10, 15 or 20 cents per square foot per month. You would see a question that said, would you, you know, uh, if placed before the voters, would you consider a, uh, the establishment of a business tax at blank rate uh, that would be used for uh, affordable housing, transportation, grade crossing safety, and I don't know, insert something else, whatever the council chooses in terms of funding, um, and assessing voter sentiment based on, on that and the binary variable of the minimum rate and the maximum rate. Um, and then we can do... Just so everybody follows, when you're saying binary variable... Uh, are you meaning that half the um, people being polled would be asked the minimum rate and another half would be asked the question around the maximum rate? I believe so. Um, so they would split sample, uh, which is also the reason why we can't, we wouldn't be able to accommodate, say, five different variables to be tested. We would really need to limit, limit it because we would be split sampling. And in order to make the poll statistically valid, you need a certain sample size. <laughs> and if we're split sampling, obviously that immediately diminishes your sample sizes. So if the council wishes, uh, if there are some areas of discrepancy that we wish to um, you know, get feedback, frankly, from the voter population uh, to inform the council's decision-making, in those limited circumstances, this third round would accommodate that um, to help inform the council's decision for an ultimate placement for voter consideration. And so that form of questioning in the poll, my understanding is um, it would be different from with the results that we had from the last poll in the, the finance committee. Uh, we had on page seven, uh, a conceptual poll around um, certain parameters. In this case, it was 12 cents per square foot per month and 5,000 square foot exemption. Um, Etc. 
Um, and that was at our last meeting, if I recall correctly, it was kind of described as uh, the whole meal kind of approach. Um, I don't know if that's the ideal metaphor, but, um, <laughs> and then we had um, later in the, in the polling where they asked specific uh, questions on, would you prefer five, 10, 15, 20 cents? So the final poll, as I understand it, would have uh, this binary choice of questions more similar to that one on page seven of the finance committee. Is that correct? I'm pulling up the page, but I think in general, yes. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to make sure everybody kind of had that rough framework for the alternatives and, and uh, that we're not going to be having a whole series of, of options that are presented to um, the public in the final poll. Oh, I see Mr. Metz here. Um, welcome. And so I, I attempted to characterize what I understood uh, would be how the, the final polling would be uh, framed and the limitations on the on the options that we have. Could you uh, wait in on that and yes. correct anything where we got wrong or add to it? Absolutely. I, I think your characterization was spot on. The, the intent is for this final poll to be one which will give uh, the council the data they need to make a go, no go decision on a potential ballot measure. Um, and what that means is that this time we'll need to have enough definition of the substance of what the measure includes that um, working with the city attorney, we can draft a, a legally acceptable and accurate 75 word ballot question to test in the poll and really model presenting voters with what they might see on the ballot if the council chooses to move forward. Um, it may be the council will have one variable that, that we need to test two different ways. You might have two different rates in mind that we need to test. There's ways we can accommodate that. But what we the, the direction we would uh, like to take from you tonight is to have the, the basic architecture of the measure defined in such a way that we can present it to voters of the city and, and get their reactions to it and then come back with you with a, to you with a recommendation about um, whether sufficient support is there to look like you have a reasonable chance of success. Thank you. Um, so why don't we first go in to see if we have consensus on the structure of the poll, whether we're still um, inclined to go with a square footage based poll uh, 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 tax, and then we can have a second discussion around rates if we have that consensus. So uh, Councilmember Cormack. I tentatively move that the tax be determined based on a business's occupied square footage in Palo Alto. Second. Okay. And did any, anyone want to speak to that? Oh, can I speak to it briefly? I, maybe yeah. is it not working? Oh, there we are. Oh, uh, sorry. Did um, uh, uh, council member Phil says speaking to your second. Yeah, just. I appreciate everybody's everybody's Eric, Eric we can't hear you appreciate everybody's passion and, and, and enthusiasm on this topic and there's a bunch of different ways to do it and you know none of these ways is perfect and you know we thought that this one was the best trade-off of simplicity and targeting the right kind of places and being able to manage it and so forth uh, it, it, it isn't perfect we thought it was we thought it was the best trade-off council member Du Bois yeah similar comment I know uh for her people in the community to talk about a headcount tax. We we did look at that again in terms of ease of administration and defining how we count heads in this time of kind of remote work. There were just different challenges with each of the taxes. None of them were perfect. Um, square footage seemed to be a good proxy for size and having a tax that would scale with the size of a business generally, and that's not 100% true, but generally larger businesses have more people which have more impacts. And, you know, could we have more use of funding to mitigate those impacts? Um, I just wanted to clarify the wording on this. You know, it says occupied square footage. Do, do, by that, do we just mean leased? Um, uh, that way was your motion from finance, so I... Yeah. Um, 
I don't know that it has to have the word occupied. Ultimately, yeah. it will be about a business that is conducting business in the Palo Alto limits. It's not necessarily a lease. It's not, you could own the property that you're operating the business yeah. in. So it's really about any business operating within Palo Alto right. city bounds. Um, so could we just drop occupied and leave it to staff to craft you know, the eventual. Yeah. So this, this is not ballot language. This is guidance language to us. Yeah. And we're working on this question of um, ways to draft the long form ordinance that would define this with some precision. But it, the intention is the space that the business uses in a physical footprint to conduct business in yeah. Palo Alto, whether owned or I, I just think it'd be cleaner if we dropped the word occupied. That's or... fine with me. Thanks. Okay, I see no more lights. So would the clerk please call the, oh, okay. Council member Tanaka, you now have your light on. So I, I still think that we should explore other alternatives. Um, I know a lot of other cities have done uh, different types of taxes. And um, I think the public is still trying to become aware of this. So I, I think that it would be good for us to uh, leave that door open a bit. Um, but to the question that uh, Councilmember Du Bois was asking about, I, I think there's a lot of kind of question marks in my head. And I, I've seen um, some of the questions that people have written in about, so what, what is square footage? So as, you, as a lot of you guys know, today, much of, a lot of tech workers actually work remotely now, right? They come in maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, maybe three times a week, but so is it like what like what does occupancy consist of? Is it like once a week? Is it you know coming from an offsite? Is that does that count? Should that count? Is that fair? Um, you know, this is a business that that uh, you know has people there like seven days a week. Should they be taxed more than people that are there for just two days a week? Um, and then. Um, you know, I also wonder about what about like shared spaces, right? So a lot, of, a lot of businesses have shared conference rooms, right? Or shared lobbies or shared cafeterias and break rooms. Do they count? Uh, and what about the elevators and bathrooms, right? Um, what about the parking spaces, garages? Are they going to count or not? Uh, so I, I think to me, there's a, this is a lot of uh, fuzziness here. So I, I, I guess I, I think, um, I think that's some, some of that stuff needs to be clarified. And um, so I, I, I think it's, uh, on one hand, I think we should look at a variety of taxes versus just this one. So we can really make sure that this is the right one for our city because a lot of other cities do it differently than this. Maybe we should be consistent. Um, in fact, this is a less common way of doing a business tax. And the second thing is there's a lot of ambiguity in terms of what does square footage mean? So I think, when we ask people about this, I think some of this language, and maybe I could ask the pollster, like what, um, you know, how, how, what's a plan to try to clarify what is occupied space? Because I can imagine some residents would think that it's kind of unfair that a business that maybe only has people there once or twice a week gets taxed the same as someone that's there for seven days a week. So I don't know, how, how would you handle that? Perhaps, uh, Councilmember Tanaka, I would respond, this is really not an issue for the poll so much it really is one of how our ordinance is written and uh, definitions that staff is currently uh, developing. So correct me if I'm wrong, I thought, I thought the idea behind this was we're trying to get feedback from our residents. And so in order to get feedback, we need to make sure that they know what's going on. And so there's a big difference between a company that is there once a week and another one that has people there, you know, 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week. So to me, it seems very relevant because you, you have to be presenting what's really going on. And so there's a lack of clarity in terms of, and I think that's why a lot of cities don't do square footage checks. And that's why also I think we should uh, still think about other possible business tax because it is kind of a weird tax. And I think this is one reason why people don't do it is because it's not clear. So, um, and then, and, you know, how do you even, how does the business even track this? Let's say you, you try to do it by percentage of time someone's there, but you know, people kind of are there for like three hours a day and they take right, off. Right, you've made that point. Let's, let's so, see. 
Yeah, so I don't know. I, I was going to ask Mr. Metz if you could maybe tell us what your plan is there. No, uh, the city manager just clarified that's not a polling question, but I think we just had that qu your, your question answered. Yeah, just to add to the city manager's comments, the pollster will use the short 75, no more than 75 word question, which is a high level uh, conceptual idea. Um, the staff is working on a much more detailed um, uh, long form ordinance, which would be a part of any measure that council put on the ballot. And that plus administrative regulations would make all of this very clear. Is it clear today? No but it is a legitimate choice for council to make if council wishes to as a policy matter to use the square footage as the measure of business activity in Palo Alto. It, as council member Phil Seth said, it's not a perfect alignment, no measure is. This is a legitimate choice if council wishes to make this choice. Okay. Well, I, I, I think it's uh, something we should try to clarify more on. So I, I, I'm not gonna be supporting this. Council, uh, Vice Mayor, well, let's see. Vice Mayor Koo. So quoting council member Phil Seth again, no tax is perfect, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I find that the business score footage tax um, is gonna be a lot less fuzzier than a lot of the other taxes because one of the things that I find that would be beneficial with the score footage tax is that um, the city planning department would have also the square footages. So there alone, we are able to match up and it would be a lot less fuzzier. So, um, uh, which is why I'm gonna support this tentative motion. And I, I would just add that we, we actually did pull on a variety of taxes forms and we had extensive discussions over many months on the variety of tax forms. So the notion to bring that up at this hour that we need to revisit uh, a range of tax forms, we, uh, Council Member Tanaka may not agree with the decision that's made, but it's not factually correct that we didn't um, review that a broad range of potential tax forms over an extended period of time. All right, um, so uh, if the clerk wouldn't mind, uh, let's go ahead and call the roll on this tentative approval. Council Member Stone? Yes. Council Member Cormack? Yes. Council Member Tanaka? Vice Mayor Ku? Yes. Mayor Burt? Yes. Council Member Du Bois? Yes. Council Member Filsa? Yes. Motion carries six to one. Thank you. Okay, um, so we could next take one of the um, uh, items on, given that we're moving with a square footage based uh, tax in the poll, um, what might be the minimum and the maximum rates we would wanna have um, polled in this way that it would be this binary choice where it, uh, half the respondents would be given one choice and the other half another. Is that correct, Mr. Metz? Uh, yes, essentially. I think there's um, there are two fundamental contrasts that we'll probably want to test in the survey. One, of course, is the relationship between this measure and a measure addressing utility fund transfers and whether both measures are put forward together and the sequence in which they're presented. Um, and then within the business license tax, if we're, if we're splitting our sample to try to address the issues around sequence, that gives us room to perhaps do a similar test on one major policy element within the business license tax itself as part of our base case. We can ask follow-up questions that um, explore other uh, design elements that, that may still need further exploration. But in terms of that base case proposal, we want it to be you know, perhaps one key element that we would test a little more rigorously. Council member Du Bois. Yeah, I mean, listening to the discussion last Monday, um, I'd like to suggest uh, maybe a lower rate than we've been discussing, but I do think it's maybe worthwhile testing two, two, two tax points, tax rates. And again, I think, I think as we talked about pretty extensively, 
when we asked the trade-off question, we were only talking about what you pay and not what the benefits were. Um, and so we got kind of one set of responses. And then when we tested a more complete kind of picture, we got pretty high adoption at a little bit higher rate. Um, and so I would suggest maybe we consider pulling for 10 cents and for 12 cents um, and seeing how, if we separate, if I understand it right, we would separate the sample. And so we would present a complete package and it would just, that those people would hear one of those two rates. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Well, I'll second it, but I may ask for an amendment. So. <laughs> okay. But anyways, I think, um, I think again, uh, a lot of the discussion about trying to keep it simple was useful. I think um, pulling in the rates slightly is also helpful. So um, I think somewhere in that range makes sense. Yeah, I'll just say that uh, I think conceptually that's right. Um, I think pulling the difference between 10 and 12 is very narrow. Um, I recommend that we look at 10 and 15. And um, with 15 really, uh, depending on what exemptions and offsets we settle on, uh, it's probably in the range of the uh, the revenue approximate revenue target that we had originally been conceiving of to address the basically grade separations and uh, affordable housing and homelessness issues. And uh, then uh, I would really advocate that we we think of a primary focus of the expenditures as um, public safety related uh, restorations. So um, I do agree 10 and 12 are narrow. I do wonder if we got a positive response on 12, you know, might we get a negative response on 15? So um, I guess since we're just kind of polling or doing uh, these temporary motions, I wonder maybe if we could hear from council members Okay. You know, if they prefer 12 or 15, I'm just wondering if we do 15. And if we do 10 test, and 12, we'll never know what 15 would have been either. Sure. But if 15 doesn't do well, then we go back to 10. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Um, so let's um, hear from council members on these options. Council member Cormac. Um, thank you. Uh, so here we are <laughs> um, at the big discussion, and I, I think before I weigh in on, you know, whatever the number is, um, I think it's this the right time to discuss what we're using it for, because that's not really on our list of things, and I think it's kind of crucial. So it, it actually is on the list. Uh, uh, we'll get to uses, but because there is such an interplay between scale the tax and what portion of our needs we could address with the tax, uh, uh, feel free to go okay. ahead and okay. do that. So, I mean, I just, I went through the helpful, you know, packet page 172 and, and reflected on what council member Filsa said from last Monday about how much money do we need and, you know, what general things are we going to use it for? Um, and if we've got $21 million per year, and I realize that's a gross number, so I'll just, you know, acknowledge that up front. Um, as I go through those, you know, those five bullets, I think about what we talked about at finance, firm funding for the fire department, right? Sufficient that they can do training um, and the higher level of um, advancements that um, are attractive to people in the fire department that ensure that people have the paramedic service that we get that no one else gets in this county. That's one example. Moving on to transportation. Um, you know, is this going to be enough to do grade separation? I don't think so. We don't really know, but um, could this fund an expansion of our shuttle system and could it be electric? Yeah, um, we could use a couple million dollars for that. Um, affordable housing. So if we use a $750,000 per door that Wilton Court is, you know, $10 million, half of that 21 million would be 13 units in a year. Um, that's not very many. Um, so... <laughs> Um, next, unfunded capital improvements, my always favorite page of the budget slides. Um, we'll use Coverly, completely made up number. If it was 1 billion for the master plan and we only have seven acres, I'm gonna say 300 million, that's 15 years at 21 million. 
um, and climate action, you know, we don't really have you have great numbers yet to know what what that will be. Rebuilding levies, buying appliances, if we wish to help. So when I go through that calculation, um, you know, I'm I'm confident that while you know the 21 million dollar number seems like a significant um, you know bump from zero, which is what we've been collecting, I think the needs are there. So so I just wanted to walk through that thinking because I think. It, it factors into this number that we're choosing um, in the same way that the polling information factors in, in the same way that comments from the public and members of the business community factor in. Um, I don't. I don't think fifteen is. You know, we're we're our our, our prior poll really tells us that fifteen isn't going to work, and we've done this a couple times now. And I I think our pollster has been pretty clear about yeah. saying, you know. That these numbers reflect reflect what the voters think. So I don't see a lot of reason to pull on 15. I think 10 and 12 is super narrow. I'm not sure, you know, how, how well someone is going to be able to differentiate on that and how well then we are going to be able to work with that data when it comes um, and make this decision in June. So um, we haven't yet talked about the phase in. If there is one, I mean, we could also. Well, we, I'm not. I'm, yeah, sorry. I'm just yeah, going to get to numbers. Of, I'm going to get to numbers because it's relevant. If we're going to pull two numbers, maybe we pull five, ten, five cents, and ten cents, and then we have a phase in to get to the ten cents. So that's why I wanted to bring it up in in this area. Um, I don't think pulling on ten and twelve is going to provide us, you know, super helpful data. Um, I'd be more inclined to stick at ten cents. So let me just clarify that we'll have a topic on the phase in whichever is the end dollar amount uh, or rate. So it could yeah. be it could be six and twelve cents. It could be five and ten. It could be seven and a half and fifteen. Uh, but that's uh, I'm, I'm, separate yeah, and from I'm, the amount. I'm not inclined to phase it in, um, but I think it's relevant based on on the numbers. I think these are. Anyway, so I'm just saying if we're going to pull two numbers, I'd rather pull five and 10 than 10 and 12. And then, then we'll get to the phase in option. Okay. Um, Council Member Stone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I mean, I, I share uh, kind of some similar concerns with, with Council Member Cormac, or at least some of her, her thought process. I, and I think I'm curious if. Um, Mr. Metz can maybe weigh in on sort of these two proposals here. I mean, I, I do share a similar concern that the 10 cents and the 12 cents might be a little too narrow. Um, I'm also though concerned that did previous polling already show that 15 cents is, is not very viable. Um, but I'm also not that interested in going to the five to 10 cent uh, range. I, <clears throat> I think council member Cormac, laid out really well the, the needs, and I'm not sure that the five cents would, would get us there. So trying to find the, that proper balance. So Mr. Metz, can you just opine on the 10 to 12 cents? Is that too narrow? And is the 15 cent, ha has that already been addressed in the, in the prior poll? Um, I don't wanna prejudge what the outcome of the survey might be. I mean, that, that's why we do the research. I, I think it is unlikely that in the ballot question alone, voters will draw sharp distinctions between 10, 12, 15 cents or, or even higher amounts just in the ballot question. But what we should also do is uh, modify the pro and con arguments that we test to relate to those rates, um, the way that supporters and opponents would in the course of a community debate. So test different scales of what the impacts would be on the rents paid by businesses. Um, in, in dollar terms and in proportional terms and see what kind of impact that has on uh, uh, the effectiveness of opposition messages. And obviously we can also test it in terms of the scope of what the, the city would be able to pay for with the revenue provided by different tax amounts. And that's where I suspect we may start to see a little bit more dramatic difference emerge. Um, in just the context of the ballot question, I think many voters won't have enough uh, background to really draw meaningful distinctions between those those rates. Okay, uh, thank, thanks. I I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think I think that maybe the ten to twelve cent range. I, mean, I can imagine if I was if I was 
being pulled on that to me, that might seem very, very narrow and, and almost to the point where now maybe as a, a voter just being pulled on it, I would think it was almost an arbitrary jump, even though I, I know it's not, um, especially when it comes to revenue generation and, and all that. So I, I'd be interested in seeing what 15, with the 15 cent, um, what could be accomplished there. And I think, especially once we start getting into the arguments of how that money is going to be, be utilized, if we have very clear you know, arguments articulated for it, like council member Cormac just laid out, um, I'd be interested to see what that, what information comes out from that. Council member Du Bois, did you mean to still have your light on? Or well, we're going to come back to uses again. I just, I didn't really speak to the needs. I did want to speak to that at some point. Um, but if we're going to come back to it later, I could wait. To the extent that it interplays with what rates we would pull on, I, I do want to clarify just one point again, is that the, the um, people being polled won't be asked whether they support a 10 or a 12 cent. Half of them will be asked whether you support a 10 cent and half will be asked whether you support right. a 12 or a right. 15 cent, whichever we decide. So maybe just quickly, uh, similar but different uses than Councilmember Carmack. You know, again, we've spent a long time on grade separations and issues around track safety as well as flow. Um, I think the lowest cost estimates we got were 200 to 250 million per crossing. Um, I think the Measure B funds at this point are, are 400 million. Is that right? And then. You know, so if you look at this business tax and you say we take a portion of it and we bond it, we're talking about maybe 100 to $120 million that could go towards grade subs. So if you add the measure B, there's still a gap. We're still short. The good news is there's now federal grants available. And a lot of those federal grants require local contributions. So that portion of the business tax would actually help us meet that need. Um, so we haven't 100% defined our preferred alternatives, but again, I think if you look at even the lowest lowest cost options, um, we can see there's quite a large need for grade separations. Affordable housing, again, if we if we thought about how a business tax could maybe contribute $10 million, we'd be talking about maybe one 100% affordable housing project a year or every other year. And I think we can all agree that that would be a good thing. Um, if we look at homeless programs, um, which is another need, I think we've heard from the community. Um, you know, we have some operational gaps in some of the programs we're looking at. Um, I think we could do more around people living in vehicles. And then um, public safety, again, I think a portion of this tax could, could pay for more policing you know, we're hearing needs about violent crime, around property crime. And again, our numbers are showing that there's not more incidents of these crimes. But I do think the nature of these crimes has changed where they're, they're organized, they're brazen, they're going after high value targets. When in the past, it may have been, you know, a bike got stolen. You know, now it's 10 product bags. And again, this is, this is an area that benefits the business community, benefits residents. Um, and then the last one, we have a bunch of projects around our two downtowns. There's redesign of the streetscape. There's staff and consulting expenses around parklet programs and aesthetics, um, around economic development consultants. Again, these are all things I think it would make sense for the business tax to cover. And again, when you add all these things up, I think it's clear kind of what, where the need, there is a distinct need there. But you know, the hard, the hard thing about these price points, and I know we're gonna come back to this, but it, it's the function of, well, are we talking about one ballot measure, just the business tax on its own or two? Um, and are we talking, when would it start and would we phase it in? And I know we're gonna get to those in steps, but you know, it's, it's where these interplay starts to come in. Try to get some clarifications before we move forward because council member Stone was going back to this question of what the most recent poll had indicated or actually the first two. And, 
And maybe if Mr. Metz can help us on the presentation that went to the uh, Finance Committee, uh, slide seven, had this about three and five support a business license tax conceptually, and that was at a 12 cent. And it was, uh, when it was asked first, it was 63% supporting and asked second, 59%. But then we had this other uh, question under slide 20, which was the four different uh, rates of five, 10, 15 and 20 cents per month, which had lower support levels. Um, and that's where it showed only up to the 10 cent that it had a majority support uh, without um, uh, the undecided included. Um, so Mr. Metz, can you clarify, uh, because uh, I think different folks have been looking at one of those pages and drawing a certain conclusion and then other, other of us and members of the public have um, understood the other page as far as the indicators at this time. We, we know we have to go to this next poll, but how do we interpret that last poll? Yeah. So I think that goes back to uh, my response to the council member's question a, a few moments ago. The initial question that includes the 12 cent rate in a, in a ballot, uh, of sort of a full description of what a ballot measure might look like, um, is just testing the rate without context. And I am fairly confident that most voters don't understand exactly what 12 cents means in terms of how much more businesses would pay than what they're currently paying. Um, and it was actually at the council's direction that we included a question that provided that context, which is the second question you mentioned, where we test four rates, but only after informing the respondents about what current uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, rental rates are in the city. So in that second question where they're focused on multiple rates, um, they have more information, they have more background, they understand how that compares to what businesses are currently paying. And as I said uh, in last Monday's meeting, it's also a question that divorces the rate from details about what the money would pay for. In that regard, it's similar to what I described a moment ago, which is the way that voters react to the rate in the context of a community debate where they get a lot more information. They hear opponents saying, this is gonna be costly and here's why. They hear supporters saying, well, but here's some of the good things that we could do with the money. Um, and that's, I think we have to replicate that same dynamic again in, in the upcoming poll. But I would look at that data from the last poll and say, that's why I think a 15 cent rate may be challenging is because when voters hear about it in the context of this additional information, they're pretty clearly less supportive than they are of a lower rate. Again, we can embed it in a more fully developed ballot uh, question and, and see whether that lifts the support up. Um, but that more informed question, I think, probably replicates the kind of uh, mindset voters are likely to have by the time they vote, given that there are likely to be uh, active voices on both sides of this debate if you choose to move forward with a measure. Okay, thanks. Um, and then in that context of what rates we will poll on, uh, I just want to respond to uh, some comments on the uses. First, uh, there's been on the grade separations, which is this big important use that we've discussed for several years uh, for the business tax, uh, we really have two different ways to look at what the need is. The first is uh, what's, what's the unfunded amount to actually build these grade separations. If we have approximately 400 million for measure B and depending on what designs we come up with, you know, are we going to have from 650 million uh, or more? And that doesn't include Alma uh, or uh, Palo Alto Avenue, which we haven't begun to study. Um, but as council member Du Bois mentioned, uh, we now have significant federal dollars that are coming into grade separation funding. And it appears that the modest state dollars are likely to increase in the next year or two. And then we even could have regional measures. And almost invariably, these kinds of projects are uh, funded over time after a design is selected and different funding sources are assembled to address them. So 
but to get those other funding sources, you need the local share. And um, that's what I think we're actually looking at identifying most importantly here is how do we come up with a local share? If we don't have that, we don't get out of the gate. And that's the problem. And that's what we need to address most immediately is that significant local share. It's not insignificant. If, as the uh, staff report had shown us, if we dedicated, if it was say that uh, about the 10% rate and we dedicated 7 million a year and we bonded against that, that would be about $100 million in a local share. And that would be a, a sizable local share. It wouldn't fill all the funding gap in all likelihood, uh, but it would probably be the basis to have us in a strong position to be able to leverage those dollars. If we don't have that, we can't get in line to leverage those dollars. Um, second on um, the other big use of uh, this in my mind has been throughout all our discussions and going back to 2018 <laughs> is affordable housing and homelessness. And um, it's a misconception that when we look at how many doors um, our dollars would fund, uh, because once again, that's not how these things are funded. We, don't, we didn't pay for all Wilton Court. We don't pay for all of any of these projects. So to, to do a simple mathematical equation on how many doors this opens, uh, it just disregards the reality that they're leveraged dollars. And maybe we're, I think on Wilton Court, we, we provide about a, a third of the dollars, different times it's you know in that kind of range. So that's how we should think about it. And if we had, if we had the 15 cents, I had kind of uh, rate uh, and put a, a third of those dollars and came up with about $10 million a year for affordable housing, um, that would just about double our rate of affordable housing construction in this community. I've had these discussions with Palo Alto Housing Corp and, and um, that's a rough ballpark. And that's a really important thing. I mean, to double the rate of affordable housing in our community is immensely important. Um, and if we are lower than that, uh, we're, we're not gonna be able to double it, but we could have a significant uh, increase nevertheless. So I just wanted to frame both of those issues and make sure people understood um, uh, that in both those areas, we're not talking about the direct dollars. It's the essential local share to be able to get uh, regional, state, and federal dollars, however they, uh, and, and even in the case of affordable housing, philanthropic dollars. Um, so council member Phil Seth. You know, I'm listening to the, to, to the mayor talk about this and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to think about this some more, but, you know, my, my, my arithmetic on this is actually pretty simple, similar to council member Cormack's. And, you know, again, I think the, the one question is, you know, what do we think the voters will approve? But I think, you know, there's a more fundamental one is what do we need? Right? Because I don't want to ask people for more than we're going to need. Right. Um, and so, my sense is that the sweet spot is about 10 cents a square foot. And that's the question of, should we pull at 15 or not? Well, and I think the mayor's, mayor's got some interesting points about uh, uh, you know, the matching dollars, the kind of the sequence of the matching dollars need to be there, okay, before you can, I mean, there's a, a chicken and egg problem with those kinds of things too. That said, you know, my, uh, my, my, main, my main concern about the next level of polling is, is less about the 10 or 15%, but, uh, you know, the two measures versus one. So, you know, you know, I hope we get that one right. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's my, uh, that's my paranoia is that, uh, is that we, we make sure we're clean on that one is, uh, is I think the most important. As for that, whether it's uh, 10 and 12 or 10 and 15, you know, I have less of a strong opinion about that. And council member Tanaka. So I have to, okay, I guess, first of all, um, back to what the mayor was saying earlier about that uh, it's, it's already, the polls already been done on different voting, uh, different uh, tax types, and it's true. But I think the problem is that the square footage is also problematic. And also it doesn't necessarily have the right nexus to the usage, right? Like I said, some people will use the square footage a lot more, have a lot more impacts on the family, on, on, the, on the traffic and whatnot. 
Um, so I, I think that that's one of the reasons why I think it should still still be open. But I have to agree with what uh, Councilmember Filsa said and Carmack, which is I, I kind of wonder why are we talking about the tax rate right now versus shouldn't we be talking about how we're going to use it first and figure out how much how much do we need and agree on that and then talk about how much uh, the tax rate should be because it's kind of like as uh, the vice mayor said earlier it's the cart before the horse uh, we are saying we're going to tax this much because it looks like this is something that people might accept but really what we should be doing is figuring out what do we what do we need to do how much is it going to cost agree on on that as a council and then go for the tax. So uh, in terms of order of agenda, I'm not quite sure why we're talking about this right now versus um, the actual usage, it seems a little bit backwards. But um, anyway, since we're on this topic in terms of rates, my, my big concern with how we're doing this right now is kind of what I said last time around, which is uh, the rates that, that um, rents are being told what people are currently are paying is really not correct. It's like double what's currently being paid if not more. And so it's very misleading because people think about, well, what percentage of what they pay right now in rent is this? And because rates are so much lower than what's being said, the rates, the rates that were in the poll were, were basically pre-pandemic peak rates and not today's super depressed rates. Or we have record vacancy in our research park. We have record vacancies in our downtown. And these rates are not realistic. Now I realize the mayor keeps saying that it's you know, these, these are the right rates, but the data out there says it's not. And just because we keep saying it, it doesn't mean it's true. So I think, um, I think we need to, first of all, I think we need to figure out what do we need, how much is it going to cost, and then, and then figure out how we finance it versus what we're doing right now, which is we're trying to figure out the financing, which doesn't make sense. And the second thing is when we do poll, we need to have realistic rates that people are paying today because there's an incredible amount of incentives that people are getting just to move in from tenant improvements to, um, there's, the, there's the advertised rates as I showed last time. And I know I, I could ask Leslie to bring up the slide again if you guys don't remember, but there's a, like the advertised rates. And then there's the rates that people are actually paying, which are very, very different, which are dramatically lower than what um, the advertised rates are. So there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a bit of a capitulation right now in the, in the office rental market that's not being factored in. And I think that has to be, in the polls. And so um, I, I guess what is what is staff's plan in terms of, are, are you guys gonna update the rates or are you gonna use the rates that you guys have kind of like what I consider the, the pre-pandemic rates or what, what's the plan in terms of when you guys poll and maybe this is something for, I don't know if I don't see our polling company on there but uh, I don't know if someone on staff can talk about that. Um, Council member Tanaka staff has been and will continue to use the data that is available to us based on the information um, through various sources, such as CoStar or Collier's or other real estate information. If there are proprietary information that staff doesn't have access to, I'm not sure how well, we I can- Well, I sent you guys a slide last week, or Leslie has it, so she can forward it to you. And that's just pulled directly from the CoStar system, which I'm not sure you guys have access to, but. If you don't, other people have access to it. I can give it to you guys. But if you look at the rates, it's nowhere close to what you guys showed on, on the survey. Sure. So as I said, we will pull the rates that we have, the most updated rates we have from those information sources like CoStar, like Collier's, and use those in our polling. Um, I don't have the slide that you're referencing, so I'll have to look at that to okay. see. Maybe let's look um, forward to but, that. Ultimately, we will work internally on those aspects. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then kind of like my final comment here, and I, I know I'm just a few seconds right now, which is fundamentally, I, I kind of feel that what we should be doing is presenting all the facts, all the different perspectives, the pros and cons to the voters and letting them, letting them decide versus trying to kind of engineer this. Because it, it, to me, as a representative of the, of the community, and this is a big decision, right? This is gonna determine how our community will, will um, be in the future. We should present all the facts, all the numbers and let them decide. I don't think we should be, you know, testing this, testing that, um, pulling the heck out of people to figure out how do we kind of thread a needle to get something to pass. I, I don't agree with it. I don't think that's our job 
as representatives. Our job isn't trying to maximize the revenue for the city. That's not our job. Our job is to make sure that we provide the best community possible for our residents. So just the process alone, I, I don't agree. We're on a third, maybe fourth poll. And how much money are we spending on this? It doesn't make sense to me. We're on our, we're, this will be our third poll. And there's also a plan, a fourth poll that's uh, staff's what? talking about as well. But my, my main Excuse point me, is I that- I don't believe that's accurate. We've done two polls. Correct. Right, this is a proposal for a third poll. Correct. Okay. And I saw that this comes also for a fourth poll. But no, just a second. That's what I'm trying to clarify okay. factually. Uh, Ms. Nose, is there any discussion about a fourth poll? Um, not from a pollster. We may do surveys, online surveys as part of engagement yeah. there, for the there budget is no process, consideration but there is no fourth and poll. We've had this discussion actually extensively before the council that from a timing standpoint, we wouldn't even have time to do a, a fourth poll. So I don't know. I just... I, I, let's keep things factually and not. Oh, I agree. In, let's keep things factual. And and what we should do is present the facts to the residents. That's what, we, that's what we should be doing. We shouldn't be trying to engineer something that passes. We should be presenting all the facts and letting the public decide. Okay. Vice Mayor Koo. Um, we have been talking about some of the uses that this will fund. And, you know, in addition to all of the uses that many of my colleagues have already mentioned, um, you know, for affordable housing, there's also services for the unhoused or the homeless, but that also involves uh, wraparound services, which is another expense and um, caseworkers, right? So um, costs are continuously going up, uh, you know, higher and higher. So I think that, you know, we really have to look at the rates pretty carefully. Uh, additionally, I also think that a lot of our um, uh, facilities are needs are in need of improvements, right? And those are very important to our residents and the community itself. Um, you know, um, the animal shelter. There's Kabuli, which Council Member um, Cormac mentioned, but also we have. Um, a historical building, Lucy Stearns, that houses uh, our theaters, and that's going to be in need of some uh, love and care. And so I think that we have a lot of um, community assets that needs to be um, uh, uh, worked on. Um, but in addition to the enhanced services, um, not only does our fire department, as Council Member Cormac had mentioned, needs the training and, and so forth. But I think that, you know, with our police teams, our special police teams, not only to support traffic and downtown core safety, but also to include a more um, robust um, uh, mental health persons to go out with the police at such as what we have with the PERT program, but also dispatcher in order to recognize the mental health aspects when a call comes in. So we have a lot of things that we can invest in, um, in a changing society. Um, right, so I think that those are some of the additions that I would like to add. Um, and, you know, with our grade separations, um, with this kind of in, invest, um, investment from the business community um, to give back actually, you know, for a lot of the work that a lot of things that residents are putting up with, there's also, it will free up also some of the funding for more code enforcement, um, uh, you know, leaf blowers and so forth. Um, so I, I, I would be more inclined to go to the 15, you know, uh, from 10 cents to the 15 cents um, um, rate um, to give it a little bit more room for, um, for, for, the, for people to weigh in on. Thank you. Council Member Phil Seth, were you up again? Yeah, so I will second Council Member Du Bois's motion, and then I expect that probably somebody will propose an amendment to change the 12 cents to something else, and we'll see. So I had actually already seconded it. Oh, okay. Yeah. In that case, uh, never mind. Yeah. Sorry, I and missed it. It was a question whether I'd propose an amendment. Um, 
I think we were trying to get that feedback on 12 or 15 from everybody. Right. So your motion was the 12, and then we were getting a uh, discussion on whether to reconsider it under an amendment. And I think um, the clarification that Mr. Metz provided uh, on what the indications were from uh, the last poll uh, makes me willing to uh, keep it with uh, the two options that are here. I did want to just once again touch on these uses because folks are adding a, a list of really important long-term needs, uh, but this uh, this range of, of revenue that we'd get at the 10 or the 12 cents is not going to be able to meet all those needs. And um, the more we start throwing in the kitchen sink uh, uh, in this bucket, um, uh, the more unclear it'll be on what the purposes are. Um, and if we, if we have this kind of rate structure and have major portions of it for grade separations and affordable housing slash homelessness issues, there will perhaps be a modest amount left over for uh, whether it is public safety or some other focus, uh, but not millions of dollars and tens of millions of dollars for Animal Service Center or Coverly or Lucy Stern or any of those things uh, or new programs. There, this, there aren't enough dollars in this to do that. So the issue when we've had this criticism of, of uh, gee, we've talked about different uses, um, uh, that's because we're narrowing what we can use it on, not expanding it. Um, so um, let's see, are we back? Uh, further discussion on this motion? Um, Council Member Cormack. Uh, thank you, Mayor Burt. Um, and I agree with you, a bit of a laundry list. Mine were meant to be examples, not preferences or recommendations, just a way to, you know, sort of evaluate from the uses side, um, the correct rate on the, the sources side. Um, but I it would be an interesting discussion about how much is going to go to which. So I, I, with regret, am not going to be able to support this motion. Um, and I'm just spending a lot of quality time again on, on slide 20 from the finance packet. And I remain concerned about what I said last time, which is the diminution from the very acceptable part. Um, I think it's not listed on the slides, but I recall, um, you know, this is pretty soft support, actually. We don't have a lot in the dark green. Um, we have more in the light green, which is the somewhat acceptable. And um, I just think the further, you know, I'm not sure if it's north of 10 we go on in terms of, uh, of prices or south of this dotted line here, I think the less likely we are to um, present something that will be um, you know, supported by the majority of voters. 54% at total acceptable is really close to the margin. Um, and, you know, this is our one last shot with the poll um, to really narrow in. And I'd, I'd prefer to use our, our one shot on one of these other um, options. Um, I remain convinced of, about what, you know, Council Member Filso said that the most important thing is are we putting on two or one? Um, I just, I don't, I don't think this is the right thing to do, so won't be supporting it. Council Member Du Bois. No, I didn't remember that. All right, so let's go ahead and vote on this tentative uh, approval motion. Vice Mayor Koo. Yes. Council Member Cormack. No. Council Member Tanaka. No. Mayor Burt? Yes. Councilmember Filsaf? Yes. Councilmember Du Bois? Yes. Councilmember Stone? Yes. Motion carries five to two. Okay, thank you. Um, let's try to tackle a couple that may be easier. Um, maybe. So one is the question of the uh, annual cap. Um, the Finance Committee had recommended, I think, a 6% annual cap with a rollover uh, 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 provision. 
And so um, let's see what we th think about that. I'll just say that I'm, I'm a little more receptive to um, a 5% cap uh, and then discussion on, I, I think a rollover is probably a, a good idea. Um, but I'll just put that out on the table to start the discussion. Councilmember Cormack. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you mean by rollover. Um, so uh, Ms. Nose, you wanna go ahead and explain it? Sure, um, we may structure Obviously, it's a policy decision for the council, um, but as proposed currently, it would be a 6% cap per annum and any excess CPI. So should the CPI increase above 6% in any given year, the council would have the ability to carry over that difference to future years. So let's say CPI in any year is 8%. Well, the rate of the tax wouldn't go up more than 6% that year, but the 2% difference could be applied in a future year. So a future for how year, long? A how? future year that it was below the 6%. Right. So right. the next year it's four, we could then use the two to get to six. How many years would that carry over? That's, it, it's a policy decision, but what the way it was imagined is that it would carry over annually until the excess was used, but council could also decline to okay. use it. Okay. I, I'm not sure where this conversation happened because it's news to me. This I don't think this was brought up last Monday. It hasn't been in here. It wasn't it in the finance committee recommendation. Yeah. That's correct. That they that we roll over a the excess? Any excess not used. Okay. Um I'm not sure how I feel about that. I agree that 5% is a round, more round number than 6%, but I don't think we can actually have this decision until we talk about phase-in because we can't decide what year it's starting, right? If I'm looking at the finance committee recommendation, it was to start in 2027. So if we're not doing a phase-in, it would start in 2025, presumably. Did, did the mayor want to go in a separate order? Or? I'm just looking at I, 2I which is, I presume, what we're doing? I think what the mayor was trying to do was just focus on the CPI and when it kicks in, we'll be decided. So we're splitting I in half. <laughs> right. Okay. And again, um, this was actually a recommendation from staff on how caps work. It wasn't okay. the finance committee's idea. All right. I definitely missed it. Um, I, I would be unlikely to support that without some, you know, pretty short term, you know, rollover. Um, I don't, I don't want us to be, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of that, but again, thinking here on the fly. So look forward to seeing, hearing from others. Council member Phil Seth. Well, you know, I, I, I get that there's some passion around this issue, but it, it seems almost like a distraction because, I mean, what we're talking about is indexing it to inflation, right? And so, you know, if inflation is 4% and the tax goes up 4%, but everybody's revenue went up 4% too, because that's the nature of, nature of inflation. So it seems almost like a don't care, uh, or it should be in a perfect world a don't care. And the cap is actually, you know, at some level, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a perk, right? Because what it says is if inflation is 8% and your revenue goes up 8%, the tax will only go up 6% or 5% or whatever it is, at least for a year, right? And so, you, you, you know, you're actually better off that way with high inflation than with low inflation. So, you know, it, it seems like, I mean, we got some thorny issues and there's going to be, I mean, there, there's, there's, you know, there's some legitimate objections to business taxes in general and stuff like that. But this one seems like, you know, like one of the, the less material ones, right? So I'm okay with 5%. Um, you know, I mean, given that there's a rollover, I mean, if we get back into the, to the, to the eighties when we had 15 or the seventies, when we had 15% inflation, we're going to have to, sort something else out anyway right but but you know so whether it's five or six or 
you know, for, you know, as long as there's a rollover provision, you know, it seems like we're going to end up, everybody's going to end up whole over time anyway. So. Council member Tanaka. So I think the problem with inflation is that it's not even. If inflation was even, if everyone's wage went up at the same rate and everyone's cost went up at the same exact rate, inflation wouldn't actually be that big of a deal. Um, still a problem, but not as big of a deal with the fact that inflation is very uneven. Some parts of the economy will inflate much, much faster than others. Like look at gas. I think gas is 48% increase, right? It was, it's what, $6.50 now. Sometimes it's... Uh, you know, last year was $3 or something. So, um, so I, I think that uh, the, big, the big problem here is that because there's such an unevenness in the economy of inflation, the problem is that uh, as, a, as a business trying to operate and you have this incredible uncertainty, it's really difficult to make sense as to, um, as to like, what is, your, what is your cost really going to be? Some businesses, yes, yes, they can increase their rates. Some of them cannot. And so I think that's, that's a problem. So I think what we need to do is we need to look at other cities in terms of what, what, what do they do? So I think in San Jose, for instance, they have a CPI. It's, it's, it's index to CPI with an annual cap of 3% with no carryover. And, and so... Uh, I, I know that's what San Jose is, but I think we should look at other cities as well and see what they do versus just making something up. And I, I think having no cap doesn't make sense either. So I, I think we want, this is all gonna be a big heavy lift for a lot of the businesses in our city. And I think that we should, we're then creating a lot of uncertainty um, that this already is causing and, and difficulty to operate. I think we should look at other cities, maybe use San Jose as a reference versus trying to just make something up and cause even more hardship than there is. Especially right now, the economy looks like, while it's, um, you know, there's a lot of inflation, it looks like some parts of the economy are starting to slow down. Uh, so, I mean, look at our stock market, we're starting to dip a bit. So that's kind of a sign that things are not as strong as they used to be. So I think we need to be careful here. Okay, um, council member Du Bois. Yeah, I think, uh, difference between 6% and 5%, I would support 5% if that's the motion. You said that's your motion, the 5%? I'm saying if somebody made that motion, I would support the 5%. We don't have a motion. Okay, right so I will move the 5% um, without a rollover. I... I think that's a mistake. I don't know if I could support it without the rollover. The issue is once you get behind, you're... Well, let's, let's see yeah. if there's a second. Council Member Cormack. Um, I'll second it for purposes of discussion and because I brought it up. Um, but as I look at the part after this um, in the staff report, I'm reminded that the city council will have the ability to pause the annual escalation. And I see a lot of nodding um, from our staff, pause the collection and reduce the tax rate. So that, that remains to all of us if there is a problem in the future. So that makes me more willing to consider a rollover. On the other hand, I think if we are going to do a rollover, we should probably, you know, have a period of time, right? The IRS does this, right? You get a couple of years to smooth things out with, you know, certain things. Um, staff want to weigh in. I'm seeing thoughts okay, here. I'm um, oh, sorry. Well, first, there was a second on purpose of, for purpose of discussion. So then I want to speak to the motion. Okay. Um, and I, I just uh, am concerned that the rollover will create an additional complexity um, that uh, will add to opposition. And I just don't think it, it's highly material over the course of the tax. Um, I think the rollover in the abstract is reasonable, um, but I'm trying to be pragmatic in terms of wanting to have as simple of a measure as we can uh, on the ballot that uh, still generally 
meets our what we think is fair and um, our needs. So that's my reasoning. Um, excuse me, but uh, we've got 2027 in there in the motion, and I don't think we specified a date because we haven't had the the uh, phase of discussion yet. So if and, the clerk yeah, could just remove that. At this point in time, that's was that based upon administration? I don't know why that would even was maybe ask a clarifying question of the. So um, it was part of the finance discussion. I don't think it just belongs here. Okay, so let's just leave off that date that it would essentially by implication, it would be um, uh, commence whenever the tax commenced. And, and might staff now just respond on thoughts on whether or not a rollover should have a, if it was a short term period, if that'd be better or just any general thoughts that would help us make this decision. I wouldn't want to surmise on whether or not a term on it would help or not. Um, I wonder if Dave has any um, insight from his experience mm -hmm. from a polling perspective and perhaps other agencies, since we haven't tested that here specifically. Um, I will say this wasn't a concept that was pulled out of thin air. Uh, this was uh, something as we were researching different structures for CPI increases across a number of agencies and a number of different types of taxes. Um, you may recall one of the provisions in property taxes, there's a CPI cap on it, Prop 13. But if a property is downwardly assessed uh, and we grow back up, you know, there, it, that's the ceiling, so to speak. So you, you can continue to grow while the economy recovers after a downgrade. Um, so again, it is a policy call um, and it was basically the one of the many options that we researched. But Dave, do you have experience in terms of rollovers and or time limited rollovers? I, I don't, um, I'd have to check with some of my colleagues, but that's not a structure that I can recall uh, testing and polling recently. And just a quick follow-up to staff. Um, stormwater is not structured this way, right? Do we have a rollover with stormwater? Not that I'm aware of. I want to say it's just the 6% cap. So this is sort of a new, new and improved thing that maybe we didn't do when we did stormwater? Let's go with the new and improved and a lot more research and uh, all of us have been a lot more educated. Um, right. So as we were talking with our experts um, yeah. and our consultants, this was one of the. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty persuaded by the mayor's argument of sim simplicity. Um, I also can appreciate that, you know, without a sunset provision, which I don't think we will end up having, this might provide some buffer, uh, you know, for something that's unexpected. It's like, I guess, the opposite of the pandemic or something like that. <laughs> okay. Um, Council Member Du Bois. Yeah. So again, I think when we talked about this fi finance and staff, staff had presented, you know, that it was uh, a good thing to do, that there were a lot of examples. And then again, if if CPI is high for a number of years, we, we fall seriously behind and there's no way to catch up. And again, what council member Cormac did, pointed out is council always has the ability to lower the tax, stop the tax, defer the escalation, but we don't have the ability to go the other way. So, you know, I'm concerned about pulling out the rollover. Um, you know, if there's a lot of support for no rollover, I think we should go back to 6%, honestly, because then we risk, the risk of falling behind, you know, decreases a little bit. Um, but I think 5% with a rollover is reasonable. And maybe we could just pull in these other terms about council's ability to defer the tax and defer the escalation and just vote on all that together here. Because again, I, I think those are really important things that we're not locked into increasing the tax if we decide it's not a good time to do it. Well, we don't, on, on the part of the council's ability, that's just by law. Yeah. So we don't have to put that in a motion. Anymore. Okay. I just, I think it's important to recognize it and not lose that. But. Okay. Um, Vice Mayor Koo. <clears throat> Basically what council member Du Bois said, and I would, um, recommend if it's without the rollover to go to the 6%. Would you consider amendment? Um, 
No, let's let's do a vote on this um, and then see where it goes. Uh, Council Member Stone. No, I mean, I'm fine if we, we take the vote. I was just going to say where I'm where I'm at is with Council Member Du Bois and, and the Vice Mayor. I do think I, I do think the rollover makes sense. I understand the argument for for trying to remove that that argument, but um, I do think a lot of this is just going to be an educational campaign, getting us to the fall and making it clear that still it won't go beyond the five percent rate. I, I do think this does open it to criticism, but um, I think we are leaving a lot on the table if we remove the rollover. Okay, um, let's go ahead and take a vote and see how this shakes out. Councilmember Filsa? No. Councilmember Tanaka? No. Mayor Burt? Yes. Councilmember Du Bois? No. Councilmember Stone? No. Councilmember Cormack? Yes. Vice Mayor Koo? No. Motion fails two to five. Okay, um, so then I'll entertain a modified motion. Councilmember Du Bois. That's the same motion with the rollover. Okay. Second. Remove the word out and seconded by Vice Mayor Koo. And hopefully we have no other discussion and let's go ahead and vote on this tentative approval. Uh, this, this would be, yeah. The same motion, but changing the word without to with. Does that look accurate, Mr. Mayor? Pardon me? Does that look accurate, sir? Does it look correct? Is that what you asked? Yes. I think so. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Councilmember Du Bois? Yes. Councilmember Phil Seth? Yes. Councilmember Stone? Yes. Councilmember Cormack? Yes. Mayor Burt? Yes. Vice Mayor Koo? Yes. Councilmember Tanaka? No. Motion carries six to one. Okay. Um, So we could next go into whether to have a sunset on this. And Ms. Nose, um, can you share with us there, you had some insights from our consultant uh, on the um, impact of different uh, sunsets on the likelihood of, of passage. I don't know if Mr. Metz uh, also has something to weigh in on that. Um, but I think that would be illuminating. Sure, and I may got the, the specific wording correct, so I will ask my city manager and Dave and um, city attorney to help correct me or clarify as I may get this wrong. Um, but ultimately, the, our, 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 our consultant has advised us that typically when a sunset is beyond a 10 year period of time, uh, so a double digit frame, uh, that has actually a negative impact on sentiment. Um, so I will ask for anybody else's thoughts, but ultimately that's the pretty blunt <laughs> feedback we got when asked about something like that. Yeah, that was kind of a paradoxical uh outcome, but uh, Mr. Metz, do you have any insights on that as well? Uh, yes, I concur. I, you know, if the, if the intent of a sunset provision is to assure the voters that a tax will be in effect for a limited period of time and they'll get to weigh in on it again, the way we sometimes phrase it is if you can have a child and send them to college before the tax will come back to you for another vote, it doesn't feel to voters like it's a real constraint or limitation on the duration of the tax. Um, and so, you know, what we typically recommend is that uh, if you are going to have a, a sunset that it have a more limited near term scope and that's typically what voters would uh, be more likely to react positively. To. And I'll, I'll just add if so that's either a, a sunset of less than 10 years or no sunset is the recommendation and if we're going to bond. Um, for the uh, 
share that might go to grade separations, um, we need a period of time that Ms. Nose, uh, what time frame to be able to really bond against that? Sure. Um, thank you, Mayor. In council, obviously, as you've been discussing potential uses, one of them is potentially financing or leveraging these uh, funds as a revenue stream uh, for improvements. So our historic practice has been a 30-year um, debt service. So depending on the structure of the debt, either lease-backed or a revenue-backed um, debt or bond measure, uh, you would need a revenue stream to satisfy the full debt service. Obviously, rating agencies and the market would want to know that there's sufficient revenues to cover and service that debt over the course of it. So something that ends midway through would be problematic. Okay. Council member Phil said. That was actually my question is if there's a sunset, can we bond against it? And I think it's been answered. Council member Cormack. Um, yeah, again, it's not just, you know, what we can bond against. It's also what are we going to be using this for? And to the extent we're using this for, you know, services, those serv those need for those services is not going to go away. Um, so, you know, in terms of matching the sources and the uses and the time frame, I this is not a one defined project. It's going to be over in a certain period of time that we can match this to. This is an ongoing you know, support. So that's why I'm supportive of not having a sunset. Council member Du Bois. Yeah, and again, I think the discussion we've had about um, not only the ongoing need, but um, this being part of a fair share, as well as maybe a um, diversification of the city's tax revenue as, as sales tax has not advanced as fast. Having a business tax, it's really a long-term structural solution. Okay. Um, do we have somebody who wants to make a motion on sunsetting issue? Move no sunset. Move. Move what? No sunset. No sunset. Second. Okay. And Council Member Phil Seth, do you want to speak to that anymore? Nope. I think it's been said. <laughs> Council Member Cormack? No, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other lights. So let's go ahead and vote on this tentative approval. Council member Tanaka? No. Vice Mayor Koo? Yes. Council member Cormack? Yes. Council member Filsa? Yes. Mayor Burt? Yes. Council member Du Bois? Yes. Council member Stone? Yes. Motion carries six to one. Great. Um, <clears throat> Let's just for sake of sequence, uh, let's next go whether we want to have uh, tentatively a, an advisory ordinance that would give guidance on uses. Um, we still would have discussions on those uses and not necessarily even tonight. This can be after we get the next polling that we Yes, Mayor, if I may uh, yeah. clarify, I think you used the term ordinance. Uh, just to be clear, as staff had proposed that it was a resolution rather than- Resolution, excuse me. Thank you. So this is just a, a tentative direction. Um, once again, nothing we're doing tonight is binding, but it's, it's trying to narrow where we're going. Council Member Du Bois. Yeah, so if council, agrees to have a resolution, would that be used in the polling in this next round? Mind to elaborate on that and then hopefully Dave can help us. How so would it be used? I, again, if we do um, agree that we wanna have a council resolution and we could agree to what areas that would be for, would that help Mr. Metz in the polling? Even though it would to, be to separate provide more clarity to the respondents on what the council's intention is. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, I mean, the mayor just said we didn't need to decide tonight, but I wanted to know if it would help if we did. Sure. I think if you provided that direction, we could test that as a message in favor of the measure, uh, indicating what the council's stated intent for, for using the money would be. Okay. So I, I do think it's important. Again, I know it's not binding. I think 
it is common and I think it is worth worthwhile to have a resolution. So. Is that your motion? Yeah, that's the only question right now is motion or uh, council resolution or not. So I would I would move that yes, we have a council. I'll second resolution. that. Yeah. Did you want to speak to it? I just did. Yeah, I'll, I'll just reiterate that uh, you know there's been these claims that um, uh, there's no value whatsoever in in something that would be a uh, a commitment by the council, whether as a uh, a resolution or otherwise. Uh, but we have proof uh, different uh, with our our TOT tax that was enacted eight years ago and uh, it was not legally binding and, and councils, a series of successive councils have all uh, retained that even through an emergency. Um, so I, I think um, it's correct that it's not legally binding and it's not cast in stone, but it is a strong political commitment that has relevance. So I don't know who went First, but uh, 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 Vice Mayor Coop. Um, I just have a question. So the TOT dollars um, use was um, through a resolution also? I don't even know if it was a resolution or just a commitment made by the council at the time, even less uh, strong than a resolution. Right. I don't recall either. So it was just a commitment, then the resolution would be a little bit more intentional. Yes. It's a bit more formal way to state your intention. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And Mayor, I do know on the second TOT, we did um, have the council make a motion as part of the budget, but we did not do a resolution. Mm -hmm. And council member Phil said. Yeah, I think a resolution makes sense. I mean, we're going to go to the we're going to go to the voters of Palo Alto, and we're going to ask them to approve us going to medium and large businesses and asking for X dollars a year. And I think, you know, not only what's it for, but you know, why X instead of two X or a half X or something like that is is a totally legitimate question. I think we got a responsibility to give people an explanation. Council Member Cormack, I'm certainly willing to do it. I don't think we should do it tonight. Um, I think the polls have sufficient information and descriptions of the kinds of services. Um, my guess is staff would want to do some actual math as opposed to the simple math that we've been doing tonight. Um, so I'm supportive of us doing it. I don't think it's going to make a big difference in the poll and I'm not prepared to make, you know, a priority order of decision or evaluate, you know, um, you know, how many things are going to be on the list tonight. I, I think, I think that's a dedicated topic worthy of, uh, of some time and, and actually having the public be able to, to weigh in because there'll be some choices there. So well, I, 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 I'm interested sorry. in doing it. I just don't think tonight's the night to do it. And, and it brings up the point that there are two ways that we can approach this is a commitment tentatively to do a resolution and then a separate question of whether we would attempt to describe those uses uh, um, that would be under the resolution. So you can do the first without doing the second. And um, so Mr. Metz could ask the voters, uh, you know, uh, whether they would be more supportive if the council were to do this combined with a resolution. Uh, and we don't necessarily have to have made that decision on our tentative uses of the of, uh, of the revenues. Yeah, I, I don't know that the polling part is, I, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm gonna want the poll to spend time on that. I can imagine, you know, more information is better. Um, I think it's less about the poll and more about what we decide. Okay, um, so we have this uh, tentative motion. Let's go ahead and take our vote on that. Mayor Burt? Yes. Council Member Cormack? Yes. Council Member Du Bois? Yes. 
Council Member Filsaf? Yes. Vice Mayor Ku? Yes. Council Member Stone? Yes. Council Member Tanaka? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, let's next take on uh, the issue of whether we want to have phased implementation. So the Finance Committee had one form of that, um, but it's it's uh, open to us on what we want to include in this upcoming poll and what we want to be tentatively inclined to do. Uh, Council Member uh, Du Bois. So, so I really have some questions for staff on this one because I think the phasing depends on when it could go into effect. And so the election's November 22. Could we say that the tax goes into effect January 1st, 2023, but not collect it for 10 months? Um, you know, that would give staff time to prepare or do we need to wait until we're all ready and then the tax will be having a starting date? So I think in theory, we can do that, but the staff, we're not prepared today to explain to you the pros and cons of that. And we, we need to do some more research with, with our uh, expert consultants. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I understand staff's going to need time to be able to implement the tax. So kind of my decision around phasing really depends on how long that is. I, I given more time and thinking about simplicity, I think I would support a two-step rather than a three-step, which the finance committee talked about. So if we were, um, I guess we're testing these two rates, but if we were phasing up to those rates, there'd be some initial rate and then the second rate. I guess it's a little uh, complicated to talk about this because we don't know if we're at 10 cents or 12 cents. Um, I, I, I think that whether it's 10 or 12, we're Basically, if we did it in two increments, it would be whether you go five and 10 cents or six and 12, I, I think we could talk. Well, yeah, I guess terms. that degree of distance, is it, you know, six and 12 or eight and 12, you know, does it, does it matter? But uh, so again, um, I guess we'll have more information from staff, but for right now, I would say a two-step and, um, you know, I don't know if we need to set those numbers tonight. I think after the polling, after we get information from staff, we could set the final. Council Member Cormack. Um, I guess, you know, for me, part of whether or not we do a phase and the argument's been made that, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to pay a new tax. It might be good to have some time to prepare to pay for it. Um, does staff, we, we received an email from a business organization indicating that um, there's a business in Palo Alto that could pay something like $3 million. What, what does staff believe is like the maximum amount any current business in Palo Alto might pay if we go with the 10 cents? I hesitate to watch our Finance director. No, I know. Yeah, simple math on calculator. At the but it, it's important because it, you know, we we need to know what that what what the what the upper ranges are of what people might pay before we can make a decision about whether or not we want to modify the impact. And sure. and while you're thinking, I'll just say the counter argument is we need all these services that we're talking about. Um, there's desire for them. Um, so from a from a uses standpoint, I'm not particularly interested in a phase in. But if it's a really big hit at 10 cents for some of our largest organizations, maybe it would be appropriate for us to phase it in. And so that's, that's part of what I'm trying to understand. So recognizing that the information we have is uh, preliminary and subject to change, I think our, our best estimate at this point would be on the order of $1.5 million. Okay. Um, and then also relevant to this, and I realize it's a separate topic, but I thought we were doing, there was, there was not going to be an exemption for the first 5,000 square feet, that there was going to be some like small fee that everyone was going to pay. Well, we're, we're going to have that whole discussion on exemption and offsets. That's one of the big remaining things we have to discuss. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, so 1.5 million. Um, 
could I, could I just make a comment? I, mean, I think yeah, it's not, it's, I don't see it as really the largest. It, it's all companies at all sizes. It's really even a small company in a small space may, may need time to face it. I agree. I'm yeah. just trying to understand like, you know, what's that top number? What, what does that look like? Um, and have any other communities done a phase in? For business tax. Sure. I would have to look that up. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. And the hotel tax, I guess we didn't do a phase in. We did a two-step in some respects, right? We did two separate. There were two provisions. separate measures yeah. um, as part of the hotel tax. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm really torn on this one. If we were going to pull on something, I think this would be something to pull on, right? Are people more willing to support it if it's phased in? I'd much prefer to, to pull on that than on 10 versus 12. Um, but I agree with council member Du Bois that, that two years makes more sense. Again, for me here, I'm really more about the uses and the uses are immediate and we're unlikely to be able to collect until 2024 already. So um, I'm, I'm not inclined to do a phase in, but you know, I'm certainly willing to hear more and again, think this would be something we could pull on. I'll go ahead and wait in on a couple of those things. Um, the, I think that what really matters is over the life of the tax and not the first two years, if we only get half the revenue that way. As a former business owner, I can tell you if there was a cost adjustment, it was really nice to have it spread over a couple of years rather than um, hit us in a single year. As far as the largest company issues, I, I, I really think that, um, you know, a, a lot of cities have put these maximums on a given company. And I think that's a regressive tax where the biggest company is not only the biggest, they're typically the most able uh, to, um, to pay their share of the tax. It's the smaller companies I'm more concerned about. Um, and you know, if we're we're looking at uh, the issues of grade separations and affordable housing as the biggest uh, focus of the measure um, on the grade separation, it's it's really what we're going to bond to, and so those first couple years don't matter much on affordable housing. Uh, it'll be a question of us kind of picking up speed and building into. Um, our reserve to be able to leverage that to, for additional projects. So um, I, I think that from the standpoint of trying to um, uh, have the least uh, negative impact on businesses that might be uh, most sensitive to this, um, that's why I uh, would support the phasing. And um, uh, and I don't think it's going to have a material impact over the life of the tax. So, Council Member Stone. My name is Mary. I'm, I'm torn on this issue. I think really good arguments being made on, on both sides, but I, I do think, and the mayor's point there about being able to leverage these funds in order to be able to address a lot of our most pressing needs is is really going to be beneficial because for those first couple of years, I mean, at least if we know this money is then coming that really opens up a, a lot of the doors. It's not, it's no longer a question mark. It's we, we know what we can expect and we'll have a reasonable expectation and uh, estimation uh, of those funds. So I think that's helpful. And, and I do agree. I would imagine if I was a business owner, being able to have that, that build up would be helpful. I want to make sure that the, whatever the end uh, phase is, isn't too, I mean, I don't, I don't want us to start too, too low on that. And I think we need to have a, a further discussion on that. Um, moving forward, but I do think the, the phased in approach makes sense at this time. So I Mayor, can, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, might I interrupt, I'm sorry. Um, just two points of clarification for the council as I have folks IMing <laughs> us from the back as they're researching these. So uh, one, from an administrative standpoint, it will take staff, as we've talked about, an, a decent amount of time to implement this. So we're looking at a 12 to 18 month um, horizon. Uh, that's the same horizon that other cities have done that have a business tax in place. So I will say, since we're starting from ground zero, there's both pros and additional hurdles that that will come with. So it, that 
12 to 18 months may even be aggressive. The other piece is, um, at least from what we can tell, Mountain View in their most recent um, business tax redo um, did do a three-year phase in. Well, I'll, I'll move that um, we will do uh, a two-phase implementation with um, the uh, first half of the fee uh, in the uh, most uh, nearest time frame that we can achieve and the second half two years following that. Second. Okay. And I don't need to speak any more to it. Council Member Stone. I already spoke. Okay. Would anybody else want to speak? Uh, Council Member Tanaka. I think staff is giving us some good good uh, advice here, right? Mountain is doing three years. The city doesn't have it already. Uh, staff needs time. It seems like, a, to me, it seems like we should be following staff's recommendation versus doing something that's gonna be a lot, much harder. Uh, I think as Council Member Stone mentioned, business owners will need time to adjust and to, to enable uh, them to adjust to this. So um, I think staff's recognition is a better, better recommendation today. Okay. I would just clarify that staff did not make a recommendation. That's a misrepresentation of what staff just said. Uh, what they did was simply state what Mount View had done. Okay, um, well, I see council member Phil Seth need to leave the room for a moment. Uh, council member Du Bois. So again, this, this other question about um, the date the tax is effective versus when staff starts to collect it, you, staff will come back with that. So even if we're saying it's 12 months or 18 months, it could be effective, you know, in 12 months and then collected in 18 or, but, but that's just an open question. I think we, we just need to do a little more work on that. And this uh, issue, you'll get a chance to refine this um, before you finalize it, once you have our, our full input on that implementation issue. Yep. One clarification on the motion, Mr. Mayor, is that second phase is the second year or is it two years from when the first phase? Two years from when the first phase. And this is basically what we're, framing going forward. It's not a decision again, but yeah. Yes. Two years from the implementation date of the first phase. Okay. Wait, so is it in year two of the tax or year three? Well, it depends. It's 12 to 18 months. So if we if we said it was 12 months to get the first phase implemented. Well, don't don't even worry about the implementation time. It's really the the uh, the start date or whatever, right? They could implement it. Well, they're going to come back with. So it, this is the difference between the effective date and the collection date. Is that what you're referring to? It's, yes. Did you want the first phase, the first tier to be in place for one year or for two years? The first tier would be in place for two years. Okay. The first rate, not the first tier. First phase. Right. That, so yes. so again, I just want to be 100% clear. So you're saying it's either five cents or six cents for two years, and then it would be 10 cents. So I, I was actually questioning the 50%. Um, but I, again, I, I would support phasing it in where it was 50% year one, 100% year two. I think, again, it's kind of a simplicity issue. Um, well, I think that the two-year delay is more complicated. Well, but I'm saying if it's asymmetrical on the amounts, that's more complex than just 50-50. I'm, I'm not understanding what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> In any event, um, shall we go ahead and vote on this? Council Member Cormack? Um, well, I'll offer a friendly amendment, um, which is essentially what Council Member Du Bois said, which is... Um, ha the half of the rate to be assessed in year one and the full rate to be assessed in year two. Year two, mm -hmm. so a, a one year delay. Yes. I see. I, I'll accept that 
as uh, an amendment. Me too, I prefer that. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and vote. Perhaps we could just wait till the clerk oh, it updates it. So everyone's clear on what we're voting on. It's not really, so what we haven't specified is the beginning date. So it could be more than a two year visit, right? It'd be one one year after, it's, it's really not year, say year one in relation to what? It's uh, the first year that why don't we it, just say the initiation of the tax and we need to determine the effective date right. versus the collection date at a later point. And and the full rate one year after the initiation of the tax. That's fine. Okay. That seemed clear enough. And uh, yeah. All Thank right, you. let's go ahead and vote then. Yes. Councilmember Filsa. He said yes. Sorry, Councilmember Du Bois. Yes. Mayor Burt. Yes. Councilmember Tanaka. No. Councilmember Stone. Yes. Vice Mayor Koo. Yes. Councilmember Cormack. Yes. Motion carries six to one. Okay, uh, making progress here. Um, so let's go into um, a, a little more complicated issue on exemptions and offsets. And I'll just say that there are certain um, possible ways we could approach this. Um, we had talked about the first 5,000 square feet being exempted. Uh, and we had talked about grocery stores being exempted. Uh, the reason I uh, am framing it as potentially another group that would be offsets um, is because uh, we had talked about hotels potentially. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that we uh, uh, exempt hotels so that, well, at first let me say the reason why is because they, are a category, and there's one other category of, of, um, of folks who pay significant, um, okay, in a moment, um, significant uh, local taxes that um, uh, are not incurred by other businesses, uh, it, such as uh, those that have, um, sales tax where the point of sale is discretionary or designated by the company. Um, but I wouldn't want to completely exempt, um, say a hotel that uh, where they're, what they're paying in TOT might be less than what they would pay in the business tax. So they could offset basically the, whatever they pay in the TOT or the company that has uh, a discretionary point of sale could fully offset uh, what they pay in that against the business tax, um, uh, but they wouldn't get uh, an exemption that exceeds what they otherwise would pay. Does that make, is that clear enough? So that's, that's the difference between one group that may be exempted uh, fully and others that uh, would apply for an annual offset. Uh, up to the amount that they're paying in the other tax. We're receiving the other tax. Um, so I'll just put that out on the table. Um, and uh, and I'll, well, I'll just say that then my, my recommendation that maybe I'll put as a, a for consideration then is to uh, go forward with exemptions up to 5,000 square feet with the exception of that flat $50 fee um, to exempt hotels who are paying the TOT, or excuse me, I, I misspoke there, uh, exempt groceries. And then for offsets um, to allow offsets for hotels and for companies who are 
uh, using Palo Alto as a discretionary point of sale, um, in which some businesses do. So who would like to weigh in on that? Mr. Mayor, yes. um, just one point about the um, the $50 fee for the uh, first 5,000 square feet. Council did talk about it that way, but we ran into a, um, a sort of unusual legal problem with structuring it that way. So the way that we propose to do that is to not charge the tax for the first 5,000. And that can be, that would apply to all businesses that can be also described as an exemption for it's, it's sort of a duplicative way of describing it for businesses below 5,000 square feet. And then our business registry program already includes a fee of $50. It's actually $50 plus four. And our thought is that the council wants to keep that program anyway, because it gathers a series of information. So that essentially accomplishes the same Got it. purpose. Same outcome, but a, a, a different way of framing it. Okay. Uh, we may need your language when we go to put this in a motion. Council member Du Bois. Um, so I'll, I'll second the motion. You made the motion, right? I didn't make it as a motion, but I can. Um, so see, Clerk Minor seems like she was listening in very carefully. Yeah. So, uh, well, and Milton, so, excuse me. So I think in what I heard you say right. was um, we would allow offsets for hotels and offsets for discretionary point of sales. It's, So, um, so I'm supportive of this. Um, we've talked a lot about it. I think, again, the simplicity of exempting the first 5,000, it exempts the smallest 400 businesses in town. I, I think that's very positive. Um, again, on A, I think we want to get rid of the, with a flat $50. That, uh, Leslie, that's going to go elsewhere. We are working on clarifying that language to remove the $50 and add the business registry program language. Right. Um, and again, I, I know we want to keep it simple given our history with groceries and not having like very large grocery stores in Palo Alto. I, I think it is an important exemption. Um, again, these offsets, I think it's important that people understand that these are taxes that come directly to the city. Um, and so by framing it as an offset, we're saying, you know, if a business has a discretionary tax or, or TOT, they could count that against their square footage. Um, as we were talking about this, uh, well, I'll just stop there. I think this is reasonable. I think I think we can communicate why why we're doing this, and uh, I'll stop there. And I actually didn't speak to the motion, so I'll do that now. First hundred D. Maybe we should clarify that allow offsets for. Uh, we need language that says that the it's for discretionary where they're designating Palo Alto as the point of sale. That's what we're really meaning. We don't want to give them the break if. It's discretionary and they designate it elsewhere. Um, and, um, and I'll just add on, you know, when we, in the polling, we didn't see an advantage um, in voter support for exempting for hotels who pay this highest in the rate TOT tax, but I think it's a fairness issue. Um, they are paying a very high proportion of, um, uh, our revenue and against their sales amount that uh, technically the customer pays for it, but it's still indirectly through them. Um, and um, and uh, so I, I think that that's, regardless of whether it improves the polling, it's the right thing to do. So council member Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I support this. I think these are common sense. Uh, exemptions. I, I like the, I like the offset for, for the discretionary sales tax. I think that not only provides um, an incentive for businesses in Palo Alto that are currently doing this practice to, to stay, but also hopefully an incentive 
to to increase that um, as well. So I, I like that. I think that's I think that's fair. Um, I think we're striking that balance of asking businesses to pay their fair share while also not trying to gouge them, and um, in a way that's going to be able to provide greater services that will benefit everyone. Um, I do have one question for staff because this came up in in public comment last week, and I just want to make sure that we're not missing something important here. Are, are housing providers like apartment complexes? I mean, is, is that already exempted from, from business taxes? Like how, how would a, an apartment complex business, how, how does that work? So this is a policy question for council. The way that we have conceptualized what you've told us so far is that the portion of a landlord's business that's occupied for the purpose of running that business, such as a leasing office, um, administrative offices that a, a large landlord might have, that would be subject to the business tax. The leased or rented space where people are living is not occupied by that business for the purpose of running the business. And so that would not qualify. The city manager might have some additional thoughts. And this is a policy question, it's up to you. Yes, and I, I think just from, in in terms of the staff discussion of this issue, we would also note that this may have situations in which it could be perhaps less black and white, uh, such as uh, assisted living facilities uh, that may have some components of both care or business associated with the residential use. I, I just had, I'd be surprised though if that space exceeded 5,000 square feet. And in addition, many of those kinds of providers are nonprofits and those are exempt under the law in any case, but there are some that are not nonprofits. Well, okay, so I think that's far more complicated than, <laughs> than I was hoping. So, <laughs> and, uh, that's members. every issue, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I, and um, council member Stone, just to clarify, these are, you know, in general, depending on the size of the property, they can be rather sizable, both potentially assisted living facilities, as well as obviously apartment complexes. So it just really depends. Some can be small, some could be large, but again, a policy call. Sorry. So the way, I mean, you kind of described it there as saying there was almost, so there has been no policy direction on this issue that would need to be included here um, and, and try to understand that a little, a little more. So a, just go with a, I mean, totally with you on the assisted living um, issues or just on a regular apartment complex w would common areas of that apartment complex, pool, laundry room, all that, that's in, that would be included in the more administrative square footage, or that would be more the residential. Not typically. Those are typically, belong to residents for the okay. residents use and are not for the use of the landlord in running the business part of what they do. And has there been any analysis on, I mean, I know we, okay. I see Ms. Nose shaking her head. Uh, we, I, I can say that our estimates thus far that we've provided council have been based on um, non-residential um, square feet at this point, as designated by CoStar. Well, I think it makes sense to, I mean, no final decisions being made tonight to include, to include this as an exemption in the, in the motion for us to be able for give staff time to be able to further explore this, um, and for us to make the final decision in June. We might, we might decide that if council is comfortable with a tentative approach we're describing that we would not list that as an exemption, but rather it would be in the definition of what is square footage occupied for a business purpose, if you would allow us to handle it that way. And you'll see the ordinance, of course. Yep, that, that works. So I don't know if you have language to propose as a, as a friendly amendment that would address that, city attorney. I think we'd prefer to keep it as just general direction at this point. Oh, okay. So it doesn't need to be in the motion tonight. Correct. Okay, great, thank you. Um, those are my thoughts. Okay, Council Member Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Burt. Um, did the maker and seconder wish to include the exemption for seasonal businesses operating less than 90 days in this as yes, well? I do. Uh, yes. 
uh, and again, this was something that staff I think found as they were yeah. looking at tax. Since we're doing all the exemptions, would you would you like to include that here? Uh, yeah, that sounds fine. Okay. Um, so the E is an exemption if we're trying to distinguish between offsets and exemptions. Yeah. Okay, certainly fine with A. 5,000 square feet is good. Groceries, I, you know, I, I think there's a big difference between the grocery stores in, um, you know, um, in the PCs and the others, um, but I don't think I'm going to win that argument. Um, so this offsets, this is a new new concept tonight. Um, is this a credit? Is this a direct one for one? I'm a hotel. I paid you 500k. I don't, so I don't owe you any. If it's 600k, what 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 are we talking about here? Again, these are policy questions, so it can be a one for one credit. Um, it can only kick in after a minimum is paid. It could be a two for one credit. It's up okay. to council to define how you want to do that. And what, what are the maker and seconder imagining here in C and D? Is it a one for one credit? I was envisioning it as a one for one credit. So uh, if we need to add the word full offset, does that clarify it? Well, it's okay for language. TOT. I think, I think we may want to have some minimum tax for some other reasons, for legal reasons. So I don't know if we want to just leave this open to, um, again, staff Refine to come up to fine tune this. Okay. So perhaps D would be amended to say, um, direct staff to, I don't know, research and model. I'm not sure if we'll be okay. able to model, if I'm yeah, being sorry. honest. <laughs> okay. But do we want to separate C and D? Or do, or, or I was kind of picturing all the exemptions grouped together and then the offsets. Like we would have conditions around offsets and they would apply to these two categories. But again, it's, a, it's something that staff can figure yeah, out. I, yeah, I don't know that we have to sort that out tonight. Yeah. Okay, so the maker and second are imagining that it's a it's a one to one credit. Does staff does staff have any thoughts yet? Round numbers about how this reduces if we're at the ten cent number and that's twenty one million. How much C and D reduce the twenty one million that would be collected? Well, let me just say on D, uh, if we're looking at um, these companies having discretionary location on where they would designate the point of sale, I would think that it wouldn't have any loss for city revenue. It would only affect how many dollars are collected through the business tax. But uh, Right, right. But it would reduce the 21. So correct. I yeah. just want to clarify yes, yes, that absolutely. distinction. Understand. I'm looking, I'm just asking what do C and D do to the $21 million number if if it's at 10 cents? I just need an order of magnitude. I have no idea if this is a 50% reduction in revenue or or a five percent. Or if we even have that information. We don't. Okay. So I'm I'm interested in having staff look at this. I'm I'm not willing to vote for this tonight because I don't have a good enough understanding of the impact. Um, but I I'm you know if you want to if C is also direct staff to you know evaluate the impact, estimate the impact of offsets for hotels, then I'm on board. Um, but that's up to you. So yeah, I think if we don't need to incorporate it as a polling variable, which I suspect we wouldn't. And maybe if Mr. Metz is still there, we we, we probably wouldn't have the bandwidth in the poll to dig down there, huh? I mean, we already yeah. polled for exempting hotels. Yeah. Why don't we continue to do that? But um, it, didn't, it, it didn't actually help. I think it didn't it reduce the likelihood that someone would support it? 
That's correct. I think one of the other things we could do is, again, test messages that are based on the policy decision to include some exemptions. If that would yield arguments in favor of a measure or arguments against them, we can test the impact of those messages. Yeah, I mean, I guess if I'm thinking about what what the maker and seconder is suggesting here, C and D are, you know, um, uh, reduce the taxes impact on on businesses that are already contributing significant amounts, right? General concept. So that seems like something that's pollable without any more information. So I'll just restate my my um, my stance, which is. I'm interested in understanding what the dollars are for C and D, and I understand the the policy reasons we'd want to do it, and I don't think it's going to be a big impact on the poll. I'm fine with E, and I'm fine with F. Thank you. And Councilmember Cormack, to better answer your question, I think, um, as folks have pointed out to me, we did model TOT as a full exemption, so meaning the current estimates that staff has provided the council assumes that hotels remitting TOT receipts are exempted from the business tax. Oh, right. So actually so this, C, so would, C be, would be an ad. C would potentially be an ah, ad from the okay. current estimates. Okay. And D would be a potential takeaway from the current estimates. Okay. So, um, so I don't have orders of magnitude or anything from that perspective. I just fine. know in general from current modeling, those are the two trajectories it could go. Okay. <laughs> C would be an ad and D would be um, a subtraction. Okay. Thank you. And, and does staff... Imagine being able, would you, this come back in June or would it come back before then? Come back with the polling information just from a timing standpoint? So I, I don't know that the cities has the, will have the information to know until applications are made for the exemption. I think some information may find I, its way to city okay. staff, but so, sorry. So we're imagining that people would apply for this. We wouldn't just grant it to them. That's correct. It would be through the application process. And it may change from year to year. And this, the keyword is discretionary. Yeah. And this area of tax policy is in flux in the state of California. So it could, there could be a variety of reasons why there could be changes over time. And it's possible when staff comes back, you'll say, we don't know. But I, I think since this is a new topic tonight without benefit of any you know, staff report or or public comment. I, I think it's appropriate for us to have have another round of discussion at some point. Thank you. Council member Phil said. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to I was going to ask for uh, about the seasonal business exemption, which thank you to Council member Cormack for adding already. Um, as for C and D, you know, it seems to me that for the purposes of polling, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it probably doesn't need to be any finer. I mean, whether it's a partial exemption for hotels or a full exemption, I, we're probably not going to not get any different material information on the polling about that. We'll have to decide about it when we actually go to do the ballot measure itself. But for polling purposes, my guess is C and D are close enough. Council Member Tanaka. Uh, some questions for staff on F. So I, BRC is the, what does BRC stand for? It's the Business Registry Certificate Program. It's okay. part okay. of Certificate. Council's current. I didn't know what the C was. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people are working from home these days. So let's say, you know, there's a business where a bunch of employees live in Palo Alto and together, you know, their home office would add up to more than 5,000 square feet. Are they exempt still, or how, how does this work? Do they have to? I assume that they don't have to. There's no, there's no business registry needed if they're not if they're all working from home. I assume, right? But I, I don't know. I'm just trying to understand this. What is this saying here? And maybe it needs to be clarified because I, I think it's. I'm, I'm assuming that all businesses that have a physical office. This is what F is saying, correct? Is that, what, is that what you're just trying to say? Or are you just trying to say all businesses, whether like if employees are working from home? So I, I, my understanding is that um, home-based businesses are excluded from the business registry. Is it? Is that correct? We can do a quick check. Let okay. me do a quick check. Okay. 
but, but it, it would also be very, very likely that a home-based business would be less than 5,000 square feet. Oh yeah, except if they have employees, right? Then they might have- Hopefully they're not a home-based business. <clears throat> no, I mean, they work, let's say they're, um, they're uh, <clears throat> let's say some works at Salesforce, right? So Salesforce is in San Francisco, but uh, actually I happen to know a lot of people that live here in Palo Alto together, you know, they probably would be way past 5,000 if you think about their office space that they use individually. So, so Count, Council Member Tanaka, the city of Palo Alto cannot tax Salesforce's active business activities in San Francisco. No, no, but, but if employees live here, if they live here, the employees live here working from home. Right. That doesn't count, I assume, right? So I would imagine that, that those folks are working from a home office that is under 5,000 square feet. Okay, and, and so it's not cumulative. I mean, that's what I'm assuming, but I just want to make sure. I'm not sure we understand the question as to cumulative. What, so what would an employee say, have? He's asking if office. it somehow sucks in all of Salesforce, sales, the Salesforce tower. No, no, no it does no, not. not the tower. The employees working with St. Paul Alto from their home office. Oh, no. Oh, if Salesforce no, okay. has- The employees, employees working from home for Salesforce are not a business amongst themselves. Okay, okay. So only if, only if the company has a physical office in Palo Alto, it doesn't matter, right? That's correct. Okay, good. Thank you. And Council Member Tanaka, yes, home-based businesses are exempt from BRC. Okay. Could, could I ask a quick question? Yeah. On the, I thought it was businesses with one or fewer employees. I mean, to Council Member Tanaka's point, if there are 10 people working out of a home, that's not taxable. That's not a business that has to be registered. Um, if it would have to also be over 5,000 square feet, wouldn't it? Not tax, but the, the business registry. I thought the exclusion was like one employee or less or something like that. That's uh, sole proprietary businesses are exempt. Um, single employee. Uh, I can get the code if we want the full details, but there are a few exemptions such as the ones that we just listed. I will say if there is a home-based business that's employing 10 people, I think we have other issues with code oh, and land are. use at that point in time. This is, oh, it, it has happened, we believe. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a vote on this tentative approval. Councilmember Stone? Yes. Councilmember Dubois? Yes. Councilmember Filsa? Yes. Mayor Burt? Yes. Councilmember Tanaka? Yes. Councilmember Cormack? Yes. Vice Mayor Koo? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Great. Okay. We're getting good progress here. I think if my list is correct, we have uses to consider and then revisiting whether we're um, tentatively supporting one or two ballot measures based upon the other elements that we've already discussed. Um, so on uses, uh, maybe if staff can give us some kind of guidance or framework on uh, how specific uh, we can or should be in that, uh, given that it's also um, a non-binding set of guidelines. Right, so there are both legal and policy and, and um, say political aspects to that question. I think legally you, you do want to keep it relatively general just to avoid any confusion about um, really a direct commitment on a specific policy or program. And I think your, your political advisors may have some thoughts for you as well. And does Mr. Metz have any comments on that if he's still with us? I'm here. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, comment on which? Um, on we're now considering uh, how much guidance we should provide on our intended uses. You know, we've had this discussion around grade separations and affordable housing, and then possibly things like public safety. Um, uh, but understanding that, you know, we we'd only have an advisory um, measure. 
a resolution, I should say. And again, I think the way we propose to test that would be as an argument in favor of the measure to say that the council has committed through a resolution that it intends to spend the money in the following ways to see what impact that has on voter support. Okay, so that would be really for purposes of the polling and then we'd, we'd still have to uh, determine how specific we'd be when it returned. Okay, so just so everybody understands it's not locking us into uses, uh, but it would be the guidance on how we'd pull. And, and I, I guess I wanna say that this goes back to an issue that's come up time and again, and including from uh, some of the critics, which is an assertion that um, the polling is determining our ballot measure. And I've believed throughout, and I'd like to hear from my colleagues too, that, but it seems that the polling informs our decisions, and then we make our own decisions, just like on uh, things like the TOT exemption for hotels. Uh, the polling indicated it wouldn't improve support for the ballot measure to do that, but um, and so it informed us, but we didn't, or we're not tentatively going in that direction because we think it's not the right thing to do. Um, so I just wanted to, try to frame it that way. Um, but uh, it goes back to the question then, uh, do we want to have within the polling, polling certain categories of uses that are our primary intentions? Maybe that's the way I'd try to frame it. Council Member Du Bois. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we should pull for it. Um, I think we need the information. Um, we polled, you know, on on um, what voters value, and as you say, it doesn't. It informs us. Uh, it's good input, but um, so I'll try to make a motion, just given the hour, um, that we would poll for a um, intended council resolution that the funds would be used for. Uh, grade separations and, and rail safety, uh, affordable housing and homeless programs. Um, I believe we should include public safety. And then the fourth one I'm, I'm interested in polling for that I don't think we pulled for yet. It would be improvements to our university and Calav business districts. And I would suggest we try to keep the list to four or five items. <laughs> I'll second that, although I'm gonna have a question for Mr. Metz. Did you wanna to speak to your motion for that? Uh, I, I didn't know if Leslie caught it all, um, if we could see it on screen. So again, I think it's important to capture uh, undergrade separations uh, in rail safety. Um, affordable housing and homeless would be together. Public, yeah. I, so um, I think I've spoken to these probably multiple times at this point. Um, I think these are all important. I think they have nexus with both the business community and, and residents. And, um, and again, we have some large unfunded um, activities in these areas. And my question for Mr. Metz is that, especially on that final one on University and Cal Ave, um, if I understood Council Member Du Bois, it was, he was thinking about looking at whether that did or didn't pull well, but I, I thought we would only have the option of putting these in as a set. Uh, are we able to pull on them individually as, as um, uh, uses or would we have to present them as a set? Well, in, in both the previous polls, we tested a wide range of different potential uses of the money. If there are one or two specific ones like these business districts that we haven't tested before, we could probably have a question that examined them. Um, I would just caution against 
testing another long list that has heavy overlap with, with things no, we've, that appeared in prior polls. So, but, but, so we've got four here. Uh, I was assuming that you were going to put a general question in of, uh, do you support a business tax for these uses? Uh, but if we're, if the fourth one we're trying to, if we're, if we're, if we're pretty firm on the first three, and we want to find out the voter support for the third uh, for the fourth one. Would the poll be able to be structured in a way that would let us do that, or how would how would you go about that? Yes, we can we can accommodate testing that fourth item in isolation and finding out how voters react. To it. And, okay, and you kind of asked it. I kind of recast it. You asked um, improving the safety, health, and cleanliness of downtown and commercial cores previously. Oh, this is kind of a rewording of that, if that, if that helps. But, but. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you would consider the, the question you just mentioned that we previously asked to be a plain English articulation of what these two business districts represent, then I would argue you should work from the existing data that using the technical names of the business districts will not add significant meaning for voters beyond the explanation that you just described, if that's an adequate summary of what they do. Well, in addition to safety, health, and cleanliness, I think we're talking about redesigning the environment. And we are also talking about um, economic development consultants. Well, and and really, I, I think at a high level, aren't we talking about how we uh, kind of uh, have the uh, the transition these districts to changes in the economy and revitalize them in response. That's what we're trying to get at. It's yeah. not just cleanliness that that in the post in the post COVID retail environment. How do we reinvigorate these downtowns? Is what we're really trying to do. Yeah. So I think it is a different question than was asked before. Right. Yeah. And I just want to make sure Mr. Metz understood what we're trying to get at, however, whether we've yeah. captured the exact wording or not. Um, yeah, I, I understand. I, my suspicion based on prior data, both here and elsewhere, is that that would be a relatively, I'd be surprised if it stood out as a high priority for voters um, relative to the other things you have listed here. Um, but it is something that we could test if, if you would like to get a data point to be sure. Okay, uh, we can test it then. And, and I'm glad that um, under the grade separations that council member Du Bois added the rail safety, because I think throughout our grade separation process, uh, we've allowed a really important thing to be relegated to and, and also, and that is the track safety. And we, we all know that we've gone through trauma in our community uh, over um, the need for security and safety on our tracks. And that's what we're really wanting to understand is um, how important that is to the community. I'll say that even with measure B on the countywide measure, um, adding sa uh, uh, safety to the cow train issue significantly elevated the support of the voters. Uh, and in our community, I would think it would do so even more. Okay, uh, Council Member Cormack. I'm confused. Are we making this decision tonight because we want Mr. Metz to pull on it, or are we? I, I, I don't. I don't really want to make this decision tonight, and I don't think that this poll. This is going to change a lot for the poll. Could Mr. Metz? Could we instead poll on? Would you be more likely to vote for this if the council passed a resolution stating what the funds would be used for? Um, yes, we could ask that question. I think it will be, if those potential uses are not stated, I think the results of that question will come back fairly lukewarm because I think for most voters, they'll say it depends. If they direct the money towards something I think is a priority, yeah. I'd be more likely to vote for it. And if they directed to something that I think is relatively unimportant, I'd be less likely to do so. Okay. Well, I mean, 
I, I don't think we're going to get a lot different information than we have already. Um, so if, if this is what we're going to do, I, I think we need to wordsmith it right now. <laughs> you know, I will say for the hundredth time, people outside of this group don't understand what grade separation is. They don't recognize that that's about the train crossing. So I would say safe train crossings, public safety, again, unless you're on council, you're not hundred percent sure that that's fire and police. Right. Um, and improve, I don't, I don't think most people, and I, I think Mr. Metz alluded to this already, are going to find. Let's, so. so your point is well taken as to the nuance of wording. The question is, does Mr. Metz need us to refine that or does he understand the essence of that and will work with staff? Um, but what as, I don't understand is, are we passing this resolution tonight or are we asking? We're at, Okay. We're asking him to pull on it. And okay, but what happens if, if it comes back and they say, yeah, we're not that excited about that? Then we're going to use poll information to do a different resolution? We would have to make a policy decision on, one, whether we would even have a resolution, and if so, what we would state we would intend to use the funds for. But, but several of these items have polled the highest already, right? And now what? we're putting them together into a bundled package. And, and, but I guess I'm trying to get at why. So that we can pull for a complete offering. And I mean, we're trying to get so to the final I, ballot I feel language. like this is absolutely cart before the horse. The seven of us have not agreed on, you know, on the priority for what these funds would be spent on. This is the first night we've even had sort of a general conversation about it. Yeah, well, again, what, but okay. But I think the goal tonight was to, to be able to pull with a near complete ballot language, we've, we've agreed we wanted to have some council resolution. And so how do we communicate in this poll? I mean, the, the order be? of those would vary. Um, you know, each of us is going to want to have something else. I mean, do we really want to fight this through right now? Well, I'm not sure each of us will. Um, and that would be part of a vote that we would be taking now on tentative directions. Um, but we won't have an opportunity to pull on uses after direction. It's the, our last opportunity to give guidance on polling on uses. It's not binding on our outcomes, yeah. but it is our last opportunity to put in the use in the poll. And, and I would say that a lot of the criticism that we've been hearing is that we haven't been clearer to date on the uses. Uh, I think we're, with the exception of that last one, uh, these have been what we've been identifying as our highest priorities. Uh, if we wanted a broader set of priorities, we'd need a bigger tax. Um, and so we've, we've kind of, uh, through yeah. uh, the positions we've taken on the amount or the, the funding, the, the rate, um, we've limited uh to a degree uh what we could include and then it's a question of what we tentatively want to have polled as the highest priorities yeah and i mean are we going to go through the order of these we're going to leave that to mr metz i mean could we say transportation projects and services right i i just don't i'm well, I, I, I don't, I know, I'm sorry, I'm just struggling with yeah, why, so, why we're doing this right now. Uh, I, in terms of my answer on transportation would be that we've seen in the previous polling that it no longer in this present period, it doesn't score uh, with the voters uh, like it did uh, two or three years ago when we had uh, severe traffic congestion. I mean, if we, you know, I'm just going to, I'm too tired at this point in the evening to go through all the usual wordsmithing, but I know that staff is listening. Public safety is the largest portion of our, of our budget every year in the general fund. I would put, you know, fire and police at the front. Um, I would not call it grade separation, affordable housing and homeless programs is fine. And again, I don't, I don't know the improvements to the business districts. The reason that makes sense is again the sources and uses of the funds. Um, um, but I let me just look at my list and see if there's anything that I think we're missing that we as a council should consider committing to. Um, 
I think this leaves off any of our other infrastructure um, opportunities and anything for climate. So that's, um, you know, separate from how climate polls, I know, you know, that's something that's super important. So that's my one concern is the remaining infrastructure stuff just isn't, isn't there. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, Vice Mayor Coop. Um, I wanted to ask um, if investing in community owned assets was one of the higher um, priorities for during the poll. Um, and by, and, uh, when you say community owned assets, what, what are you referring to specifically? That's like the unfunded capital improvements, such as investing in projects like parks. So here's what this is the one. And um, this is the lower priority. Okay. Uh, animal shelter, Kabali, Lucy Stearns. Okay. The mayor showing me where it is. Yeah. And they were generally lower priorities. Okay. Thank you. That's all. And Council Member Phil Seth. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, two comments on this. Uh, on this, really. Um, one is that you know I think of public. I mean, it's been said before. I think of public safety as you know part of the larger picture of restoring pre-pandemic services. And you know, and in the case of public safety, I think you know it's there are some reasons we need to go beyond that, right? Because of you know the decline over time, even before the pandemic, of those which we need to restore. But I think, you know, sort of that in my mind is sort of part of the restoring, restoring city services, including fire and police is sort of how I think of that, right? So that's one. And then the other comment is, yeah, you know, I, I don't think this hurts. I wonder how much new information it's gonna give us. Um, so, I mean, the others we know about, it doesn't say anything about climate, but you know, it's probably a smaller part of what we're going to spend money on anyway, uh, relative to restoring services and so forth. But improvements to University and California Avenue Business District. I mean, we know what that means, okay? And what it means is if we're going to keep Cal Ave and Ramona Street closed for a long period of time, then either it's going to be tents on asphalt the way it is now forever, or else we got to invest some money in making something that's more permanent and sustainable. And that's really what that means. But I don't think anybody's going to get that <laughs> out of university, out of, out of, and I don't think there's an easy way to say that any, anywhere either. So I wonder how much, I wonder how much good we're going to get out of it. But again, I don't think it hurts. So. Um, so I'll just say I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm, I'm not hanging my hat on that one. Uh, but if we want to get, additional information, we can go ahead and include it. Um, all right, uh, let's go ahead and take a vote then. Vice Mayor Koo? Yes. Council Member Cormack? No. Council Member Stone? Yes. Mayor De uh, Council Member Du Bois? Yes. Mayor Burt? Yes. Council Member Tanaka? No. Council Member Filsa? You know, I think I'll vote no on this one. Okay, motion carries uh, four to three. Okay. All right, so I think that brings us back now, given the other tentative approvals, and maybe we can even see them all in one batch shortly. Um, do we still, pardon me? What about polling? I thought that's what we have been doing. Um, so what I was going to say was, um, how do we now feel about whether we still want to pull on uh, one or two ballot measures? Either way, I guess we, we don't have to decide whether we're polling on one or two. Mr. Metz, is that with 
kind of this framework that we have. Um, would you had in your last poll, you had kind of some questions around how do you feel about uh, the um, the retention of the current utility transfer tax? How do you feel about the business tax? How do you feel about the two combined? Do we essentially ask similar questions, but within this framing that we've already had? So we really don't need to decide tonight whether we want to poll for one or two. You're going to, you'd be polling for each of those options uh, again. Is that correct? That's correct. Our, our assumption would be that we would be testing two measures uh, in the same fashion we did last time to see whether they can be viable together. Okay. Um, I think to we've, we'd like to get the same sort of direction on the utility transfer measure so that we can work with the city attorney to prepare a 75 word ballot question for that one as well. Um, although I think we're pretty on that one, we're, we're closer in terms of the structure is fairly well defined in terms of what you would do if you move forward with that. Okay, so we don't need to add that direction then on for you to pull on one or two because you're going to pull on both one or two. Okay. Um, Can I ask a clarifying yeah, question? Sure. So I've heard people call this uh, two tax measures, but are are we calling the transfer a tax or it is? It is really a continuation or just a reaffirmation from the voters? It, it's a reaffirmation of the longstanding practice. Um, legally, the Superior Court made a finding that as to the gas transfer, that is a tax that needs to be affirmed by, by the voters. So the we don't think we'll use the word tax in the ballot question. Um, it will be simpler, but we will use the word tax in the ordinance implementing. Okay, thanks. And that's based upon court guidance, you're saying? That's correct. It's really a legal characterization of this longstanding practice of sharing revenue from the from the utility Got to it. the general fund. Okay, so Clerk Milton, do we have the summation of all these tentative approvals? Okay, um, we can take a brief break. I, I heard people were asking that. So why don't we take five minutes? We're near the end.
And Clerk Milton, are you able to post that? Great. <clears throat> Molly, did you did you want to speak? No. Okay. All right. Um, so let's all take a look and confirm that our tentative uh, approvals have been captured here. And while we're doing that, um, if anyone wants to, while others are reviewing, if anyone wants to um, make comments at a summation level, um, be fine. Council Member Philseth. Oh, well, I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> Where am I going to go here? I, I hope I won't put everybody to sleep here. You know, the core issue is, again, is, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, polling and what we think people vote for. But the real issue is, what do we need, right? In order to have our financial house in order so that we can deliver what our stakeholders need, right? And, uh, you know, we're talking about it's a Palo Alto issue, but, uh, you know, we've had the benefit of having some of the regional advocacies uh, here participating with us and particularly uh, raising concerns that if we do what we're proposing here, uh, then then are people going to leave? Right? And I think that kind of begs the question, well, are people leaving already? Right. <clears throat> As, as everybody knows, there's been a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, given the pandemic, uh, are people leaving the region and are they leaving San Francisco and moving to the suburbs or how does that all work out and so forth? We uh, have the benefit in Silicon Valley of uh, Joint Venture Silicon Valley, which is an absolutely fantastic resource. Okay. And uh, the answer is, uh, if you look at the actual data, yeah, people are leaving the region, okay? And it's not the pandemic, all right? The inflection point was about 2012, okay? About a decade ago. And that's when net domestic migration went negative, which is the year that, uh, the first year that more people left uh, the Silicon Valley for other parts of the country than arrived from other parts of the country. And that trend has accelerated since then. You say, well, how can that be? Because we've had such robust job growth for the last decade in Silicon Valley. And the answer is, you know, during that time, international migration was positive and it outweighed the loss of workers to other parts of the U.S. But the net international inflow has been declining for years, too. And as a side note to organic growth, uh, birth versus death has been falling as well, although it's less, uh, less of an economic thing. Businesses don't hire children. Uh, but the whole thing went negative a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, population has actually fallen in the last year in Silicon Valley. Okay, but it's not the pandemic. This is a trend that started a decade ago. Okay, the point is that the Silicon Valley business model is to recruit the world's tech talent to come here and invent the future, and we've been really good at that. But we don't seem to be able to keep people here. <laughs> Right. Uh, and, and again, you know, it's not the pandemic. Uh, uh, you know, this has been going on for a while. And it kind of begs the question is if people are going to leave faster than we can hire them, eventually this can be a threat to our business model. OK. So thank God for Joint Venture Silicon Valley. They survey why are people leaving? And the top reasons are cost of living and housing and quality of life. See, we as a region have created a vast amount of wealth, but if you look around, it seems pretty obvious that we haven't invested enough of it as a region in the housing, transportation, and service infrastructure necessary to give those people a quality of life that makes them wanna stay here. Because if they're gonna leave faster than we can hire them, then our whole economic model in Silicon Valley is in doubt. So what would it cost to keep people here? Well, here's a few numbers. <laughs> Plan Bay Area 2050 uh, thinks that we'll need nearly $500 billion 
in new affordable housing subsidies over the next 30 years uh, in order to uh, produce affordable housing requirements uh, uh, of the region. So that's over 30 years. So say the net present value is half of that, a couple hundred billion. Faster Bay Area wanted $100 billion for transportation over 40 years. So net present value, half of that, maybe 50 billion. We've got over 30,000 homeless in the Bay Area. Last year, the Bay Area Council estimated that to house everybody would take $9 billion in upfront capital, plus $2.5 billion a year, basically forever. So maybe that's another $50 billion net present value. BART costs a billion or two per mile to extend. So overall, what do we need? We need a couple hundred billion, okay? Not two billion, not 20 billion, you know, we need a couple hundred billion. That's the number. So suppose you actually wanted to lay hands on a couple hundred billion for housing, transportation, and services. Other than from Washington and Sacramento, where might you find that? Well, again, joint venture Silicon Valley. Love these guys. The net personal wealth of Silicon Valley and San Francisco is about $750 billion, not including uh, 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 personal residences. The net corporate wealth of Silicon Valley and San Francisco measured by public market cap uh, is 14 trillion. Okay. So the regional advocacies all wanna fund this stuff out of bridge tolls and parcel taxes, but to get 200 or 300 billion for housing, transportation and services, out of 750 billion in personal wealth is pretty hard. It's a lot easier to find in 14 trillion. So just for context, measure A was a personal tax, raised a billion for affordable housing and homelessness. So to fill the gap that the region really needs, we're talking hundreds of measure A's, hundreds. 14 trillion. Is there anybody in the entire Bay Area who thinks that we wouldn't be better off if we were worth 13 trillion instead, but also had a world-class transportation system, best in class public safety, including mental health services, and everybody here had a roof over their head. Heck, we might be worth 15 trillion, okay? Because we wouldn't have to work so hard to bring new talent in. So people that think maybe a few local business taxes are an existential threat to the golden goose of Silicon Valley but they're not. This is the threat, okay? You know, we're going around playing whack-a-mole on local, local ballot measures like this, but they aren't the existential threat. If we can't keep our workers here, that's the existential threat. If we can't keep our region a place where people wanna live and work, even though it's cheaper in Austin, okay, then we're gonna be in big trouble, okay? And we can't do that without having our long-term financial house in order. So current practice in the region is to kind of nibble around the edges of the problem, use a lot of rhetoric about uh, you know, how important it is, anything but really funding it, okay? So Palo Alto, you know, we're one of a, we're one of a hundred cities, you know? We're not in charge of the region, right? All we're trying to do is put our financial house in order so that we can keep delivering the environment that our stakeholders need to be successful here. And it's a complicated thing to do. We got a bunch of stuff to optimize, but that's what we're trying to do here. Oh, and uh, Charlie, I don't know if you're still on the, on the, the, uh, on the, the Zoom or not. Your flyer here, <laughs> you guys get a bag full of Pinocchios for this. Right, uh, I'm, I'm tempted to say 60 million. I mean, 60 million dollars. I mean, we could fund the whole police force and half a fire for that. I mean, it sort of doesn't pass the smell test. And uh, <laughs> you, you know, we're in the silly world when when politicians are pulling your leg about uh, about uh, uh, being truthful. All right, thanks. Um. All right, I don't see light, so I'll, I'll just follow up on um, those comments. Um, I do agree that that enlightened self-interest from the business community would support funding for these kinds of purposes. 
that there has to be adequate investment by local government uh, in critical transportation and affordable housing and public safety. And um, the history of Silicon Valley is that we evolved as an exceptionally low business tax region. And the, the massive billion dollar um, companies, multi-billion dollar companies we have, the huge um, commercial property developers who are the two forces who have already come out opposing our business tax proposal or concept before we've ever come up with uh, decisions on what that tax measure would be, um, they should really be considering uh, what's more broadly in an enlightened self-interest to make our region sustainable and thriving in the long term. I see that um, along with Silicon Valley Leadership Group, the other principal sponsor of what's already this campaign that has uh, misstated and misled our residents. Um, the other group is the NIOP, N-A-I-O-P, which is the Commercial Real Estate Development Association. And I see on their their website, they lead with NIOP is a powerful voice at the local, state, and federal levels working to protect the interests of commercial real estate. And I don't doubt that's right. That's, that's their purpose. Their purpose is not to support the interests of the communities uh, in which they make their fortunes, um, uh, to make those communities even sustainable in their own long-term interests. It's, it's a short-sighted, narrow interest. Similarly, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group that represents uh, just amongst the most largest and most successful companies in the world has supported sales tax increases, bridge toll increases, gas tax increases, everything that is regressive and uh, disproportionately taxes low and modest income people. So we really shouldn't expect um, that they're going to support this measure as moderate as it's likely to be when it finally hits the ballot. Um, but I, I still would hope that members of our community who have kind of blindly allowed themselves to be used by these big uh, business entities would reconsider um, that they want to make sure that um, what's being used in their name and attributed uh, to them by association is honest and truthful. And to date, that is not the case. And a lot of members of our community should be offended that they were associated with misrepresentations uh, that we're already seeing in a massive um, uh, campaign against a tax measure that hasn't even been settled on. They, they couldn't even, they so anxious to oppose these big entities are so anxious to oppose any business tax that they can't even wait until there is one before they've come out with a massive campaign. Um, and anybody who questions how many dollars they may spend uh, to try to defeat a, a modest tax measure should look at what just the 49ers spent uh, the last go round to elect a city council that would be more supportive of them, $3 million on a local race. And I'll add that those were principally independent expenditure committees. Um, and so they, they, they wouldn't be affected by any um, local limits on donation amounts to directly to campaigns. Um, we should expect that we're, we're going to enter, uh, even with this modest proposal, a David and Goliath um, campaign. Um, that whoever, when this goes on the ballot, uh, it'll be uh, massive funding in opposition and, um, and, in all likelihood, some grassroots support in the community. I even saw that um, on the claims of the impact of the tax that John Goldman from Premier Properties had put out in a quotation that 
to the effect that um, uh, businesses won't leave Palo Alto as a result of this tax, uh, but that it might inhibit new businesses coming in. Well, the new businesses coming in will be negotiating a lease rate. And the lease rate, they will look at their lease rate with triple net expenses, which would include a 10 or 12 cent per month business tax on whatever is the uh, the lease rate, whether it's the $8 that they've been getting charged or temporarily a little less than that, really doesn't matter. Um, they would negotiate with the landlord um, if they say, well, I'll, I'll pay $8, uh, but that has to include those business taxes. So the landlord instead would have to charge $7.88 or $7.90 instead of $8. It's the landlord that this tax would come out of um, in effect um, based upon what John Goldman described. Um, and then lastly, we've, we've even seen in the, uh, one of the local papers uh, criticism that, you know, that, that we haven't decided certain of these um, uh, aspects of the tax that we've narrowed down this evening, and we won't decide until June, but they can't wait even in to see those results. And they want to claim that the fact that we are still finalizing those things as a detriment, but these are a lot of the same people who, when we looked at business tax before, said, take the time and be deliberate. And now they're saying, you're taking the time and being deliberate. We're going to accuse you of not having decided something that you're yet going to decide in the next month or two, and we'll hold that against you. Um, and the truth is, no matter what tax we'd come up with, no matter what form, no matter what exemptions, um, no matter any of these things that we've discussed tonight, they would come up with opposing arguments because they don't want to bear their fair share of responsibility for the needs of the region. So um, I agree with council member Phil Seth that, that um, um, this is, uh, a necessary investment in our communities uh, that we would be having if this goes forward on the ballot. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, we'll, we'll see some of these folks who will recognize it as that instead of the way it's been characterized and misrepresented to date. So um, council member Cormac. Thank you, Mayor Burt. Um... So this is, you know, significant work that we're doing here tonight. Um, and item two is, you know, this is significant change for the community. I believe we're, um, you know, we're approaching an area though that is that is reasonable um, for the community as a whole. Um, I think the changes that the council has made recently are thoughtful, thoughtful responses to um, input we've received. Um, so I'm glad to see that. And I think the community hopefully can see um, that as questions and concerns and thoughts arise, we're incorporating that. And uh, despite our desire for simplicity, we're going to end up with something slightly, slightly more complex, but that I think addresses the, you know, the economic ecosystem that we have here in the community. I'm I did want to ask a little bit about D and K, which seem to have changed slightly from when we went through them. So in D, it says reduced monthly rate. We haven't decided though if we're if we're charging uh, for a year. Should we reduce get rid of the word monthly? It's simply referencing the rate above, which is a per month rate. Okay. So it's an annual tax. I wouldn't. I don't. We have not determined the frequency in terms of collection. Okay. I just don't want anyone to think that, you know, it's going to be, we're assuming it's going to be charged monthly. Sure. We could take, even take the word out. We could say reduced rate of 50%. All right. Since there's no yeah. owner it's of this, so let's no. just yeah. get rid of that. No problem. Um, and then the full rate to be, I think it's charged in the second year, not initiated, right? That seems, yep. are you still That's comfortable fine. with initiated? Okay. Either way. And then we just spent a lot of time in J and K and now it looks like they've been separated. So maybe that makes more sense. 
I'm certainly fine with J, but K now looks like we're just asking for the same thing we've already done. And I thought we just went through that exercise to try to figure out if polling for these proceeds was related to the non-binding resolution. So perhaps we could collectively put our heads together and figure out what J and K are supposed to be doing. Is K a subset of J? No, the tentative motions were taken in two steps. One was to identify that the council intended to draft a resolution um, communicating the intentions. And then the second item was. Um, but it's more than the use. It's that we were going to have this resolution that said there was the use of it in that fashion, right? Sure. So perhaps K is a subset of J? Yes. I think that was the yeah, conversation. Corollary. Yeah. Okay. Those great. are just two separate motions. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure who's going to make the motion, but I'll just say that I, I do plan to support this this evening. Um, I think it's unlikely if it comes back at 12 cents that I will, I, you know, 10 cents, I think for me, based on the data we've had so far is really, really the upper limit. Um, the rest of it, I, I'm comfortable with, depending on how big the number is for H, <laughs> um, but look forward to learning more about that. Um, and then I think the other thing is just, this has been such an iterative process for so long, um, I, the whole time I've been on council, frankly. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of our staff members who have worked on this and all of the departments and all of the consultants who um, uh, have assisted us to get this far. Um, I know it's been a long slog, but um, I'm comfortable with the decisions that that we're coming, um, coming to conclusion on here. And then just my final point is I just spent some more time looking at those five points on packet page 172 in terms of uses and if I think about the unfunded capital improvements, those are really things that the people of Palo Alto should probably be paying for because the people of Palo Alto are the ones using them, at least the ones we've got listed so far. And then in terms of climate, I think that's, again, something that the whole community should be participating in. So the more time I spend looking at this, the more comfortable I am with the the uses, the sort of the general set of the uses that we have. Um, thank you. And council member Tanaka. You know, once upon a time, our city had a, like a monopoly on companies and startups. Uh, Palo Alto was the place where it was a place to be. It was a place where if you start a company, you wanted to be in Palo Alto. And, um, you know, this was the place where the best and brightest, this was like the go-to place. And I, I think the issue, and, and this is my major concern, is that today, businesses have a choice on where to locate. If you look at where are startups, startups being formed today, fewer and fewer percentage is being here. They're being started in Austin, Miami, a whole bunch of other places. The, um, you know, the idea that uh, Facebook, Zuckerberg had to, you know, locate in Palo Alto. That, that is not really happening anymore. And it's unfortunate. And I, th I think um, my major concern is it's kind of a thing of supply and demand. Um, cities are competing. Every city out there wants to be Silicon Valley. They want to have what, what we have, right? And, and they're competing for this innovation, for this talent for these innovative companies to be in their city. And if you look at where the investments are happening, so you look at venture capital investments, the percentage that's happening in Palo Alto is dropping and it's been dropping and, and Council Member Phillips is correct about that. It's been dropping for a while, not just during the pandemic. And that's the, the, the big concern. And the, the, the double whammy here is that we have this long-term trend of innovation, innovation leaving our city, but it's been accelerated by the pandemic. Because with the pandemic, what we found, a lot of companies found, even us as council members, is that you can conduct business remotely using Zoom. 
it's actually very common now to have companies that are completely virtual. And I think um, we've seen companies like Tesla, which were located in our city, headquartered in our city for a long, long time, moving to Texas, right? We had companies like Palantir moving to, to, to Colorado. And as we, and I don't know if you guys seen this, but if you look at the comparison of, of tax rates to our nearby cities like East Palo Alto, San Mateo, Redwood City, San Jose, Sunnyvale, right? You know, EPA is at 5%, San Mateo is at 4%, Redwood City is at 1.8, San, San Jose is 1.6, Cupertino is 0.4. And you look at the, the caps on, on the tax, right? You know, Palo Alto is like, there's no, no, there is no real cap, right? Now you, it's basically 459,000. San Jose is 666,000. Palo Alto is like three plus million. I mean, Santa Clara has a cap of $500. Redwood City is $6,000. Mellon Park is $8,000. And as we're embarking on this, on this um, direction, which I think is going to be damaging to our city, to the people that depend on these jobs, I think... Um, my big worry is that because people have a choice, especially now more than ever, with the fact that work from home has been proven to work, that we're gonna see increased flight of companies, of talent. And my big worry is, okay, so uh, as these companies move, what's gonna replace the taxes that they do pay and the jobs that they provide? What's going to happen to our city? Where is this money going to come from? Who's going to provide the employment? And so I really worry about what is the effect this is going to have long term for our city. Even short term, I think there's going to be big, big problems. So I, I hope that the public will be informed, will look into this, um, because I think when most people move to Paul, so they want a city that um, you know, they're, they're able to find good employment. I think that's a, actually a really important piece uh, because we know it's not a cheap city, right? The city is actually very expensive. And so uh, a lot of families need this kind of income to, to be here. And I think um, as we push jobs away from our city, as we make people drive further, which is kind of counter to our, our goal of being a green city, I think this is this is the wrong direction. So I hope that uh, I know it's almost twelve o'clock now. It's twelve, almost twelve. That uh, any folks that are listening, you know, maybe folks that will read this or uh, watch a video later, will look at this closely and think about what are we doing here? Are we destroying our base? Vice Mayor Ku. Thank you. And I follow in uh, Council Member Filsef and Mayor Burt's comments. You know, I have not seen the flyers, uh, the negative flyers with uh, false information, nor have I read the uh, local paper's um, editorial against the tax. But I did see uh, the letters from Silicon Valley Leadership Group, or AKA SVLG, and I take issue with that letter. Firstly, the comments want to pinpoint being in line with other cities. Well, you know, Palo Alto is not Cupertino. Cupertino is not San Mateo. San Mateo is not Sunnyvale. We're different cities with different needs. Uh, a perfect example would be great separations and rail safety, which is what we had contemplated and reviewed, talked about, in addition to other, um, other, other, um, intentions for the use of this business tax. But great separations and rail safety is, is um, we, Palo Alto has the second highest ridership um, pre-COVID and is second to San Francisco. So even during COVID in 2020, September of 2020, despite a plunge in transit and ridership um, during the pandemic, Palo Alto was still one of the highest at, uh, in the, 
with the highest ridership in, at the downtown Caltrain station. So again, it's different from other cities. Secondly, Silicon Valley leadership groups comment letters have erroneous and false statements. And I would question the data that it provides. Um, so again, be informed, right? Like uh, indeed, indeed be informed. Thirdly, Silicon Valley Leadership Group has supported and campaigned for regressive taxes. And that does not address Palo Alto's matters, Palo Alto's business, Palo Alto's needs. Um, so we are doing our obligations for the Palo Alto community. And, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to being competitive, we need good transportation and affordable housing to compete. And that's what we're doing. Um, so I will be supporting this motion. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we're ready to take a vote. Mayor Burt? Yes. Councilmember Cormack? Yes. Councilmember Dubois? Yes. Councilmember Filsa? Yep. Vice Mayor Koo? Yes. Councilmember Stone? Yes. Councilmember Tanaka? No. Motion carries six to one. Great. Well, thanks to everybody for hard and patient work tonight on this. It was done really thoughtfully and um, I think uh, moved us forward very considerably. So um, our final item tonight is council member comments and questions. Pardon me? Uh, we should. We would at routine meetings. I'll still allow it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so do we have any questions or comments? Uh, I can just add that uh, a number of us were at the Youth Earth Day Rally um, on King Plaza here on Friday afternoon. It was really well attended, a great event. Um, and it just showed uh, uh, the, the commitment and growing awareness of our youth and climate issues. Um, I also was able to attend um, a, an Earth Day uh, 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 set of exhibits, an event at Stanford Hospital, and they were uh, really showing all their commitment toward um, sustainability and, and climate protection and are enthusiastic about collaborating with us in those areas. Um, and I did want to also mention that um, at the VTA, we got an update on the capital cost of uh, the BART system. And, uh, and as has been reported in the press, uh, the federal government has committed to 25% of up to $9.1 billion in costs, BART's uh, estimate to date has been $6.9 billion, but they're acknowledging that it will exceed that 6.9 and that they're working on how they may fill that funding gap, um, uh, whether it'll be all the way up to the 9.1, which is the upper end of what uh, the federal government had estimated. Uh, nobody knows, although construction uh, costs are escalating extremely rapidly. And then on top of that, there remains a shortfall in the operating um, obligation that they have to uh, fund to BART for any shortfalls in ridership and revenue from uh, Fairbox. And that's well below estimates uh, in, uh, in large part due to COVID impacts, but probably not uh, entirely due to COVID impacts. So um, there are big struggles there. Uh, the good news is that um, the Measure B dollars for grade separations have continued to be uh, very well established uh, to, to continue for the purposes that uh, they were originally designated. Um, so how VTA resolves the BART issues and over the long term, uh, stay tuned. And that's what I have to update. Thank you.
Meeting adjourned.